Oh boy. Got him. <laughs> oh my god. What? 100. Wow. Hey, good race, good race. Judy at this stage, and he just needs to keep his nose clean and keep doing what he's doing at the moment because he's doing a right. Oh, that's a big slide from Princeton up Lucy Lloyd. How has he saved it? Oh my word. What a save and I racing top 10. Need to put that save back in. I want a replay of that one as we see the likes of Scott Zulowski uh, going on. I think this will be the opportunity if Pierre is going to be one and you'll see here Purnell will defend as he is sitting on the inside line there. What can the Porsche do? He's going to try and go around the outside. I'm not sure he's going to get that to stick as he pushes it through and he's managed to do it. He's managed to get through for the lead on the second to last corner of the race. He has managed to get through to the lead, Braden Nash, and to take the lead of this race. He's going to snatch it from Purnell. But they weren't. They weren't utilizing it as much as this is going to be trouble down at three. Never mind, they give him room there. Come on, look at that! Oh, what a save! Wow. Oh what my goodness! What a save by who is that? Michael Frisch. That's where traction control is, your friend. What in the world did he save that? Holy. one of those places where you always seem to find an amazing racetrack it's got so much that it has to offer it's got the ups and downs of undulation it's got iconic corner upon iconic corner and what it will bring for endurance racing here today 
is something that cannot be described. This place has so many amazing races under its belt here when it comes to the Scops 2020 calendar. And as the midway point of enduro season, everybody is on edge looking to try and get what they want here today on the iRacing Esports Network brought to you as the Sims B TV presentation good morning good afternoon good evening to everyone watching around the world put your feet up put the kettle on have a little bit of a rest why don't you and let us take you through the action here today my name is jake sperry Lockie mansell will be alongside me for the early proceedings of this one we'll jump into the pits the moment we see the sapo racer reese gardner alongside with us here today but this place like many other places, is going to be one to watch here today. And lucky to bring you into the conversation. 18 hours of pre-quality comes down to here. And the mid part of a season, which really is gearing up all about what happens in about a month's time from now and the great sim race. And what a cracking start we had to our V8 Scops Endurance Cup for 2020 at Phillip Island a fortnight ago where we had an epic and enthralling 500 kilometre race that came right down to the wire. We saw a number of combinations cementing themselves as outright contenders, but in the end it was the reigning Endurance Cup champions Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney for Trans Tasman Racing who took a brilliantly strategically crafted race victory with the right combination of speed, consistency, and most importantly, fuel management. And very much looking forward to seeing how Hampstead and Maloney fared this evening along with all of our other outright contending combinations. And those contending combinations you can see are flicking by on the bottom right-hand side of your screen here today. Everybody's going to be looking to try and get some big results, but there are also bigger things at play here today. And this is one of the few races where drivers are going to have to be clean because they know where they want to be racing. It's the biggest race of the Australian sim racing calendar. If you're anybody who has watched any sim racing, you know that the Bathurst 1000 is going going to be one which everybody has their eyes set so drivers are going to have to be especially careful about being clean here today Lockie and making sure they're not picking up incident points off of the stewards yeah 100 percent right and we've seen a few high profile drivers already relegated to the sidelines as a result of chalking up one too many incident points so you're 100 percent right the drivers do need to keep it clean and precise not only that, but uh, this race is really the last opportunity for the driver combinations to rehearse their preparations for the Bathurst 1000, which is coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Because at Phillip Island, we saw that uh, there were some very, very fast combinations, but just the, the process of um, drivers, and let's face it, we did have quite a number of drivers who were sharing cars for the first time, just to get, a head, get their heads around what they each like in terms of car setup and finding a setup that's the right compromise between the driver's preferences. And uh, not only that, but just getting a feel for how to best approach the strategic aspects of the race, communications with the people who might be working on the background on communications and race strategy, all those little one percenters that you have to get right if you want to succeed at Bathurst. Tonight, it's really the last chance that a lot of these teams are going to get to, to uh, execute their final preparations. Exactly. If you do look down on the bottom right hand side of your screen, if there are any changes, they are highlighted in yellow and that does include teams as well. I know that a couple of uh, drivers have jumped teams and had a little bit of fun going out. There is the Synergy Sim Racing JK Signs Racing number 58 machine. 37th position right now is Damien Johnstone, normally pairs up with Jack Boyd both of whom coming away from Gone Rogue Motorsport and looking for synergy and looking for a big result on Scop's debut here today. So that'll be something worth keeping in mind. The times on the left-hand side of your screen on the timing tower. Dane Warren in the 77, currently fastest Trans-Tasman 1 and 2 at the moment. No surprises there at this stage in time, but there are some surprises in the offing. I'm looking at car four in fourth place. Clint Shane Smith has put in a fantastic practice time at the moment, getting everything all nicely put together. And that might be a little bit of a dark horse that we haven't really talked about, Lockie. 
Yeah, and, um, you know, I mean, this was a team that didn't really feature among the front runners in the previous round at Phillip Island. They qualified 19th and finished down in 22nd position. But again, there'll be some combinations that might not necessarily have put their best foot forward at Phillip Island that might find the characteristics of the Imola circuit a bit better suited to their driving styles. And uh, I know that Clint Shane Smith's been doing a lot of work behind the scenes with the photography and bringing us some beautiful images of the cars on track during the pre-qualifying sessions. So uh, hopefully he can have a good run this evening. And it's that good run that I think everybody is going to be looking for, hopefully, at this point in time. Everyone's going to have a really good opportunity here to try and get themselves into the right position and make sure that everything is going to be playing out. But Hark, what is that on the distance that I see? It's a Reese Gardner, the Sapo racer, joins alongside us for the moment. Reese, um, just to bring you into the conversation ever so briefly, we're looking at this Imola track and we're thinking about just how amazing this place is. You've got the wonderful Tamburello chicane, which brings in so much action. The Toza hairpin is going to be a place where everyone's going to be wanting to make some dives. You've got that fantastic Aqua Minerale section. And then, of course, two years ago, we have Ravat. So we zoom on in to where we are today. Autodromo Enzo Adina Ferrari. There's Milan. There's Rome. There's Marseille. But Autodromo Enzo Adina Ferrari, just a stone's throw away from San Marino, the former San Marino Grand Prix, as we jump on down in and have a little look at exactly where we are situated here today. And here is the wonderful track. Reese. this has iconic written all over it. It absolutely does. You see just across the river from the center of the historic city of Imola. And this is a track that carries many scars from many modifications made over the years. Obviously, the 94 San Marino Grand Prix weekend was the catalyst for many of the current safety changes that we've seen in real life motorsport. But this place underwent renovations back in to the 2007-2008 period and reopened in this form, bringing back the old super long start finish straight. And that Aka Minerali section we're looking at there, one of the most challenging sections of the circuit, breaking and turning at the same time. And it's a real challenge to slow up for that corner while avoiding off-track incidents on those runoff areas. Well, speaking of talking about this circuit, you had the opportunity to have a deep delve dive into everything that's been going on around this place. So let's have a little look at the fact file. For the third year running, the virtual racing school V8 Scops comes to Imola for a round of the Endurance Cup. Officially, this historic track is named the Autodromo Enzo e Dino Ferrari after the founder of Italy's most famous car company and his son. 70 years in, the circuit still provides a technical challenge that both sim and real drivers can grab with both hands. Turn one is barely a corner at all, but the natural line sees drivers blend on to the right side approach for turn two. Care will have to be taken as the pit exit merges onto the natural line itself. The speed differential is incredibly high, so drivers need to be wary of cars exiting the lane. The first two chicanes, Tamburello and Villeneuve, were introduced as part of safety upgrades after the tragic 1994 San Marino Grand Prix. They used to be flat out sweepers, but nowadays they are technical medium speed diversions. Both are places you can pass. The approach to Tamburello is the fastest point of the lap with a long and heavy braking zone, while Villeneuve has a fast kink on entry where you can slip through on arrival. Be careful of the apex curbs though. They look inviting, but if you take too much curb and run over the black and yellow speed bumps, you'll get an off-track incident point and your lap will be invalidated. The exits of these chicanes demonstrate an aspect of the track that the drivers know very well. Pay attention to the colour of the runoff. Light green is concrete and allows you to open up the exit of Villeneuve without risk of an off track. Out of Tamburello though, you want to stay off the dark green AstroTurf. There's no grip on this slippery surface and in some places around the lap, running over it will invalidate your time. Turn 7, the Tosa hairpin, is a popular outbreaking spot, but in a battle, two cars setting up the entry at once can backfire and result in contact. 
Avoiding wheel spin on the exit sets up a good run up the hill to the fast and challenging Piratella corner. Confident throttle application out of here, managing the oversteer feels good, let me tell you that, but don't get too carried away. Aka Minerali comes up a lot quicker than you think. This section sees drivers braking and turning simultaneously, which these cars aren't a huge fan of. The second right-hander will punish you if you lock up a wheel or brake too late. Once again, there's the slippery AstroTurf, but it also carries a slowdown penalty if you overextend the exit. Another short straight later, we get to Variante Alta, roughly translates to high chicane. It is the highest point of the lap. Braking early at the top of fourth gear, you have to vault over the curbs like you're jumping a paddock fence. Keep the car level on the exit and avoid the dark green once more, and hopefully you've obtained a good run down to Rivazza. These two lefts will make or break a lap if you've made it this far. Straighten out the braking zone as much as you can and hope that the downhill grade doesn't cause a lockup. It's second gear through here and you can run wide between the lefts, but you can only kiss the final apex as there is an off-track incident waiting just beyond the red and white curb. Back out then onto the long start-finish stretch where you can potentially set up a slipstream into turn one. Well, that's what it takes to do one lap around Imola, but we've got 102 of them coming up for this 500 km endurance race. It's a circuit that has produced some of the most exciting racing and most controversial clashes in VRS V8 Scops, and I certainly can't wait for the green flag to drop so we can see how the drivers fare. That's what it takes to make your way around this particular circuit. We're just waiting for Jake Sperry to uh, to jump on back in, sorting out a couple of technical dramas at the moment. But man, I have been looking forward to this race all year. I have some of the best broadcast memories from Imola and Lockie. This is the third year running. As I said, that we've uh, that we've done a 500 kilometer enduro at the Autodromo Enzo Edino Ferrari, and the amount of competition that we see for these 500 kilometer enduros really comes to the fore at a track like this. You know, I, I, I look at the lap times and it really hits home just how competitive everyone is because the lap that I did for the fact file was um, a minute 44.3. That would put me third last in the current standings in practice. So these guys really know their way around this circuit. I sure do. Best lap time that we've seen so far in this practice session has been recorded by Dane Warren, 1 minute 42.1. And of course, it was Dane Warren and Madison Down who were on pole position for the first round of the 2020 V8 Scops Endurance Cup. The Philip Island 500 a fortnight ago, they would ultimately finish in fourth position, um, opting not to save fuel in the final stint, but instead push on flat out and go for an extra pit stop for a splash and dash in what was a very fuel-compromised final stint for everybody in the race. For those of you who missed the Phillip Island 500, we had a safety car that came out at a very awkward time, about five laps shy of what we predicted would be the critical lap number. And what that meant was that a lot of teams either had to go into maximum fuel conservation to make it to the chequered flag, or else come in for an extra splash and dash. It turned out that the fuel conservation approach was the right approach because that was the approach that was taken by our race winners, Richard Havstead and Jake Maloney. And uh, no doubt uh, fuel range will once again be one of the big talking points tonight in the Imola 500, especially if we get safety cars falling at difficult times. Yeah, exactly right. It's it's definitely a circuit that lends itself well to fuel saving. And um, I guess what we got to take a look at is the championship standings once again. These are the standings after round nine with no drop rounds. And Jay has been a little sneaky here. He hasn't revealed what the standings are with two drop rounds applied. So currently James Scott in the lead on uh, on full on points with El Nabi and Haber trailing him there close between Haber and Gilliam 
for fourth place. And Madison down, despite missing the first couple rounds of the season, managing to slot himself into sixth. But here's the big surprise for all of us. Let's see what it looks like with two drop rounds. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Madison down in the championship lead by 52 points. Okay, that's a real reaction from me. I haven't seen these before. These standings have been kept from us until this very moment, but that really changes the game there with James Scott falling to third. It looks like Forzan El Nabi versus Madison Down for the title at the moment. James Scott and Andrew Gilliam only separated by 20 points there, Lockie. Yeah, and in fact, it's very close, isn't it? You've only got 115 points separating the top four, and that's uh, after you drop every driver's two worst rounds from the season. Of course, at the end of the year, everybody drops their worst three rounds to come up with our final championship standings. The other thing to take into consideration here as well, race is the championship within a championship, which is the Endurance Cup, because that's the other prize that will be awarding after the Bathurst 1000. And for the Endurance Cup, all three rounds count. So that's the other point situation that we need to be keeping an eye on here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also uh, it's also um, something you've got to consider for the, uh, the Endurance Cup Championship is you have to keep the same driver pairing for all three rounds to be eligible. And the current leader is the number 28 trans-Tasman racing machine. Jake Maloney and Richard Hampstead sharing that one. Of course, having taken victory at Phillip Island, they lead the Endurance Cup standings at the moment. But of course, we still have this round and Bathurst to go before a champion within a championship is decided. Really, really hits home. Uh, consistency, pace, being able to manage your car over the course of a long race and to stay out of trouble as well. And one of the distinguishing features on these cars, the windscreen banners. So you'll see that James Scott on screen at the moment, he's got a red windscreen banner, and that's because with no dropped rounds in play, he is the championship leader. So that's the identifying marker on that car to show that that is the championship leading car. The uh, Jake Maloney and Richard Hampstead Trans Tasman Racing Commodore has a black windscreen banner, and that's because they're currently leading the Endurance Cup standings having taken that victory at Phillip Island. All of the other cars in the field have got white V8 Supercars Online Premier Series windscreen banners. That they have. And uh, currently up at the top of those practice timesheets, Dane Warren, first driver into the 41s in this session. That is quite an impressive time there from Dane. Fastest lap that Madison down set was a, uh, was a high 42. But Dane Warren definitely showing that he is the one to watch in terms of one lap pace here at Imola. And doing a fast lap around this circuit, there's so much to it because you've got a lot of flat out sections. You've got this pit exit that blends right onto the racing line for turn one. You see Ethan Griggolt there taking a bit of avoiding action. And uh, it seems that that was a practice start that Ethan Griggolt was doing. So... Getting the feeling that he's going to be the one taking the start in that machine. James Scott and Cooper Webster will have to sort that out as well. Webster took the start for the 088 at Phillip Island. And uh, really matters what your starting driver is in these Enduro Cup rounds. Because if you put your, your quote-unquote slower or B driver in at the start... You can stand to lose a few positions off the start, but then your prime driver jumps in towards the middle and uh, can definitely stake a claim. Andrew Gilliam and Michael Taliansic will be thinking about that themselves. Indeed, there, there's a couple of different ways that you can approach the race. So if we can touch briefly on strategy, it is four compulsory pit stops for tonight's race. A bit like Phillip Island, you can theoretically get through the race on three pit stops based on fuel range but the event organizers have mandated four pit stops um the minimum number of laps that has to be completed by each driver is 34 which means that the maximum number of laps that any one driver can spend in the car is 68 to get us up to our race distance of 102 laps and uh, what we saw at Phillip island was that most teams 
I only elected to do a single driver change. So one driver started the race, the other driver finished. But of course, the other way that you can approach it is that you can have one driver start, the second driver can jump in and do the middle stint, and then the starting driver can get back in to bring the car home to the chequered flag. So it'll be interesting tonight just to see how the teams approach race strategies. In, in the case of that Evolution Racing Team Commodore, um, if we've seen Ethan Grigolt doing a practice start, it could be that he starts, they put Jordan and Caruso in the car in the middle of the race, and then Egg, Ethan Grigolt, gets back in for the closing stint. Now, uh, one car that's got a bit of a sentimental, uh, I suppose, following tonight is this car on screen at the moment, one of the other mm. Evolution Racing Team cars in the field, the 543 entry of Benjamin Smith, but also Scott Gamble, who is participating in his last sim racing event. He's announced that he's hanging up the helmet after tonight and uh, one of the nice guys of the sim racing scene and somebody with uh, quite a significant following on YouTube and uh, on various online and social media channels is uh, going to step away from the sim racing fraternity after this evening. That he is. And um, Scott Gamble has done an awful lot for the sim racing community a lot of it behind the scenes and if you jump on to the iRacing Down Under group Mr. Brenton O'Brien the, uh, the head of Evolution Racing Team doing a very nice tribute post to Mr. Gamble he certainly uh, found himself a great standing in this community but yes he's decided to hang up the wheel and start to uh, spend a bit more time camping and spend a bit more time with his kids He's also been able to raise $5,000 almost towards Soldier on Australia, which is a program supporting returned servicemen and service women serving in our armed forces. So he definitely gives a lot back, Sperry. And uh, it'll be a shame to see Scott Gamble go, but he certainly had a, a great long and storied sim racing career to look back on. He certainly does, and that's going to be something really worth keeping in mind as we've gone on through and continued i do apologize for the technical issues that uh, we're having on my end i have no idea how to fix them i'm just going to try and go uh, the best that i can here with this one as we continue on moving forward with about a minute 20 to go left here in this practice session and i wonder here at this stage here bo because i have been uh, looking to, uh, here at release as we've been trying to go on forward my mind's an absolute mess right now um have we looked at the championship standings we did while you were gone, and uh, this is this is a bit of a bombshell. I think I think Jay might have to bring them up again once again for your benefit and for those who have just joined us on the iRacing Esports Network broadcast. So James Scott leads the championship with no drop rounds, but wait for it, Sperry. Check this out. Guess who is in the lead with two drop rounds applied, despite not making the first couple rounds of the season. Ooh. Hello, Madison down there up at the top of the order, and that's what consistency can get you here in this championship with two drop rounds. Madison has been waiting and waiting and waiting for this opportunity, and time and time again, it has come up with the right result. So what Forza Onabi needs to do with the United Sim Sport team is really put in some good results over this part of the championship and close down in those points because the gap of 52 is only the difference between the first and effectively about the fifth place. So there are opportunities on the horizon. It just relies on those points being scored time and time again. This all comes to a close, though, here in practice with Dane Warren and Madison Downs' car, the fastest of the lot, then, when it comes to this practice section. Uh, so we will be seeing how this all starts to go about with the next little lot of things going on qualifying here reese is underway it absolutely is and we are doing split group qualifying here so not all cars are going to be out on track at the same time the first group out is 40th to 21st in pre-qualifying and leading the charge out of the pits is kenneth ladder in the number 554 machine for exto gaming and he'll be looking to try and make sure that it's all going to be playing out the best way possible here over the course of 
this race and uh, he'll be hoping that it's all nice and dandy here as you go through towards the Villeneuve chicane now let's talk qualifying strategy here Lockie just for a little moment because this is going to be all about firstly a timing and uh, b when everybody gets around and gets their laps in this place can be ruthless in terms of trying to put the perfect lap together well, I think if we want to talk about qualifying strategy, the strategy is quite simple, and that's to go as fast as you possibly can to make sure that you get the best possible position that you can on the grid. Probably the most interesting point for me in uh, these couple of qualifying groups that we've got to get through is to see uh, which particular driver in each car gets qualifying duty or uh, if, in fact, the teams choose to split up qualifying and maybe give each of their drivers a run in the car at some stage during the session. Well, we will be seeing that in the not-too-distant future, mm. but, Reese, this is where a lap really does need to come together. Let's try and go on board here with Kenneth Latter, see how a lap around this place goes in that Mustang here, down on the brakes into the two left-hand bends, of, of course, this wonderful uh, Ravazza section. They pass the Moto Chicane, the Varianto Bassa on the left-hand side. Part of the new changes to try and get up to Formula 1 spec was this long 1K straight. Now take us through a lap. Yes, indeed. So just over the start-finish line here and into turn one, barely a corner at all. Just hit the kerb, go over to the right-hand side, break at the 200 marker, down to third gear for Tamburello. Don't use the sleeping policeman too much. You'll get an off-track 1X. Control the oversteer through the exit of Tamburello, just using a bit of that astroturf. Slight slipping there from Kenneth Latter, then breaking down into fourth and then down into third again for the Villeneuve chicane, use all of that painted concrete on the exit and bouncing off the rev limiter in third, down to second once again for the Tosa hairpin. Very nicely controlled exit there from Kenneth Ladder. Once again, stay off the dark green AstroTurf because it will absolutely kill your exit. Stay to the right over the crest of the hill. This is the uh, Piratella corner down in third gear and you're immediately back on the brakes after going over to driver's left. Parry the brakes down into Aka Minerali. And he keeps the line nice and tight out of there. It's very easy to get some wheel spin over the curbs. Then at the top of fourth gear, slams down into second and boom, boom, over the curbs. Very smooth exit there from Kenneth, but running a little wide there on exit. He might want to improve that on his next couple laps. Stay over to the left and then bring it right as you come through the turn. Straighten out the braking zone for Ravats as much yeah. as possible. Brake bias might be a little bit too far to the rear for Kenneth. He runs wide at the second apex of Ravatsa, and that brings that lap to an end. He's going to bring that one straight back into the pits. And one of the big issues about qualifying here, Reese, is that you have to get the laps in quick and you have to get the laps in early because if you're trying to search for the perfect lap and you don't find it again and again, as Benjamin J. Smith, not to be confused with Benjamin Smith, uh, puts in the fastest time, beaten by Kyle George in the United Sim Sport Machine. As Jake Burton now goes fastest, 142.4. Every lap becomes a key fight as everyone starts struggling looking for something that is maybe not quite there every lap becomes this real challenge to find a bit more time as we look at Damien Johnstone right now up the hill out of Aqua Minerale and now starts to make that push to the Variante Alta this is one of those places where you can easily take a lot out of this place but you can't take too much here as you can see up on two wheels they'll go over the curbs they absolutely will and uh, really can hurt your exit if the car uh, gets a bit unsettled as it comes back down onto the wheels off of those curbs. So being smooth, not pushing too hard through that section is key. You can use all of the curb there on the outside at Ravazza as John Stone does. But once again, keeping it a little tight on the very exit. And that defines your entire run down this start finish straight towards the next lap. It's looking like a reasonable time there from Damian Johnstone. 43-2. And that's going to uh, put him... Uh, roundabout in the uh, the seventh eighth place area it seems no fifth he's gone fifth seven tenths down seven tenths down then in car number 58 that won't be ideal then in terms of trying to find uh, that result out but there is kyle george in second as they 
are staggering the qualifying as they did last time out. Everybody looking to try and get as much as they can. So 25 over as they go on through to 40. We'll all be looking to try and find those times. They just about managed to find themselves in. But the worry here about this opening time is what can Jake Burton do? He's got Don Ferraris alongside here today. The big times are going to be started to come in later on in the sessions. But three tenths clear at the moment. Burton will be very happy with the way that he's driving at the moment in a number 33. And there'll be hopefully more pace on the horizon with a Dom Ferraris who can go out there and can put some good times in on the board. Yeah, absolutely he can. Um, it's been a while since we've seen Dominic Ferraris making a start in Scops. But pairing with Jake Burton in the uh, VRS Prologue React Cup, looking forward to seeing what they can do. Burton... His fastest time is uh, a tenth and a hundredth uh, behind his fastest time in practice. So I think there is still a bit more pace to be found in that Commodore. But we got to remember the track temperature is already a bit high. It's 38 degrees out there on circuit at the moment. And the sun is beating down and heating up the circuit. And we talk about this a lot. The fact that the circuit gets a little bit slower as the session goes on, it's often beneficial to get your fastest time in as early as you can. But having said that, we were surprised at Phillip Island, and I'm looking to be surprised again here. Yes, and we have seen many a surprise up and down the order. A lot of people thinking that they found what it takes there, as we see also behind that, the Zuva racing car just about to go by Jake Burton here and try and make some progress. This is Chris Coxhead and Liam Wilde behind the wheel. And just talking to a couple of the Zuva drivers earlier on over the course of the racing action uh, of pre-qualifying that we had, Reese. Uh, it's really a case where Zuva felt that maybe some of the other teams out there have found something inside the setup that seemingly they've been able to exploit and the Zuva team haven't. Yeah, Zuva have uh, not had a good run here coming up to Imola. They did have some great showings at Phillip Island, to be sure, but Imola, a very different circuit to Phillip Island. It's, uh, it's still got some good flow to it, but the corners are shorter and sharper. The curbs are much harsher, and um, mechanical grip is uh, often at a premium there at the slow speed, which does require a bit of a different setup approach to the car. And that set of approach is going to be so crucial here as they head towards the great sim race next time out at Mount Panorama Bathurst. Drivers over the line. Benjamin Smith has gone second as Chris Cox said's time there. Good enough to go to fourth place. Half a second nice. off of Jake Burton at the moment. That's nice. That's very, very nice uh, going on forward there with that one all playing out. Hayden Veld currently in the KRF Eye Candy Car uh, rounds out the top five as things stand at the moment but there are drivers who are looking for times who aren't necessarily uh, in the right position you would say here the 018 of Jordi Sinai needs to find a little bit of pace out there on track you've got a couple drivers here and there who will be hoping that they've got what it takes to put the best time on the board and move themselves up forward with those qualifying peaks but sometimes you get the peaks sometimes you get the troughs sometimes drivers struggle out here on circuit as we focus on reese keen in the simrigs.com dpr 062 yeah and he's currently sitting in 10th in the standings at the moment continuing on with this lap and oh very close to getting the off track out of the Akaminarali section but it's looking like a nice clean lap here from Reese Keane and DPR they've they, they're a team that's shown an awful lot of potential especially at Phillip Island but uh, they had bad luck fall their way more than once in that session and uh they haven't really gotten the results that they were probably expecting. Nice smooth entry by Reese Keane into Rivat. So we'll see if he commits to this lap, taking an awful lot of the second apex curb. And it looks like he is going to stay out here and we're going to see a time. Can he improve on his 10th place? It's almost a second separating him from the top spot. But as he crosses the line, it's going to not be a lap, unfortunately. The amount of curb that he took at the second Ravatsa Apex would have invalidated that lap. 
And it's so easy to do just to push a little bit too far out. Jake Burton goes even quicker, 142.324. And that is brilliant there for the 33 team. They're building themselves more of a buffer. Now, Lockie, this is a really interesting part of qualifying because Jake Burton does not know how quickly all of his other rivals out here today are going to be running. He has to set a benchmark. Now, is that help or hindrance? Oh, <laughs> is it a helpful hindrance? Well, it is a benchmark and it is a, a bank of lap time, but I think if what we saw in the previous round of Hill of Highlands any indication, it could be that we don't start to see the really, really quick times until we get to the closing stages of the session. You'll probably see that the drivers will make a few trips in and out of the pits to take on fresh sets of tyres as we have a look at webcam view. <laughs> Who's this we're looking at? Sam Blacklock. Sam, Sam Blacklock. Blacklock. Having a it's little bit a, of a feed. <laughs> casual, would, casual as you like. I would say pre-race rituals don't get much better than that. So Sam Blacklock then is uh, just keeping himself nice and calm. Why wouldn't you at this stage just trying Look, to wait for your times to go on, get a bit of toast down your son, and honestly, get on out there and racing. And as race, you know, this is one of the things as well. This is all about fun at the end of the day. This is sim racing. Sim racing often gets put as overly super serious. There's Thomas Hinz, who will be waiting to go out in the second part of the session as well. We can't see his bed. It's a real He looks shame. like he's chewing on something too. Looks like he's looking for some pre-race ritual as well at this stage. It is late in the day as well that they're heading towards, and it's going to be soon dinner time, you'd say, in Australia. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I will make the point that... <laughs> in here on webcam, I think just seeing... Um, what we've just seen on the broadcast. But uh, I, I was going to make the point that uh, peanut butter and bread is actually quite a good snack for sim racing. You know, you've got that slow energy release from the peanut butter. You've got those omega-3 fatty acids helping your focus and a lot of carbohydrates to give you that energy boost when you're in the middle of a stint. I've had peanut butter before I've done races in the past and it's actually helped me. So uh, is it going to be a banned substance by the end of the year in Scops, I wonder? I wonder when the doping's going to happen in Scott. Now that's the next question that we're going to be having at the moment. Pot noodle! Pot noodle time for Ben Christensen. Not oh, sponsored, yeah. of course. So everybody's got exactly <laughs> what they want. Their free food rituals are in full form at the moment. Lockie, you haven't seen anything like this. This is peak Scops. <laughs> Well, as the pit lane reporter, who maybe I need to be getting down into some of those team garages and finding out exactly what energy enhancing snacks they're going for to make sure they're in peak <laughs> fitness for when they get in the car. Absolutely. You get on that then for the moment and find your snacks and we'll continue on looking at qualifying. Burton from Benjamin Smith, Kyle George, Chris Coxhead, Hayden Veld, your top five. Scott Zislowski there in sixth position in the 380 machine. We'll be hoping to find some good time out there here on circuit. This is one of those wider range circuits though, Reese. the way you've seen that time is going to be a little bit more elongated around this place than it would do others. There are a lot of places where time can be won and lost around this place. There is Sislovsky going through the Piratella corner in the full runner motorsports car and down the hill once again. Yep, and Sislovsky is going to be driving with Blake Neck once again in this uh, this race. They unfortunately did not get a result at Phillip Island. They'll be looking to improve on that here at Imola. But Chris Cox said coming up to the end of a lap and electing to go into the pits for that one. So a little bit too much curb. As you said, a lot of time can be gained and the curbs are a big part of that. But once again, you've got iRacing's automated off-track system to, uh, to pit you if you take a bit too much. And Jake Burton there demonstrating the ideal line through the second Ravatsa Apex. What about Soslovsky? A little bit unsettled on the brakes and just hits the red and white curb. That's going to be a clean lap from him. So can he improve on his sixth place currently? Thinking that we might be about to start a lap here with Scott Soslovsky. Yeah, that's a two minute point eight that time. That is an outlap for sure. It certainly is. As Scott Soslovsky is searching for time and time and time and time and time and time at this stage. That little wiggle there going through the second part there of Tam Morello and trying to move on up the order and find what's needed has just been dropped down 
into seventh place by Hugh Barter and the Evolution Racing Team. You can see again having to really correct there out on the very slippy Astro turf. This is one of the things with this car, Reese. It's oversteer and understeer bundled into one, and it's like trying to play with a jack in a box and not knowing which way he's going to come out the box. Yeah, exactly. Of course, uh, if you're familiar with the circuit from uh, from Formula One games and Formula One simulations, you know that it's a, a very fast and flowing circuit in an open wheeler, but in a big, heavy 650 horsepower touring car, it is all about managing your mid corner, making sure that you get on the throttle smoothly, riding the bumps efficiently. Remember, these cars don't have uh, a differential, so to speak. It's all locked, sealed rear end. Both rear wheels get the same amount of power 100% of the time. So that can translate to some, uh, some good turning on power. If you could jump on the throttle early, you can get some extra rotation happening in the car. But of course, uh, once they spin up, there's not much recovering them. And Soslowski demonstrating really well uh, just how much effort's required to wheel a car around here quickly. And you can see how quickly he's trying to go here. Takes the narrow line to the line here at this stage. It's a 143 flat. So that again remains seven tenths of a second back, but does jump ahead of Hugh Barter once again. So they keep switching for sixth and seventh at the moment. Not long to go though here in qualifying. There will be a little bit of peace, you would say, at some point here over the qualifying times. Looking to go on forward. There is Aaron Dodd in the Mark 1 car. Looking to try and find some improvements. Now, Mark 1, I think, are trying to build a new generation at the moment, Reese. They're hoping that they can find another generational talent. But the one issue is their one generational talent left them at the start of the season. And now they've got to think about, well, OK, how do we go and pick and recruit drivers maybe who are coming into the service who could be that generational talent for the future? Yeah, well, they'll uh, they'll be banking on uh, a lot of these guys here developing their skills as Aaron Dodd goes up to 11th place with that lap time and uh, certainly getting some way towards that generational talent level with that kind of improvement. Only a thousandth behind the Trans-Tasman Racing number 47 car with Lee Ellis at the wheel. So Mac 1 Esports with a good opening campaign in this initial uh, phase of qualifying. Aaron Dodd having a lot of fun there on his outlap. I think he's reasonably happy with that time, and I think Mach 1 management will be as well. I think they certainly will. Chris Cox said currently fifth. Robin Kirk has put the 073 car up into second position. Now, that will be good news for the SimRigs.com DPR team. They'll be very happy with that at the moment as everyone will be searching to look for their times. Kyle George, currently in third for the United SimSport team, has uh, probably one of their key figures alongside him at the moment in Jamie McKnight, who has been instrumental in bringing all of the quick drivers together from what was a dirt team into what it is now, and that is a multifaceted team that can perform on multiple different levels, you could say, over the iRacing service. Down the hill on the brakes with not long to go here moving forward and searching for a little bit more time going through the left here that comes along with the second of answer and now this push over the line. Benjamin Smith has brought the gap down to just a tenth and a half or a tenth and a quarter of a second at this stage. Finding something late, Kyle George does not find anything of note there. About two seconds off the pace with that lap time but this is really the last chart saloon and there is the beautiful tanked SRT machine looking for time. Yeah, Rob Bowden and Craig Anspach driving this one, the 010 currently sit on a 43.298 their fastest lap time it's not going to take much to break into the top 10 from here only about a tenth required Bowden crosses the line to set a 43.1 and that brings them up a couple positions to 13th so a good improvement there for uh, one of the most striking cars on the grid absolutely a much needed improvement with that time there is Kenneth Latter in 14th position in the Expo Gaming Motorsports car, trying to find something for the 554. Just pushing nicely there out of Toza, but again, we've been talking about this not long to go here over the course of this session. Everyone's searching for that time that's going to give them exactly what is needed here at this stage. They hope that they've got what they need to put themselves up forward as they go on through. And I'm just getting a little bit 
of uh, a little bit of conversation about what's going on. So apparently Ben Christensen was talking with Sam Blacklock at exactly the time that all of that camera stuff was going on. So, uh, ah. uh, Lucky, have you found anybody else here that has uh, found themselves some rituals to go through? Well, I've been having a chat in the background to the Evolution of Racing team manager Brenton O'Brien just to ask if any of his drivers are involved in consuming uh, energy enhancing snacks to ensure that they're in peak condition for the big race and uh, Brenton has denied that any of his drivers are on any such supplements however <laughs> he has uh, he has given me some insights about a member of one of the uh, opposition teams he says that uh, Simon Feigl from the Alters Esports teams drinks monster energy drinks like they're water <laughs> oh, righto wow. And well, Jay well, can confirm. Jay here can confirm that as Jake Burton has just gone quicker as the checkered flag goes out. A 142.185. It gives him an extra tenth of a second's buffer. That's going to be really useful here in terms of finding that time and moving forward. There's the trans oh, forty-seven, improvement. making progress. Lee Ellis jumps up to seventh place now with a good qualifying time. So that's exactly what the doctor ordered going on through. And that will be some really good improvements there but it's all about now everybody finding that lap and getting over the line and hoping there's a little bit more in the track which will now be heavily rubbered in there's Reese Keane in the 062 trying to make that progress over the line and trying to search for a little bit more and it's going to be a 43-1 coming over to the line that's the place there for Reese Keane so just outside the top 10 at the moment after that push over the line here's Jordi Sinai though Reese. Yeah, and Jordi in 15th place. He might be done here. He's going at a bit of a reduced rate of pace, just bringing that car back to the pits. If you're new to Scops, welcome. We run the no escape rule in this series. Drivers cannot just stop on track and escape back to the garage once they completed a lap. They have to bring it back into the pits as they would in real life, which, uh, of course, introduces a bit of a limitation to how many laps they can do in qualifying and there goes Jordi into the pits. They are done. But I tell you what, that gap uh, between the, the top 10 and the DPR 062 is something special. Only four thousandths of a second separating those guys. And that's over 103 second laps. So just shows you how little differences can be made in these cars. Absolutely. As most of these drivers now will be diving their way back onto the pits here as the second group of people will be looking to get themselves ready and going there is the uh, virtual racing school safety car making its progress around here on track the silver machine that is going forward is checking to see if there's anybody out there that doesn't belong effectively saying that it's going to be a clear track now i wonder who is actually behind uh, the safety car at the moment it's normally nick parker who finds himself behind the wheel but it is michael Carleff who's going to be having a little uh tootle around the circuit here today and uh someone reese who uh i think's got the most camera time out on screen here driving that safety car than he has done in about five years yeah there was uh, an awful lot of camera time for him at phillip island and of course a little bit of safety car drama at the end of Phillip Island. There's been a lot of discussion in the forums over uh, just how uh, the final safety car was called. And Oceanic Sim Racing have uh, have taken some of the driver's criticisms and feedback on board and have improved their process for Imola. So hopefully, if we see Mr. Korolev there out on track again, it won't introduce a bunch of controversy, but those are the results from the first phase of qualifying. Half of the grid have set their times with Burton and Ferraris on top, but Smith and Gamble two tenths behind. It'll be interesting to see what the second group can do uh, versus that time from Jake Burton, a 42.185. But as we've seen, fastest time in practice was Dane Warren with a high 41. So I expect that top time to go down by at least a couple tenths. How cool is that towards the end? Two hyperdrive cars followed by two race on Oz machines. It is effectively team warfare when you get to the mid to late pack here in this field. So keep that in mind as things are going to be going forward. This is going to be a very entertaining prospect that we're going to be looking at at this stage. So Jake Burton in total control at the moment, trying to find as much as can be possibly found 
here at this stage but for the time being it's going to be a case of what can these drivers all do and all find when it comes to this part of qualifying these 20 will be looking to try and get themselves going forward looking to try and get the best time possible that's 20 minutes on the clock they've been given the green light and here is the mad scramble out of the pits yeah and it's headed up by uh mr corey preston in the 098 car corey preston for exto gaming motorsports in the natrad machine driving with bradley ratu and these guys got the short end of the stick at Phillip Island very early on, which really hindered their result. And I'm definitely hoping for their sake that they have a better time out there this time round at Emola. Preston uh, just uh, calmly driving his way around the circuit, making sure that uh, his car is to his liking. But it looks like Andrew Gilliam behind him is, uh, is raring to go and try and uh, get some clear air. Absolutely, he is. And, well, let's talk achievements a little bit for a moment here, Lockie, because Corey Preston recently just got a good achievement. He got sixth in the Irishing Top 10 for July 2020. Yeah, that's a pretty good effort, isn't it? But it was actually a pretty tough weekend for the AXG gaming outfit at Phillip Island where they had uh, two of their cars retiring from the race inside the first 30 laps or so. So... They've been looking to bounce back with some better results tonight because Phillip Island was a shocker for them. Certainly will be looking for it and is going to be dictating pace then at the front. Everybody's now going to be starting to check up, slow up, give themselves a bit of space. If I were a uh, pursuit sim racing driver, I'd be giving a little bit of room. And there goes peeling off there on the left-hand side, Andrew Gilliam and co. at this stage, hoping to... Uh, get everything moving forward and hoping that it's all going to be nice. But Corey Preston, with control of things, will be looking for a good time early. And one of the keys here about racing around this place is he'll be going on to start his first lap here, Reese, is actually putting yourself in a good qualifying position. You can't win the race here on lap one. You can't win it from qualifying, but it's all about giving yourself the best possible chance. And you don't want to be stuck in the mid to late pack where Corey Preston had all of his issues. Yes, indeed. And uh, this initial lap that Preston is starting now, he's, uh, he's going to be slightly hindered off the start of that one because he is the leader of the pack. No slipstream for Corey Preston down the front straight, but I don't think that's going to affect him too much. He's running all the way out to the edge of the circuit there on the entry to Villeneuve and nice and smooth over the runoff area. Corey Preston, of course, uh, He's been in trouble with the stewards in the past and uh, has gained a bit of a reputation for himself, but he certainly puts a damn good effort in and uh, drives this car absolutely religiously. So looking to get the time down. It's looking nice and clean so far from Corey. Good opening lap. And it's all about getting that opening time on the board keeping it nice and clean once again through Ackerman Arali, just avoiding at the off track as does Gilliam behind him so let's see if Corey Preston can nail the last part of this lap and wow really vaulting himself over the curbs all four wheels off the ground there over the first apex he's very confident in the suspension of that Commodore needs to be quick needs to find time and everybody's going to be searching to get themselves up the order here Preston goes down on the brakes at Ravatsa and looks to try and make that push here, get the rotation in the car. Going through the second Ravatsa and over towards the line. It's going to be about who finds what is needed here. Preston's going to make the charge. And is this going to be enough here to find that shade of improvement? It's a 42-7 as the first banker then goes not bad position overall. Overall, it's not bad. Gilliam goes second. Forzal Narby, nine thousandths clear. Sets the real pace then in at 20 in car number 21. Top of the times at this stage, finding exactly what is needed at the moment and everybody searching for more and more and more james scott goes third caruso currently in fifth and that just tells you all you need to know forzan puts the first real big time on the board yeah and forzan el nabi driving with harley haber who uh as of more recently has uh, fallen under the ire of the stewards a few times another controversial figure 
in V8 Scops. I do have to say, though, both Corey Preston and Harley Haber have put a lot of effort into improving their image out there on circuit, and uh, I've definitely gained some respect for them in the past couple seasons as Dane Warren goes wow. P1 there, 41.8. That is quite the statement from the number 77. That, that's insane. Like, Dane Warren, of course, there's a lot of talk about where he's going to be ending up through all of this, and a lot of good money being put on VRS Commander Simsport as a place where maybe Dane Warren lands, goes with Josh Rogers, potentially, over there to the Commander team to have more of a pro outfit influence at this stage. So, uh, Lockie, you've been talking in and around and searching about how much basis is there to Dane Warren to Commander? <laughs> wow, really, uh throwing me under the bus there, Jake. Um, I know that there have been some rumours floating around, and obviously Dane's been having a pretty solid run in the Porsche Esports Super Cup, so wouldn't surprise me at all if he was to end up over there, but uh, um, in saying that, obviously overseas travel from Australia is a little bit restricted at the moment, but uh, I'll tell you what, um, Dane Warren, we saw a stout qualifying performance from him in the previous V8 Scots are out of Phillip Island and uh, to come out straight away and go three tenths of a second clear of the field, once again showing that he is the supreme drive when it comes to speed over one lap. Exactly, and that's the key as well, getting Dane Warren focused and into the right place to go and make all of those times really a reality. Someone, I think, who has got it absolutely all when it comes to being a driver. You cannot really uh, get themselves all really too calm and too concerned about what's going on in the race at the moment. But everybody searching for times. There's Tom Freer driving with Jamie Stovold, their 13th position at the moment. Corey Preston in 14th place right now. But all of these times are becoming really, really key and also keep an eye out on those pursuit drivers because they are 6th and 7th at the moment. Gilliam and Purdy here trying to get themselves uh, up through the order. There's Jordan Caruso and Ethan Grigg Galt. 8th position at the moment in the 117 machine. Half a second off in terms of time. But this is one of those places where you can get the fuel save game working here, Rhys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a circuit that has uh, has corners that flow into each other. A lot of decreasing speed corners and uh, sequences of corners here at Imola, which does allow you to lift and coast a bit more, allows you to clutch it into the braking zones like down here at Akaminarali. This is a great place to save some fuel, as long as you don't blip the throttle too aggressively on the downshifts. Interesting to note that Jordan Caruso is uh, qualifying this car and not Ethan Grigg Galt. As we saw with the practice start and the practice session, we expect Ethan Grigg Galt to take the wheel of that car. And uh, on the subject of pursuit, one car that is going to have to make some improvements is the number 93. They're currently plumb last at the back of the grid. Griffin Gardner at the wheel. We saw him have a spin at Akamenarali just a few minutes ago. But Griffin, certainly a quick driver in these cars, managed to get a podium at Sebring uh, last season. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do in that 93 with the pursuit, guys. It was quite amazing to see him pre-qualify. He put three, four laps in and did a 42.5 to put himself right up there in terms of the time. So there certainly is something there for Griffin Gardner. If he can go and find it, there is Sean Caruso on screen. We're on board going through Tamborello, a fantastic left, right, and uh, left again. You can see there on the right-hand side, there's a small little statue uh, to the late great Ayrton Senna. Tragically lost his life here in 1994. This is the Villeneuve chicane, of course. Uh, this is where tragically Roman Ratzenberger uh, lost his life here in also 1994, just a day earlier. But uh, from that tragic weekend, a lot has come out of it, a lot of safety improvements. And I would say one of the greatest safety improvements that you could ever have, Reese, uh, is going to sim racing because there is pretty much minimal chance that you can run yourself into troubles. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, it, the sim racing doesn't carry anywhere near the amount of, of risk to life and limb that real life racing uh, did and uh, still does to an extent despite the uh, massive safety improvements, it is still uh, quite the dangerous sport. Motorsport is dangerous, is printed on tickets for a reason. But in sim racing, you can really hurl the car in. You don't have to worry too much about, uh, about something going wrong with the suspension of the car in the middle of the corner. 
definitely a lot more time to be extracted around these laser scanned circuits. But Caruso just over the curb at the second Ravazza Apex. Looks like he's deciding to bring that one in. So no improvement on a position eight. Andrew Gilliam, on the other hand, about to come across the line. Currently sitting in sixth. Can he make an improvement? 42-135. That puts him all the way up to second. Bingo! Andrew Gilliam finds the magic formula to jump up the times to second position. The 201 looking for times. And there's the 28 machine making its first appearance up into third place. Jake Maloney qualifying the car. Now here's Corey Shepard, someone in the AOC uh, sponsored car who is looking absolutely fantastic at the moment trying to find some times has really found something in the car a great turn of pace and will be looking to make that progress over towards the line it's a 42-3 that's a really good time from Corey Shepard Dane Warren goes even faster to a 41-7 but that is Corey Shepard up into seventh place it is indeed a good improvement there for the Premier Racing Team 4 car but once again Dane Warren in the VRS Trans Tasman machine showing that he is the best on one lap pace and Adam Briggs there outside the top 20. He's one of the drivers that's, uh, that's one of the fastest at the DPR racing team and he'll be looking to uh, gain a few more tenths at least in that number tw uh, number 72. James Scott with, uh, with a car behind. It looks like he might be on a lap. How aggressive is he over the curbs? It's a good exit from him, but that Trans-Tasman car behind him, he'd probably be a little distracted in the mirrors. Certainly will be, as James Scott, of course, has led the championship on overall points for a number of weeks since the very start of the championship, but with drops now starting to fall a little bit further back, hasn't found those really top results that give all the points, both of whom are going to be diving down into the pits. Griffin Gardner's time has improved, has moved up into seventh position, and what is also very, very crucial as well are that there are a few drivers here who are looking for times. Brady Myers, for example, in 12th place. Glenn Postlethwaite here in the Synergy Sim Racing car right now in 14th race and that 88 machine always has the ability to surprise yeah it definitely does there were there were a couple of surprises for them at Phillip Island we didn't even know if Brenton Hobson was going to be able to make it due to a family emergency but he managed to jump in there and uh, put in a great drive but he and Posse of course um, suffering in the final stages of the race be good to see if they can translate their potential into a good result here at Imola. Interestingly, with uh, Griffin Gardner putting that number 93 into seventh, that makes three pursuit cars in the top 10. What can Brett Loxton do here across the line in the Zuva racing car, starting a flying lap? I would have said a 202.9 isn't necessarily the fastest time, and that is a very uh, entertaining way for the Altus car to get out of the way, cutting Ooh. the chicane at turn one, or technically turn two, actually, that Tamburello is. The small kink left, uh, effectively, on the track map is a turn one. But we're now starting to get to, OK, not long to go here in this qualifying session. We've got seven minutes now on the clock, and Lockie, uh, just looking up and down the order, how are people feeling when it comes to Dane Warren has literally got himself three and a half tenths of a second? I think they're feeling pretty nervous, but uh, just having a look at the timing at the moment, and uh, a few drivers who I want to highlight, interesting to see that in the 088 Alter C Sports car, it's James Scott who's been handed a qualifying duty tonight because Puka Webster qualified that car in the previous round at Phil of Ireland. And equally, as Rex touched on as well, the 117 Evolution Racing car, Jordan Caruso, in the car for this qualifying session, whereas it was Ethan Grigolt who put that car's, or set that car's place on the grid in the previous round at Phillip Island. Well, that's going to be interesting. That looked very aggressive over the uh, the very anti-alta chicane there from Forza Nabi. Huge anti-cut curbs there at that section of track as well, which will be uh, not very ideal. And that will be a dive down into the pits with an invalidated lap. Get a fresh set of boots on and try and go through the cycle once again to make sure that they get themselves going forward. There is Jake Maloney in the Bianchi Trans Tasman car trying to go on to a flying lap at the moment. Currently in third position right now. And what's key through all of this, we haven't really talked about Reese. Jake Burton is still in fifth place. 
Yeah, that initial time that he set in the first group of qualifying is fantastic for Jake, that 42-3. Um, I was uh, I was surprised to see that uh, that they weren't as high in pre-qualifying, but I think Jake Burton was just a little bit pushed for spare time this week. Nonetheless, continuing to show his skill in these cars, setting that time and uh, po possibly getting himself a top 10 start. And that top 10 start can be key. Inside the top 20, just though, is another trans Tasman machine. And that is the one being piloted around by Emily Jones. And she'll be looking to try and find some good times. Over the line, you can tell it's green because it's Emery with the wing mirrors. That's normally how you identify most vehicles at trans Tasman. It's now on to a flyer. She will go. Now, this is going to be a really key lap time. A lot of people have been playing Microsoft Flight Simulator over the course of uh, what has been some uh, a, an amazing week of gaming I think is the right way to say it but what's key is everyone's hoping that they are going to fly just like that yes indeed but uh, uh, hopefully in the opposite direction being pushed to the ground rather than flying away from the ground Gilliam is about to set another time here can he improve on a second place oh 42-0 man that is so close to jumping into the 41s but it's still not a patch on the number 77 and uh, Jake Maloney brings that car in. That lap has been abandoned. James Scott setting a 42.274. That's uh, going to be a slight improvement there for the Altus Esports car in sixth. Yeah, those are some good lap times. Here's Glenn Postlethwaite, 15th position now, has dropped one place because of drivers jumping up. That's a 42.6. They're coming over the line with three and a three quarter minutes on the clock. Does jump back up into 14th position as in comes the AOC car there for the Premier Racing Team there into the pits goes Tom Freer in 15th overall and here is Jordan Caruso for the ERT 117 trying to make progress El Nabi going on to try and start to fly it as well out on track and everybody now has effectively got to find their best foot and put it forward at this stage Reese. Yes indeed now is crunch time Thanks to the no escape rule, the drivers that bring their cars into the pits with uh, about a bit less than three minutes to spare will not get back out onto the circuit. You need to uh, be able to cross the line to start your lap before the time hits zero. Philip Wally there, I, uh, I don't think that... There we go, that accurately reflects that time. I was going to say, a 41 flat from Philip Wally. Where has he been for the past uh, five years? He should have won the championship every year, but... Of course, the timing uh, does take a couple seconds to update. 42.307 for Griffin Gardner. And uh, that's going to allow that car to remain in seventh place. And looks like that's the last we're going to see of the 201 of Gilliam and Tally Ansic. And also James Scott and Cooper Webster bring their car in for the last time. Well, they are allowed to finish any lap that they start. So they still have... 30 seconds to get tyres, to get fuel, get out of the way and get an outlap going. It's a two-minute outlap around this place, but I think Simon Fine will definitely be done here with 2.15 and has to traverse lane time. Glenn Postlethwaite's not going to find that much time. Here's Jordan Caruso, though, on a lap here, uh, just jumping down, and that's definitely going to be an interesting point to find if he can get there in the Holden, trying to make that progress through on towards the front stretch once again here for Evolution's racing team. And is this going to be enough over the line to improve? It's a 42-3-4-2. So that uh, looks like it is one place. Blake Purdy gets jumped down to 10th overall as the first ERT car is in ninth. And Reese, that's surprising. Yeah, it is, and um, I, I would have expected them to be a bit further up there, but of course, when Ooh. you look at the 117, it's going to uh, be race pace that dictates how they'll go. Corey Preston about to finish a lap here, and it looks like a mid-42 for him. That's going to promote him back up to 14th place. I think Preston and Ratu are going to be happy with that. They are still in the midfield, which is the danger zone. Here come the Trans-Tasman cars. Yeah, they're going to go on to start their final flyer, but I'm just getting word in here, Lockie, from the stewards, and that is that James Scott has been given an official warning out on track after balking uh, Rudd's lap. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's always one of the tricky things to manage, particularly when you get into the dying stages of a qualifying session like this one. If you're on an outlap and you're cycling your tyres up to temperature, you do have to be very careful not to impede cars that might be on a hot lap. So... 
James Scott obviously copying that warning from the stewards, and you'll have to be careful not to commit that infringement again. And it's so easy to do, and you can see he's going hard to the right-hand side, letting the uh, fantastic Pursuit Sim Racing Team car uh, jump on by. But now it's about what can you do, what can you find in terms of putting the times together. 15 seconds on the clock, Adam Briggs goes on to start a flyer then, trying to get things going. Andrew Gilliam will just get over the line with about six seconds remaining, followed, of course, by the 088, who was searching for a draft partner and has just about found it here. The clock expires here in qualifying the last laps coming in who's going to find the improvements to jump up the order here it's not going to be the 923 car it's not going to be that synergy sim racing car of the 88 either they're both going to find a whole heap of nothing it's not going to be blake purdy either in the 466 making a uh, meal of pit entry there, locking up the rear axle and hitting uh, the wall on the entry there. It's not going to be the 98 either finding times. Is it going to be the 9 though here of Kobe Jones in the ANZ Motorsports car trying to get over the line? This is going to be a push and of course you've got uh, the two trans Tasman cars who I think have just backed off of the lap as well. Jones searching for time. It's a 42-7 over the line and that looks like it could be a little bit of improvement, but it's 18th place only. Here is Corey Shepard trying to improve. It's a 42-3 at this stage in time. So uh, still oh, a good time, but not Tom enough. Tom Freer there. into the Tom top Freer, 10. What a lap. What a yeah. lap. Tom Freer goes ninth place over the line. Exactly what was needed. Brady Myers over the line looks to try and find something and doesn't quite get the improvement that's needed. Stays in 13th then as the final few drivers make progress to the line. Emily Jones won't find what's needed. Here's the 72 of Adam Briggs diving down onto the lane. He'll be trying to get some dogs or whatever it is that the cool kids are saying at this stage. Andrew Gilliam now is going to try and get himself through the final Ravazza corner and push for time. And this looks like this could be a good time coming over the line definitely continuing 39 40 41.952 oh! he does break the barrier and he goes even quicker into second position but james scott behind jumps into third as the final two drivers over the line let's get the grid up for you then this is how everything's gonna stack then here from the wonderful imola circuit Dane Warren and Madison down the BRS Trans Tasman car gets pole position with Pursuit Sim Racing Gilliam and Taliancic alongside. Then it's Scott and Webster starting this one out in third. They've already got an official warning here in this session with Maloney and Hampton in the Bianchi Trans Tasman car fourth position. United start fifth. Osdell Narby and Harley Haber have work to do today with Burton and Ferraris in the BRS X Prologue React car in sixth place. Then you've got Gardner and Goodall in the Pursuit Sim Racing 93. Premier Racing Team start 8th, and then you've got Pursuit Sim Racing 707. Three Pursuit cars in the top 9, with Jordan Caruso and Ethan Grigg Galt, the first ERT car in 10th. Yeah, that's not going to be a great start to them for this one. Hopefully they advance forward in 11th. Purdy and Stewart start the Pursuit number 488 from 11th alongside Benjamin Smith and Scott Gamble in his final uh, online sim race. Myers and Blacklock in the Lucky 13th alongside the Briggs Dyson pair in the DPR 72. Corey Preston and Bradley Ratu just bumped back to 15th at the end of the session there. They're starting alongside Posse and Hobbo in the number 88. Alta C Sports 02, uh, 923, Feigl and Hanlon alongside Kobe Jones and Ben Christensen with George and McKnight starting in 19th alongside Lobb and Worley. And what's very interesting is that the drivers who is, you're seeing switching on screen is Locks and Hints, 21st Jones and Fraser, 22nd. Drivers on the left-hand side are those who are getting in the car for this opening stint. Then you've got the Simrix.com DPR car there of Ms. Dale and Kirk uh, alongside uh, Rudd and Borg there in the PR, uh, PRT 017. They start on row 12. Row 13 is Coxhead and Wild with Velden Deer. So the KRF and Zuva Alliance there on row 13. Trans Tasman there with Ellis and Stenberg, 27th. is Loski and Neck for four runner in 28th then you got the ERT 13 car and the Synergy Sim Racing JK Science 58 rounding out row 15. It's going to be Neil Pearson starting the simrigs.com DPR 062 from 31st alongside Bird and Dodd in the Mac 1787. Rob Bowden and Craig Anspach starting 33rd alongside Kenneth Latter and Sean Linsell with Scott Nolan and Yordi Sinai in 35th with and McKenzie and Peters in 36th. Kane Hewson and Matthew Norris start their Team Hyperdrive machine from 37th alongside uh, Wallace and Tyler Blackburn in 38th. 
and our 40 car field rounded out by Benjamin J. Smith and Andrew Mogridge for Race on Oz with Daniel Ackland and Michael Schreyer in the final spot on the grid for Synergy Sim Racing. Yeah, that is the number 30 car who will be the last one to get themselves uh, up and away. It's a three-minute grid procedure. There are your current air and track temperatures, 24 degrees uh, in the air. And on track, it is 33 degrees here as we hit the mid-afternoon here in the Italian countryside at this stage in time. This place has held so many great races. You can see it's going to be a 102-lap race here today, 496 kilometers. Someone's got to go and tell Mr. Simon Black that he's got to adjust those laps up ever so slightly to make sure they're truly 500-kilometer races. But here is going to be a very entertaining battle. Watch out for that run towards turn two. It's very easy to lock up there on cold tires and go straight on, especially with the anti-cut curbs there on the inside. They could be proving to be a real sticking point for a 40-car field to all negotiate a way through uh, the opening sections of this lap. You can very easily go and battle, and that big 1K straight, which winds and weaves its way around the north side, will be something very interesting to keep in mind. Watch out for drivers looking to try and really make some progress through when it comes to strategy. There is the potential for a random safety car, maybe none, maybe two, maybe one, but gridding procedure starts, lights on here for 102 laps here at Imola, and it starts now, and it's a really slow start from Andrew Gilliam, a great start then from the team there of the Bianchi model cars, uh, Trans Tasman Machine, they've got a really good one as they funnel two wide, three wide in places into the opening chicane. Oh, it no. is Trans Tasman one and two, bit of contact there in the middle of the pack as they go on through, nice and calm it is, but Burton survives it nicely, some side by side as that's the Altus car there trying to fight, Jay Scott desperately wants in. There's already the jump that the uh, Tyrone Stoutsman car wants in the early stages, but look at this, still fighting all the way to Tozer. Yeah, that's Cooper Webster in the 088 fighting with Richard Hempstead. Corey Preston is around in the background. That's an incident down at the Villeneuve chicane, but the number 77 absolutely nailing the start here, but it is on for second because Webster and Hampstead the, the proverbial corks in the bottle here, allowing Jake Burton to get in on this and uh, get up into the top three in the standings on lap one. Ethan Grigg goals up the inside of Andrew Gilliam coming into Ackerman wow. Raleigh. Great opportunistic move. Bit of oversteer on the exit, though, and a little bit of contact. And Forza El Nabi and Harley Haber. Harley Haber's in the car. Don't go for the move there at the Varianti Alta. Ethan Grigg Galt just slips on by Michael Taliancic in the 201. Michael Taliancic is really in, uh, in, in quite the quagmire here because he's having to deal with uh, Harley Haber, with Griffin, with Ruben Goodall as well in the number 93. Goodness me. Baptism of fire for sure, but it looks like the top two and top three are now sorted. They certainly are. Some drivers trying to put their second driver in first, and that's why we got that big shuffle. Brett Loxton was down in on pit lane early with Thomas Hint, so it's not been a good day for the Zuva car. But look at the gap already out in front for your Trans Tasman machine out in front. It's a 1 2 at the moment for them, which they'll be very happy about. Down in behind the wheel, currently finds himself with 2.8 seconds to play with here at the moment. Your biggest loser in that start is your Michael Talley. Andrew, Andrew Gilliam pursuit sim racing car. They lost five places off the start. Talk about big gainers. Ethan Rick and Julian Caruso. They had an absolute stormer here to start. They absolutely did, and a big part of that was uh, Ethan taking advantage of Hampstead and Webster battling along with Burton. That slowed up Michael Taliansic and allowed him to get on by. Interestingly, Greg Galt also managing to uh, hold off the advances of Harley Haber. He's actually staying with the Hampstead Webster Burton fight here. He certainly is. We've got battling in the mid pack as well, as this is uh, Clint Shane Smith, who's having to play defense at the moment to Brady Myers and Co. There is, of course, the uh, Synergy Sim Racing car trying to get past the very iconic ANZ Motorsports machine at this stage, heading up the hill towards the Mariante Alta at this stage. Ben Christensen behind the wheel at the moment, trying to piece together some good times. Wide goes the Sinji car. That's going to allow uh, oh. maybe a car to dive down through, and that's some three wide action as well. That's not good. Contact between them on the run here <laughs> towards Ravazza. Lucky you had a little look at that, and it looks like everybody's trying to catch the last bus. 
Lockie, of course, our pit reporter. We're going to bring him in when there's some strategy info to talk about. But that move That's ending early. up shuffling. Oh, yeah, jump very start. early pit stop. But yeah, it looks like it might have been a jump start there for the ANZ number nine. So Ben Christensen brings that one in and the rest of the field stream on by. That's a big shame for them right at the start of this one. But now Clint Smith really fighting against Andrew Dyson in the number 72 for that final spot in the top 10. They're quite in quite the pack of cars here at the moment. Brady Myers just up ahead of them in the 215. He's looking to make some advancing off the start. Started in 13th, now holds on to ninth position, does Myers in the blue, white and yellow machine. And trying to find anything that is there and is possible. We've got Sam Blacklock, the teammate there, waiting uh, to get into the car and just waiting. The nice LED keyboard there lighting up and giving him a little bit more illumination uh, as he looks to get himself ready and waiting. But now here's something to look at. That's all shades of wrong from Clint oh. Shane Smith there at Aqua Minerale. The back stepped out, had to try and gather it back in. And you can see how much time that Clint's lost here in terms of all of this. There goes Benjamin Smith and Scott Gamble's car. Uh, straight on through nicely done and a nice position made there to gain the places so easy can these positions be lost Reese. yes indeed uh, that that turn variante alta one of the corners that uh, that can be decisive on a lap if you don't ride the curbs correctly get unsettled on the exit run wide get a slowdown a multitude of things that can go wrong at that corner and you can instantly lose the position so mr gamble his swan song getting off to a very good start here, up then into that 13th position. Just getting 12th, some words sorry. in a couple of penalties, just diving down through at this stage in time. Uh, we've just worked out that the Corey Preston Ben Christensen incident was why we saw Ben Christensen take a drive through. No uh, real harm, no real foul there in terms of that as Cooper Webster now through on uh, Richard Hampstead up into second place. Let's catch a motion simulation replay, hopefully see how that one all managed to piece itself together in terms of that. We'll try, uh, but we won't have many guarantees on uh, whether that one's going to happen. That's literally just happened this lap, but uh, here is the motion simulation replay on screen for you. Hoping, fingers crossed, everything will piece itself together. It works down the inside and trying to pick up that move. And you can see that is what you would call a trademark overtake here at the circuit of Imola. Taking the slipstream down the front straight and outbreaking Hampstead into the Tamburello corner and leaving the gap open on the inside for Webster to slip on through. We're going to stay on the replay because something happened after this. Jake Burton and Ethan Grigg Galt behind these guys. And filing back through the field, we see the Altus Esports car of Brady Myers potentially setting up a move here into Piratella quite interesting not usually the place that you'd pass but he's gonna have a red hot go at it anyway and sneaks on through on the pursuit sim racing car of michael taliancic no, uh, that's uh, Ruben Goodall actually going through there. My apologies. It's just in front. No, it's absolutely fine, Reese. It's fine. We're, we're all new here. We're all trying to get ourselves situated to everything. But for the time being, Brady Myers up into the eighth place. And now look at the 72 car of Andrew Dyson. Look how they've made some great starts over the course of this uh, little opening section. Look, try and get some time in and can't quite get there at the moment just behind as we continue our focus here with Brady Myers at the moment. Look at them nose to tail as they funnel on through towards the Villeneuve chicane named after the legendary Gilles Villeneuve. But Lockie, let's talk strategy here for a moment. It looks like it's going to be another one of those races where three stops looks like it's going to be the key today. But oh, that's all shades of wrong from Brady Myers. How will drivers be looking to fare and what's the main strategy calls that we'll be keeping an eye out on today? Yeah, 100%. So there will be four compulsory pit stops. However, theoretically, you can get through the race on just three pit stops. So what that means is that you will see a few drivers maybe gamble on an early pit stop to try and get themselves out of sequence. It's what we saw from the winning Havstead and Maloney team at Phillip Island where they took an early pit stop and basically got to a point where they could make their second pit stop of the race at a point where then their fuel range was good enough to make three stops from there to get them home. So the, uh, the fuel range that we're expecting from the cars tonight 
27 laps. What that means is the critical lap number, the point of the race at which you can make your final pit stop, put enough fuel in to get through to the chequered flag, is lap number 75. So if you work backwards from that point, that means that basically if you make your second pit stop any time after lap number 27, you can get through from that point on two more pit stops. And uh, the other critical lap number, driver distance. Each driver must do no more than 68 laps, which working backwards means the minimum number of laps that each driver must complete in the car is 34 laps. They're the key numbers to keep an eye out for tonight. They certainly are. And what's going to be key here is that everybody is going to be trying to find as much time as possible here in terms of getting the results that they need. We've seen positions change up and down the order as everybody's been looking to try and get some brilliant results here in terms of this result, in terms of this race. And they're trying to find things, but you can see here, just in the background there of shot, that was Clint Shane Smith trying to get back through on uh, what is going to be one of those pursuit sim racing cars there, trying to find some times. But we are still focusing here on this battle between Myers and Tally Ancic up on screen here, Reese. But the big key is going to be how is this going to be uh, so very, very interesting in terms of where this all feeds up? Because we know how quick Andrew Gilliam is, but I think Michael Taliancic here and uh, the team and the like are all thinking about, OK, let's just bite the bullet right now. Let's put our slower driver in at this stage. We'll lose a bit of time, but then we can have the entirety of the rest of the stint to go and worry about here in terms of getting as much time as possible out of our quick drivers. Yeah, exactly, and they, they might bank on some safety cars as well to try and gain back these positions. I don't expect... Oh, there we go. There goes Tally Ansich. He pulls out off the racing line to let Brady Myers go. I think a very calculated and wise move there from Tally Ansich. It means that he can stick in the draft of Brady Myers because Harley Haber is uh, almost a country mile ahead of these guys. Uh, this will definitely help the Pursuit Sim Racing 1 car. They'll be able to save a little bit of fuel here early on, but have a look at the draft there that Tally Ansich gets, but he pulls out of the draft. He knows that it's not the best uh, not the best route to battle hard this early on. Exactly. There's a case of uh, minimal returns, and you get a bigger return uh, not, not battling at this stage compared to battling a little bit later on. Look at the train behind there that is starting to form behind Blake Purdy here at this stage. Look at this. There goes Brenton Hobson. Hobbo 88. All the way to the outside by Clint Shane Smith and gets it down the inside. Now, which way do you want to look here? Emily Jones trying to find the place as well. And that's going to be a wait in line and wait your turn at this stage going on through. She's going to look every which way, hopefully at Piratella, uh, trying to work out when's the right time to strike. But ultimately, it's a case of not now just yet. We're going to have to play that waiting game and wait for a long 1K straight. Yep, that's going to be the easiest place to try and get by. Certainly not here at Aqua Minerale. And uh, even then at Varianti Alta, it's, uh, it provides a bit of an outbreaking opportunity. But Smith uh, going a little bit late there to the optimum line in just to cover off Jones's advance. And the DPR car behind them is uh, certainly looking to take advantage of this as well. But we'll wait for that straight, see what Emily Jones can do here. Brenton Hobson, I don't think, is going to have to worry too much about them. He's got a good gap ahead to Scott Gamble, which means he's going to get the draft but not get held up. Meanwhile, up the front, second place, Cooper Webster in the Alta Sea Sports car. He's put in some great laps here to start off with maintaining position ahead of Hampstead, ahead of Burton, ahead of Greg Galt. No change for them so far, but you see in the background Harley Haber still lurking. Still lurking there in that sixth place, trying to stay with these drivers. We know that Forz Nanonabi is the quick driver of the pairing right now as that battle behind still continues. Clint Shane Smith's got to be really wary. He runs slightly wide. He gives the door open then to another driver trying to find a way through. This is the Simrix.com DPR car. A 2-3-3. Three, three. Philip Wally's team looking to dive down and try and pick up the place once again. Looking the long way around. Tozer is always a tough call to try and make him power. Oh, look at that. It's so tough, but look at the drive. You're absolutely right there, Reese. That is vintage and now look at simon feigl who's apparently fueled on monster energy drinks now drinks it like it's tap and he looks to try and get himself going through like he's got a white claw on av available offering 
<laughs> I, I have no idea what that means, but I'm going to just go along with it anyway. It's certainly a, a good opportunity for Simon Feigl to gain a couple extra positions here. Darren Lobb was uh, certainly great around the outside of Tosa in the 2-3-3. Shows that uh, even if you're on the outside, you can get on the throttle a little bit earlier, maintain the momentum around the outside, and Clint Smith wasn't able to respond. And looks like Darren Lobb just uh, gapping him ever so slightly over the course of the second half of the lap. We'll see if there is an attack here into turn one. I know that Feigl is looking very hungry in that Altus Mustang. Oh, he certainly is as they look to battle but here up further forward. There's Jake Burton, fourth position right now. The VRSX Prologue React eSport team look like they are going to be in a really good position here at this point in time. You can't really uh, fault them for having a uh, bad run at this stage. Jake Burton's put the car right in the thick of things at the moment. Definitely has a turn of pace, but it's going to be relying on Dom Ferraris to get those big results in the mid part of this one as well to continue on. Here's some more battling here. Adam Briggs has caught the back and Mike T, Mr. Taliancic has work to do, but you can see just how everyone started to form into little trains and little snakes. And here's a battle of, uh, or a line, I should say, of three pursuit cards in a row. And it could soon be four pursuit cards in a row if they're not too careful. Yes, indeed. Ruben Goodall is up ahead in the sister car, but it's Job Stewart and Jamie Stovold in the 488 and 707. And uh, they're starting to fall into the clutches of Gamble and the like. And we're about to see a move there. Daniel Misdale trying to go up the inside at Piratella on the Zuva racing car, Chris Coxhead. But Chris was very wise to that, maintained the momentum again around the outside. Yep, did brilliantly, and there is also behind Hayden Veld and one of the extra gaming cars there, Kenneth Latter's team. You've got one of the Evolution Racing Team cars in there as well, and everybody who's having a search. This is effectively what mid to late pack racing is, just a huge slew of cars trying to go through. The Forerunner car, the Tanked SRT car, the Trans Tasman car, they're all there. They're all hoping that they're going to find a way through and get themselves going. Now, what's the strategy going to be like here, Lockie, when you're looking at the middle of the pack? because they have the potential to do something quite outlandish, maybe even gamble some track position on a uh, safety car here or there as we see Andrew Dyson going through and making it four pursuit cars in a line. Yeah, I think that if you're stuck in traffic and you feel like you can do faster lap times, you'd seriously think about coming into the pits now and getting yourself out of the traffic. We know that uh, with the extra pit stop that all of the teams are required to make, if you stop at this point of the race, there's still going to be three stops to get you home. And like I said, it's the strategy that works for Habstead and Maloney at Phillip Island. And the other advantage, apart from getting you into a position on the racetrack where you can go faster than if you're stuck in traffic. It's also a damage limitation, risk minimization exercise because it leaves you less vulnerable to the cut and thrust of the pack and getting caught up in incidents. So I'm actually quite staggered that we're 10 laps into the race and uh, so far we've only had um, a couple of cars make pit lane visits for unscheduled stops or drive through penalties. We haven't really had any, uh, any scheduled stops Brenton O'Brien from the Evolution Racing Team has just made a good point, though, which is the benefit of being in traffic does mean that you can fuel save by taking advantage of the slipstream of other cars. So that'll be the other uh, consideration as well. Well, that's a good consideration. This is Ethan Greg Galt in fifth position, and this is where that fuel save game comes right into the clutch. It's actually first taker on the lane, and, well, it's the same strategy as last time. It worked for them there a little bit earlier on, Lucky, It's Richard Hampstead in the Bianca Trans Tasman team. Indeed. So, it'll be interesting to see here whether he stays on board that car or if he hands over to Jake Maloney. Interestingly, it was Jake Maloney who started the race at Phillip Island, so they've got the alternate option this time around, and they've got Hamstead in the car for the opening stint, so does he stay on board, or does he make it a short first stint and hand over to Maloney at this point? Well, we've just seen the change of position as well, Reese. It was pretty comfortable in the end for the Panther Fuels Evolution Racing Team 117. Ethan Gregolt going through against Jake Burton, getting the car up from starting in 10th position, mind you, already up to third. 
yeah, excellent run from them in the first 11 laps of this one, but that battling has allowed Cooper Webster in the 088 to really get away from them now. With, uh, with Madison down in the lead at the moment, Richard Hamstead has decided to stay in that number 28, just taking that initial short stint in this race. So Maloney has yet to jump into the car. We'll probably see him either in the middle stint or taking the car all the way to the end. Just getting a few more points uh, coming in here from the stewards. It looks like a 10-point penalty uh, assessed to Job Stewart. That will be for the license points that go on. If you get 100 on the license points, that's it. You have to sit a race out. So they will be very much a point of contention here as Brenton Hobson and Emily Jones battle of the Twitch streamers going on here at the moment out on track. But also a uh, redress and 10-point penalty going to Corey Preston as well. So that won't be doing uh, any favours at all there. That happened on lap three, but look at this for a mid-pack uh, train at the moment and everybody's thinking about well okay we're playing the waiting game so they will sit they will watch they will hope that they get exactly what they need out of this one here as in comes Darren Lobb for what is the simrings.com DPR car here as look at this a little look from Hobson now turning defense into offense down the inside of Scott Gamble on final duties there taking up the plate Excellent move from Brenton Hobson. Just slid right on through there on Gamble, and now he's open up to an attack on Emily Jones. Trans-Tasman also brings one of their cars into the pits, the number 47, Kurt Stenberg, at the wheel of that one after Lee Ellis qualified the car. Can Emily Jones get through on Scott Gamble? Well, he's really putting on a great defensive drive there coming into Tosa, but I think Brenton Hobson is going to start leaving these guys behind because uh, uh, just up ahead of them, the two pursuit cars of Goodall and Stovold running quite close together. That could give an advantage to the pursuing pack behind. Certainly could, and that's going to be worth keeping in mind here. Everybody's searching for pace. Everyone's looking to try and get themselves moving up through the order, and sometimes it might just be a key battleground that we see today. Drivers going to their second driver here, and it does look like it's the same strategy throughout, you would say, at this stage here, Reese. Or actually, I'll go to Lockie with this one. Looks like Pursuit have the same strategy. Second driver goes in first, and our main driver starts to attack later as Emily Jones now finally procures the opportunity to go side by side with the 543 as they go on down oh. door to door on the brakes. Emily Jones. Jones picks the place, but Lockie, the strategy is second drivers go first here when it comes to pursuit. Yeah, and the idea there is by putting the second or the notionally slower of the two drivers in the car first and getting their minimum 34 laps out of the way, any time that they lose on the racetrack, it opens up the possibility of if there's a safety car, that obviously gets you that time back. So it makes sense to put your slower driver in, get their minimum number of laps out of the way and make sure that you've got your faster driver in for the run home. Conversely, the other way that you could do it, as I mentioned a bit earlier in the broadcast, start with your fast driver, get some early track position, put your slower driver in for the middle stint and then put your fast driver in again for the run home. It might mean that you do have a situation a bit later on where you might be vulnerable to losing a bit of track position, but what it does mean is that you will be higher up the order earlier on. And what it also means is that your fast drive doesn't have to do as long as stint at the end, which means that the amount of time that they have to concentrate for is a bit less. So they, there are pros and cons to the different strategic options, but it would seem that for the teams that do have one driver who is a bit weaker than the other one, the preference seems to be to get them out of the way at the start of the race. Dan Midsdale, when he came down into the pits, that was for a drive-through oh. penalty. As there looks Hobson trying to get it done. Contact oh. through the corner. That was a little bit of an argy-bargy moment. Now drops behind Emily Jones just like that. Jamie Stovold, the New Zealander, not afraid to get the elbows out. And Jones again loves that little dive down the inside there uh, at the hair pit. Uh, sorry, at Ravazzo. And uh, just about gets it done again. So uh, another, another lovely little move from Emily Emily Jones, she gets what needs uh, to be done, and Stovall's gone, right, I've had enough, people are overtaking me, I'm coming in for a pit stop. Yeah, all right, so that's um, the, uh, the first pursuit car that we've seen jump into the pits. The, uh, the DPR cars have uh, largely decided to come in early, most of their cars having already made a pit stop there. 
So cars that have made a pit stop, well, Pursuit Sim Racing is in. Trans Tasman 28 is pitted, Richard Hampstead. Daniel Misdale and Darren Lobb are two of the DPR cars that have come in, as well as Neil Pearson. Yeah, and we can see a couple of drivers come in. There's Richard Hampstead, currently 30th place at the moment, having to deal with drivers who have yet to come down in. That's one of the Team Hyperdrive cars uh, going by at that stage. So that will be the Kane Houston entry uh, just making a way through on. So that's going to be key. There's Emily Jones in 11th place. She's now got Brenton Hobson behind. So it's now a reverse battle of those who are of the Twitch streaming variety going through on the brakes up the hill now at Minerale and trying to make more progress now we're on lap 14 here of 102 the good news about going out like this and getting early Reese is the fact that you got fresh rubber you can really go out there and attack and try and undercut your rivals yeah and the added benefit of clear air in front of you if you've come out at the right time because when you're in a pack like we've seen these drivers making their way through uh, most of the time in this race so far. You don't really get the opportunity to drive at your maximum. You've got an awful lot to keep track of. What's the car in front of you doing? What's the car behind you doing? How is my car reacting to the dirty air effects at high speeds? Well, Emily Jones isn't going to have to worry too much about that. She is at the front of this pack and almost now coming through on Ruben Goodall in the 93. Look up the inside then but not advancing far up enough to make the move. And I think Jones very wisely pulling out of that. If she had committed to that, it would have been side contact. It certainly would have done. I've just caught a little eye on the timing tower at the very top. That gap was four seconds about half a lap ago. It's now down to 2.8 race. Yeah, and uh, I think it just goes to show what I was uh, alluding to before. Those pursuit cars are uh, uh, a little bit off pace there at the moment. Of course, one oh, of them has the jumped out of the way. Oh. Oh, well, yes, of course. Um, okay, that's what you're referring to. So I know why that happened as well. It was out of Variante Alta, this corner, on the last lap. Madison Down ran wide and had to take a slowdown penalty. Well, it happens that quickly. They've just had to get by uh, the ANZ Motorsports machine, which is now a lap down after making a stop. But again, look at the pack there. So Hobson's now found a way through on Ruben Goodall, who is getting, uh, the, I think the right word for this one, Reese, is freight train. Yes, very much so. Uh, good all now. Looking back there, Brenton Hobson looking back at the ERT car, the 543. And uh, just up in front of Hobson, we've got the uh, car of Emily Jones, the number 51. Ruben Goodall fighting off the, the advances of Scott Gamble here, who you can see definitely has the pace here in the middle of this stint. And I'm wondering if Goodall's going to bring it into the pits this time round. No, he is not. So uh, electing to stay out on track a little bit longer, give Griffin Gardner a little bit less work to do further on in the race. Yes, and that's the key. There's Jack Boyd as well on the back of this one as well. New team at Synergy. And Lockie, you were having maybe a little look at why there were potentially those changes for Jack Boyd and Damien Johnstone moving away from the Gone Rogue outfit, which effectively now holds only one real driver of note. <laughs> that being Jack Boyd, who's uh, doing a solid job so far in the opening stint of this race. Uh, just a, a bit of another no hold strategy, if I can, as well. So... Another way to attack this race is to divide it up into five even stints to make sure that you split the tyre wear up evenly across your five sets of tyres. And if you're going to go for the even tyre strategy, then you pit every 20 or 21 laps. So for the drivers and teams that are electing to go for that strategy, expect to see them starting to stop fairly soon. Exactly, and that's the key. Now, look at Harley Haber here, has been quietly going about this race, and something that we don't often talk about with Harley Haber is that in this race, it seems, the tyres are working here for Harley. He's normally known as a hard user of the tyres here, is one Mr. Harley Haber Reese, but the key here today is that he's been able to close up to the back of Jake Burton. Yeah, carrying a little bit of damage on his front bumper, as uh, you see as he goes by, but... Haber putting in some good lap times, 43.7 on that one, a 43.5 for Jake Burton, but uh, very calm driving from Harley Haber in, uh, in these opening laps and really taking care 
of that machine, which is a bit of a, a bit of a sight better than what the car was like this time last round at Phillip Island. I'm looking forward to seeing what El Nabi can do once he gets in the car, but Haber and Burton, the battle on track as Kenneth Latter jumps on into the pits. And we're hearing that there might be a replay we have to take a look at, thanks to our mates at Modem Simulation. What happened to Kenneth Latter down at Rivatsa? That was contact oh. almost there. That was the uh, that was the forerunner car running incredibly wide and then contact with the ERT machine. So Sean Linzel bumped out of the way there by Hugh Barter, who tried to take advantage of that. And that was a case of Kenneth Latter tried to bite the bullet, taking the pitch, knowing he was going to lose time anyway. Oh. He can see Soslowski gets it all wrong. He goes straight across. Now, Hugh Bart has got the inside line here, and the door effectively shuts on him. There's not much that Hugh could have done there. Kenneth Latter uh, trying to take a nice line would have been disorientated uh, from what was going on. And then Hugh Barter has that fantastic artwork to go up next to there. As there goes through the tank test RT car, Rob Bowden trying to get that one all sorted out and pretty much does so there so the stewards will have a strong look and there are two race on Oz cars uh, on the back of this train and that's not going to be uh, very easy for them they're going to be trying to work together here to move up through the positions race yeah they will and um, to have three cars in a pack in front of them is not going to help they would prefer I think to uh, be alone on track with each other get the draft down the straight and um, work on trading places and fuel saving. And I think that's the final uh, DPR car to come in for the pit stop. Andrew Dyson brings it in and Dylan Rudd in the 017 brings it in as well. But out onto the start finish straight goes this pack for 21st, 20th on back. Hugh Barter leads up the charge. Bowden and Sislovsky behind him, but Gaining one position thanks to the DPR car jumping into the pits. No moves for now. The cars are a bit too spaced out to see any real battles form. Exactly, and that's going to be really crucial in terms of this one. Lockie, I just want to talk about pit lane time here today at this moment because around Imola, it is a surprisingly slow average speed in the pit. So these drivers are going to have to be incredibly careful, yes? It's a massive pit lane transit time. It's about 35 seconds just to transit pit lane. So that means by the time you do your trip through pit lane, plus you stop to take on fuel and tyres, you are looking at a total pit stop time of generally more than 60 seconds every time you do a pit stop. So a lot longer than it is at some other circuits. Certainly is. We're looking at Ben Christensen right now on the zoom camera call feature that we have here today. He's driving for ANZ Motorsport and he has a nice little look there to the camera. Says hello. Uh, I'm not having the best race possible at this stage. I'm 40th position on my lap down. I'm trying to recover after an early drive through penalty. And that's going to be a real hurt for Christensen here. He is someone right now, Reese, who is banking on safety cars. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, of course, there is the chance that there will be a random safety car during this event. And Christensen and his teammate Kobe Jones, I think, will just be wanting that to come sooner rather than later. They're currently in the middle of that uh, leading pack around Burton for, and, uh, and Haber. There goes Emily Jones bringing the... Oh, 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 Haber, there we go. That's the move there on Jake Burton that we were waiting for. Haber starting to turn up the pace, and I think he might have taken advantage of the lap car of Christensen there. That's what you call using traffic as a pick, and Harley Haber has just masterminded a wonderful, wonderful overtake. The Super 2 driver getting it all right. Look at Jack Boyd's little battle, though, here with Simon Feigl and Scott Gamble out on track. It's the old team against the new team, and then you've got the driver at a new team just behind trying to find a way through and not quite in the right place at the moment to get that one sorted through Piratella, but this is all about now how to get things going. This Aqua Minerale section, though, Reese, is one of the toughest in the world to get right you have to turn and brake at the same time which is something that i've been informed cars don't like yeah these cars at the very least and you've got the very harsh curbs in that section as well looking to unsettle you especially up here at akaminarali they jump over it once again use as much of the runoff area as they can without getting the slowdown penalty it looks like scott gamble at the front of this pack is uh 
certainly doing everything right at the moment, but you see Jack Boyd having a little bit of a look coming into Ravatsa at Simon Feigl through the final corner. Then they go. And it's another good exit from Scott Gamble, but Simon Feigl with a slight slipstream here. He's going to come up on him coming into turn one. If he gets this run going, Gamble moving to the inside and goes defensive. Feigl's going to try round the outside of Tamburello, but it doesn't work a lot of the time. Gamble protects the inside and keeps the position, and this leaves the gap open for Jack Boyd to go round the outside of the exit. No, he's pushed out onto the runoff area, and a little bit of contact between himself and Feigl. Boyd very wisely pulls out of that one. <laughs> Oh, that's lucky. That's so Ooh. lucky. That could have ended in disaster. Both drivers slipping and sliding through the Villeneuve chicane in towards Toza. Some brilliant battling going on. But I do want to talk strategy a bit, Lockie, at this stage. And uh, that strategy talk as Sam Blacklock comes in for the Logitech G Old C Sports car is staying out late. And the key to that, of course, is that drivers may want to take a longer opening stop because if a safety car does come out and you find yourself one lap down here in this event, that's it, you lose the lap, you're on the outside looking in, there's no lucky dog to save you. That's correct, and again, because it is such a long pit lane transit time, if you are a fair distance behind the race later when you come in for your pit stop, there is a chance that you could go down a lap. With that Sam Blacklock car, the Alter Sea Sports car, that's the first driver change we've seen. So Brady Myers out, Sam Blacklock in. Brady Myers has completed 19 laps in that car, so obviously they will have to get back in that old C Sports machine at some stage. They certainly will, and we're going to continue to see some brilliant battling going on. In comes Cooper Webster, though, from second position out on the road. He is followed in by Jake Burton. In comes James Scott into the car then, and Dom Ferraris in for Jake Burton. So both of them down on the lane taking their stop. Now, where is Richard Hampstead in all of this? I think it's the right key as we continue to look at this scrap. Feigl looking down to the inside. Team Boss gonna dive and try and take the place. And no. around the outside, there's contact, but still gets it. Just, only just. Little bit of a tap there from Scott Gamble, who has to go defensive versus Jack Boyd. Has a look into Villeneuve as... Uh, the 088 pulls away James Scott, championship leader before drop rounds into that car. And through goes Jack Boyd attempting on Scott Gamble, but has to pull it up a little bit too much to take real advantage Ooh. on the exit. So Gamble, I'm really impressed with the, with, with the cleanliness of his moves and how he's able to defend against these guys. I mean, he did give Feigl a little bit of a tap, but I think that's fair game. I've just seen that Harley Haber's been given five points worth of penalty by the stewards, and uh, I didn't quite expect to see that one. I didn't think there was anything too untoward with the overtake, so maybe there was something that we didn't see on camera about all of that, though. There is the battle still. Scott Gamble, Jack Boyd, eighth and ninth on the road at the moment, down the inside of Aqua Minerale, and no real arguments about that one. Jack Boyd comfortably picks up that place and gains that one going forward. So... Manson down lead, Ethan Grigg got second, Harley Haber in third, that's how it looks at the moment. Richard Hampstead is in 17th though at the moment, and there's James Scott in 20th. That is a pretty big jump if my eyes do not deceive me here, Reese. Yes, indeed. So Hampstead and Maloney in the box seat once again with that early decision to come into the lane, and there go there's Harley Haber in the pits. Um, is that the second time we've seen him in there, or is that the first time he's come first. in? First, first time he's come in. Righto. Thank you very much, Lockie. So, that's going to be early stint there for the United Esports squad. Sam Blacklock down in 25th position. He's pitted just a couple of laps ago and up against Darren Lobb, who is another car who has just made their first stop a few laps back. Exactly, there you can see the H-pattern shifter uh, there, or the sequential shifter right now. Everybody going on through and trying to get through, so a sequential shifter looks very much like how a supercar would. A lot of people like using the flappy paddles on the back of their steering wheels to get themselves going forward. And there, actually just coming out of the pits, I do believe, uh, was one of the Pursuit Sim Racing cars that looks like 
Uh, that was potentially going to be Andrew Gilliam and co. Uh, there coming out of the pits. There, uh, just leaving pit lane right now, is one of those uh, vehicles. And there is Michael Talianchik there for pursuit now, uh, who is behind a lot of drivers he wouldn't have been expecting to be behind. Yes, indeed. So, first time that car's come into the pits. Talianchik back out now on the circuit. Ethan Griggolt, who has now made his way up to second in the midst of all of the changes and uh, and the drivers pitting around him with Hobson now into third driving with Glenn Postlethwaite and they bring that synergy car into the pits so it's looking like uh, they're looking to split the race into three from this point on Jack Boyd staying out for one of the longest times in this field makes his way up into third Oh, that's a late call down onto the pits for Justin Wallace. He went full Tony Hawk mode uh, on there, that one on the grind. He could have been jet set and radio at that stage if he wasn't too careful uh, to taking that call to get onto the lane. There is Slosky going on forward here at the moment, trying to go as long as possible. Now, what's the maximum fuel range, Lockie, for drivers to get themselves uh, around on a tank of fuel? Because I think we might be getting somewhere close to that vicinity. We estimate that the fuel range for this race is 27 laps, but if you cast your mind back to Fuel of Ireland, we saw that uh, if drivers play it a bit conservatively, then uh, the fuel range is more an advisory number, and we have seen that drivers have been able to go a bit further on a tank than what we have sometimes predicted. We certainly have seen that, and well, at the moment we are on lap 23 of this event. Madison down in control of this one at the front. Scott's has lost the, though, in the forerunner car. Has had a few moments. We had a non-finish last time out at Phillip Island along Ooh, here the we great go. neck. That didn't quite uh, work out, so uh, trying to continue on forward, trying to find more places in this battle, 6th and 7th on the road. But there is Andrew Dyson in the Simrix.com DPR car trying to find a way through a Michael Taliach. It's this one for position on the road here, Reese. Yes, it is. Both of these guys have pitted, and uh, the 117 ERT machine is now into the pits as well. Pulls off, and it uh, looks like that's going to be a driver change. Jordan Caruso jumps into the 117, but Andrew Dyson, once again, in hot pursuit of the pursuit car of Michael Taliansic. This, uh, this opening stint, I think, might not have gone the way that, uh, that Gilliam and Taliansic would have wanted, They've made that they started incredibly well in that second position, but uh, fallen quite a ways back. A safety car is definitely going to help them along with Andrew Gilliam's out and out pace. Well, it's all about holding on because there is, of course, Lockie, that minimum driver requirement time. And driver change coming up for the 117 car here as well. So Ethan Grigolt out, Jordan Caruso in. So I would suggest that they're going for that strategy where they put Caruso in for the middle stage of the race, and then Ethan Grigolt will get back in for the run home. Ian Bird diving down into the pits. Andrew Mogridge also down in on pit lane then on lap 24 of this event, both of whom will be looking for a pretty nice stop of things as Rob Bowden here in the tank SRT machine is going to have to play the defensive pact here at this stage to keep Scott Zoslowski behind. It's about four tenths of a second in leader in the pits. Corner. And in comes the race leader, Madison Downs, to try and make that stop. And you can see how agonizingly slow it is looking down for the lane because Madison's got to go all the way to the very end of this one right now here, Reese. And uh, it's a very, very slow trundle. Absolutely is. Pit speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour and Madison uh, dipping between 59 and 60 in terms of the speed and in he comes staying in the car it seems dane warren not making an appearance just yet it's good strategy i think to uh, give dane warren a bit of a rest so that he can jump in in the second half of the race and really put in the hard yards to try and extend that lead gap but interestingly jack boyd in the synergy number 58 staying out once again they're going Absolutely. super long. Chris Coxhead as well staying out. Uh, Hayden Veld staying out as well. So they're going for the long call. Rob Bowden's still out there on track at this stage. But it does look like Szlowski has dived down into the pits potentially. Hamstead takes the net race lead. And now this is a very interesting dynamic. We know that the Trans-Tasman cars do like a battle, do like a scrap. 
but we know that Madsen down last time out got involved in a little bit of an argy-bargy scrap moment race, which cost him the championship, uh, sorry, cost him the race win and some crucial championship points. Could have been a lot bigger of a gap than 52 points at the top with two drops. Yeah, certainly could have. So uh, Madison's going to have to be careful here uh, on these uh, fresh tyres. Richard Hampstead, of course, only pitting around about lap 10. So obviously Madison down stopped for a longer amount of time. A little bit more fuel in the car and a bit more time lost there due to more time spent on the used tyres. But taking a look once again at Michael Taliancic, who is certainly not leaving Darren Lobb alone. I think Taliancic just needed to get into a rhythm out of the stop. Now that the tyres are up to temperature, he's really pressuring Darren. He absolutely is. The Simrigs.com DPR car under pressure from the track racer Pursuit Sim Racing Machine just behind as they go on through into Aqua Minerale and up the hill they will try and rise once again looking to try and find that pace, looking to try and find that run that is so very, very needed here as they now look towards that Variante Alta chicane here through the rights and lefts up and over the curves as a few little changes as uh, Damien Johnstone dives in with Jack Boyd uh, into the pits and that should be almost everybody in. Rob Bowden staying out for a 26th lap then and we'll get some nice camera time up at the front of the field leading this one only for a couple of seconds though because Michael Taliancic is still trying to find a play. That he is, and he'll potentially get a slipstream here on Darren Lobb, put a move into turn one. Damien Johnston has taken over from Jack Boyd in the number 58. As these guys pass on by, that car is still stationary. Just flitted over the top of the screen there. Now the slipstream for Michael Taliancic. The door opens on the inside from Darren Lobb. They go through the kink, and Taliancic is through before they even get to the turn in point. Nicely done easily done as well and that was a crucial crucial uh, little overtake there going on forward now i am very curious to see Lockie, if you have anything on lane times who has been the best when it's come to the lane we know we got maybe one maybe two drivers who have yet to come down in who's been the worst as we see battling on screen yeah so out of the runners who are in the top 10 at the moment the driver or the team that's had the shortest combined pit lane transit and stop time the Richard Hampstead Jake Maloney car, which was in pit lane for a total of 53 seconds. Of course, you will remember they stopped a lot earlier than their rivals. So the fuel time to return the full tank to full, the fuel tank to full would have been a lot shorter than everybody else. So they gained around 11 or 12 seconds on most of their key rivals in that first round of pit stop. So this is a similar strategy, like we said, to uh, what they executed at Phillip Island and what it means was that uh, that car will now be able to run around in clear track without being involved in any battles. So Hampstead and Maloney, I think the strategy that works so well for them at Phillip Island, they'll be able to enjoy similar success with it here at Imola. Madsen down sets the fastest lap of the race as Ben Christensen had to sneak through a good friend of his, Sean Linsell, uh, out on track. So that was very, very narrow and tight. Oh. And exit stage left for an ERT car. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. That's Luke Pink in the number 13, and he'll have gotten a slowdown penalty thanks to that. And very awkward spot for it to happen too, because the uh, race on Oscar trying to make its way through on him as well, but it looks like Pink just uh, managing to stay ahead and pressure the Zuva racing car just up ahead. Looking forward to seeing what can happen down here at the Ravazza Corners. Looks like Luke Pink not able to find a way up the inside, but once again, we're seeing a big train down in the uh, the lower midfield. Liam Wilde is now in the 208, having taken over from Chris Coxhead. It's then Luke Pink, Tyler Blackburn, Matthew Deer, and Blake Neck taking over the Forerunner Motorsports car. Have a look at the run here from Luke Pink. Liam Wilde almost went defensive there, but Luke Pink just too fast and goes on. And, well, yeah, yeah, way too fast. To, for Tamburello. Gives the position right back. This is going to make things a bit awkward into Villeneuve. 
It certainly is, and that'll be the KRF cars as well, trying to find a way through. Here's Tyler Blackburn down the inside, and oh, that's Brave trying to get to the inside, turns to the outside there for the KRF machine, oh. so that one doesn't quite work out. Pink's going to come straight back around the outside of Toza. In comes Rob Bowden on lap 27, then to make the stop, but here's some too wide, too deep action going on through. I think Pink's got the best run here. They're going to switch the beams as they go on through. That's the most dangerous of all the actions that you can take on a track to cross the beams, but they will survive. Only just, and I thought it was tempting to make a move into Piratella there, but I think Luke Pink backing out of it, thinking not worth it, and I'd probably agree with him given those circumstances, but he does have another chance here at the end of this lap. You can see that he is getting excellent exits compared to Tyler Blackburn. Those rear tyres of the ERT number 13 holding up incredibly well. Tyler Blackburn going a little bit harder into Variante Alta, which translates into a bit of a better run down the straight, though. So I think Luke Pink has lost his chance for now. For now, but there will be more chances on the horizon. We're only on lap 28 here of 102, so there's a lot more time on the horizon to go here as they think about things. In comes Craig and Spatch, or out comes Craig and Spatch in the tank SRT machine, looking to try and get out and going and should be filtering out somewhere near the here because that's Ben Christensen diving down the inside of uh, the uh, Yordi Sinai entry right now. It's Scott Nolan behind the wheel and uh, that's a nice one for Ben Christensen. This is what's known as a recovery drive right now from the green and white entry. It's not often that you see green and white on the car but they are doing a great job as that's a little look behind the Feigl and Preston right now. That was I believe Ruben Goodall under pressure from Benjamin Smith here fighting for the top 10 so all of these drivers right now looking at maybe trying to capitalize on safety car protocol if it does come out right now Reese. yeah exactly if a safety car were to come out now it would certainly help them quite a bit but benjamin smith on the back of goodall you can see that he is being held up slightly here could it be a move at variante alta simon feigl has a bit of a look here at corey preston who's done very well to uh, have a recovery drive himself back up into 18th position after that spin on lap one. And that is a change for position there. The ERT car threw at Variante Alta on the Pursuit 93. Feigl, meanwhile, still looking for a move on Preston, but he knows that that far back at Ravazza just does not work. What about into Tamburello then, the second corner of the racetrack? We've seen some great moves from Simon Feigl in this Mustang into this corner so far is it going to be a repeat on board with Corey Preston you can see he's got a clear track in front of him but Feigl with the momentum up the inside they reach the breaking point and Feigl just slipping through before the turn in point and Preston lets him go has to no choice about that one as they go on through that's all very nice and dandy between them now i want to focus on the race lead for a little bit here reese because look at how that gap has slowly been whittled down oh, from yeah. the hamstead maloney team to the down warren team it's now 1.2 seconds yeah madison down really putting in the hard yards pace wise to catch back up to his teammate the gap now uh, 1.2 seconds between them. Hampstead has just been keeping it nice and calm since that early pit stop, keeping the times nice and consistent. Let's compare times as they come across the line. 43.509 from Richard Hampstead from Madison down to 43.359. So that car with much fresher tires has the pace advantage right now. Question is, how much do you want to battle when he eventually does catch up? I mean, we saw what happened at Virginia International Raceway a couple rounds ago. We certainly did, and that was a titanic scrap between those two out on the circuit, and they'll be hoping to find maybe something very similar here in terms of, or oh, sorry, something more uh, easier, I think is the right stage. They're on two different strategies right now. Here is Richard Hampstead and Madison Down. And of course, you have to remember that rivalry they used to have. Of course, Richard Hampstead uh, used to be part of the old TTL team that was absolutely fantastic back in the day. And it was almost the unthinkable that those two would join the same team at a point in time. Now they are part of the same team, and it's almost like, okay, we're friends, but we're, we're almost teammates friends not not friend friends oh well i think i think madison down and richard hamstead have been friend friends for a while now ttr and ttl were very close to each other and once 
the uh, the grand old orange team were for a time the oldest team in Australian sim racing folding we're hearing that TTL though is back according to Jay Kennedy a hundred percent is back the original members are restarting the team so uh, I think uh, I think it'll be an interesting second era then for TTL esports now that uh, now that Richard Hamstead Jake Maloney and the like are, are now down at Trans Tasman Racing It'll be a long time before we see TTL at the same sorts of heights as they used to be, but you never know. There's always time. There's always that ability and that, uh, uh, that I would say, tradition uh, can definitely be a big pulling power in terms of how this race uh, is going to go. We're looking here on Benjamin Smith and the Evolution Racing Team 543 machine. Now, they had a really, really good story to run, Lockie, last time out at what was Phillip Island. Are they in a position right now, strategically, to do something similar? Well, at Field of Highland, what we saw was that they stayed out under the last safety car when everybody else came in. So we saw that Ben Smith was able to lead a number of laps of that race. And uh, in the end, he and Scott Campbell came home just outside the top 10. Uh, we saw that Scott Gamble was one of the drivers who elected to exit the car uh, during the first pit stop. So... He got out after 21 laps. So at some point, Scott Gamble will have to get back into the car. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I'll come, you can come back to me because we've just had some contact on the track. We have. It was Clint mm. Shane Smith just about surviving contact with Job Stewart. I think that would be what would be called in the business a, uh, a redress there, not deciding to take the place away. You can see he hits the brakes, hits the brakes, hits the brakes, just couldn't slow it up. And there's the little bit of contact. Clint Shane Smith uh, effectively has to take the rally route there at Tamburello Reese. Yeah, and uh, jumping on the brakes a bit to clear the slowdown, but Job Stewart remaining behind to redress the position. You could see that he was trying his best to get out of the uh, the way of Clint Smith there, but a little bit too late on the brakes at Tamburello. Once the front tyres are loaded up, there isn't much you can do, and Benjamin Smith has gotten by Corey Preston for 19th place. Just to so complete the point that I was going to make on that car as well, guys, so... Seeing as it is Scott Gamble's last race, I reckon that they'll be working to a strategy that will see Scott Gamble be in the car for the finish. Yep, that definitely Good does point. seem right. So we will uh, keep an eye on that and see how Scott Gamble is going to go. Gap, though, between your leaders, four tenths of a second. Now, how easy is Richard Hampstead going to make this? He knows he's on a different strategy to Madison down here. There's no team orders at Trans Tasman, but by no means is Richard Hampstead going to roll over like, say, a, a, a six-year-old dog and say that it's going to be a very easy give me belly rubs. It's not going to be like that, Reese. It's going to be hard fought for. Yeah, no team orders at Trans Tasman Racing. That is their policy. Of course, in these endurance events, team orders does have a, a, a more of a place than in out-and-out -out sprints, but Hampstead and Down, no strangers to each other on the track. They've been racing each other for well over 10 years now, and uh, they have a lot of experience in these high-octane racing situations. But Down, it seems, just keeping it consistent behind Hampstead, not going too much, uh, too much in terms of pushing hard, but out onto the straight once more. He has potential for a draft, maybe, to save a couple milliliters of fuel. Dominic Ferraris and Sam Blacklock now together on track. Blacklock, remember, one of the earlier cars to pit, now up into seventh on the circuit at the moment. And Dominic Ferraris making a very good case for himself in the VRS Prologue React car. Absolutely. And, well, this is a good run at the moment from Dom Ferraris. He's not lost too much time to rivals he was racing against. But Sam Blacklock, uh, you can see Stoic, poised, looking to try and close that gap down as much as possible here as they hit the brakes and go through the left right left here of Tamarello chicane and now start to think about what's next up on the horizon in terms of this battle sam blacklock has just been quietly going about business and to be only five seconds off the likes of jordan caruso and harley haber you'd say that's good progress 
Speaking of Jordan Caruso and Harley Haber, they've been together on track for quite some time, just up ahead of these guys. Caruso starting to gap Haber in the last couple of laps, though, so that car really coming on song. Harley Haber with uh, a time three hundredths of a second slower last time around. And Blacklock, you can see, working very hard against Dominic Ferraris. That car number 33, the blue and black, is now in the same position that it started in. Meanwhile, the Altus Esports car started in 13th place and is now in 7th. So they've already gotten their race off to a great start. Hopefully they can maintain that momentum. Hopefully they can. Again, half a second here and a little bit of a wide line from Richard Hamster coming off of the final Ravaxa corner and making that push over towards that start-finish line once again to lap 34. They approach here of 102 and that effectively signals uh, the point that we are one third of the way through this race at the end of this next lap so uh, for the first third this has been a uh, I would say a more tame affair than Phillip Island it hasn't been as crazy it hasn't been as uh, aggressive I think but these two it's going to be a case of Madsen wants to make a perfect move. He's got to try and work out when's the right time to strike not when to strike but the right time to strike at this stage Reese. Yes, and remember, he is fighting against Richard Hampstead, who has made a name for himself as one of the staunchest defenders in Australian sim racing. In comes the 47 again. Kurt Stenberg brings it in. But Madison down, hanging back once again behind Richard Hampstead. Hammer certainly knows where to put his car when there is someone pursuing him. But still no move for now. Madison Down is going to have to time this incredibly well if he has any desire of getting past. Well, he's got to just think about it here in logical terms because surely with that indication there, um, Lockie, that uh, one of the Trans-Tasman cars has come in, surely the call will be coming pretty soon for uh, Richard Hampstead to hand the car over to Jake Maloney. Well, he's only got another roughly three laps of fuel left as well, Richard Hampstead, because... Uh, He's been out on the track now for 24 laps. And remember, the rough fuel range of these cars was 27 laps. And uh, the other thing here is that we are, we've just ticked over lap number 34. So the drivers who have started the race and stayed in the cars have now completed their minimum number of laps. So any time from now, they can get out of their cars, hand over to the second driver for the run home. They certainly can here, and Reese. I think Madison Downs trying to play this one quite cleverly here. Knows that he's running same time, similar times to that of James Scott behind in the 088. So in terms of racing, he's technically racing with Richard Hampstead, but technically not, because at the moment he knows that there's going to have to be some longer stops on the horizon here for uh, Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney, which will shuffle them back into position. Yeah, exactly. And the, the the question from Down's perspective as the pursuing driver is, do I just hang back, save a bit of fuel, make sure that, uh, that for my car, our next couple of pit stops are a bit shorter, or do I try and get past Hampstead as quickly as possible as they uh, are let through by their teammate Stenberg? And, oh, that's interesting. I've just noticed Stenberg's engine is pretty much silent. Has he blown the engine at some point earlier on that lap? He was very slow coming out of the pits. Oh, he maybe hasn't fueled the car up properly at all. This is not ideal. Through goes the hyperdrive car. Yeah. Uh, Stenberg is limping around this place. And I think we'll be limping back to pits. That could be something technical. It could be something hardware related. It could be something car related. We don't really know what's going on here with car number 47 out on track. And this is not quite ideal here in terms of coasting down the hill, trying to get the car to get some speed again and get going once more. So how is this one all playing out? Is being caught at a rate of knots and we'll dive straight back into the pits once more. Well, that's a big shame for Kurt Stenberg and Lee Ellis. They um, were, were pretty consistent in the midfield before this point and they're going to go all the way back to uh, 38th position as a result of this. They've, uh, I th it looks like they're going to be passed as well by their sister car of Emily Jones and Andrew Fraser. They've suffered their own issues and they're a lap down. And uh, 
It looks like uh, it was Hampstead. the case for the 47. That Oh, yes. There we go. Hampstead defending now against Madison Down. Behind? Oh, no. Behind, yes. Behind. Position changed. At toes up. It was already looking like it. Down the inside. And there's not much Hammer could do about that one. Stuck on the outside. That was well scouted there from Madison Down. He gave himself a few laps to have a little look at it. And, well, Richard Hampstead now, if that's not a sign of come down onto the lane, you're a little bit further back. I don't know what is. They're going to head themselves up into the Variante Alta. A few takers onto the lane at the moment here. One of them is the 707 car. Tom Freer now gets behind the wheel here. Ruben Goodall's going to go and make the change as well. And it seems like all the pursuit drivers want to try and get their strategy all playing out nicely with a nice neat bow. We are firmly now into that stage here, Lockie, where second stage pit stops are in full flow at this stage, and Hampstead stays out. And driver changes happening as well. So, like you mentioned, Tom Freer behind the wheel of car 707, and Griffin Gardner, who's been a bit of a star in terms of his speed in pre-qualifying and qualifying, relieves Ruben Goodall behind the wheel of car number 93. Exactly. Here's the battle, sixth and seventh position on the road. Don Ferraris here dealing with Sam Blacklock here as they go on to the front stretch. Blacklock taking that slipstream, that draft, that toe going on forward. And at the moment, it's a case of which way do you go? Down to the inside. We're not going to have many arguments about that one. That is a comfortable move from Sam Blacklock to jump up through the order and to gain the place that is so very, very needed to make that one happen. So it's worked out quite nicely there in terms of that little move as in comes Darren Lobb as well. He'll hand the car over to Philip Wally here, uh, race to move on forward and look for more time here on lap 37. Lucky. Yeah, so another pit stop coming up there. So Darren Lobb's minimum requirement has been uh, has been fulfilled. So feel warmly into that car, and I reckon expect the number 28 Trans Tasman Racing Commodore of Richard Hampstead into the pits any tick of the clock as well, because that car will be just about out of fuel. This is a 20. This will have been 27 laps that uh, Richard Hampstead will have spent on the track so in fact he's coming up to the pit entry now do we see that car diving for the pits yes we do so richard Hampstead hmm. coming on in and be interesting to see here whether he stays behind the wheel of this car or he heads over hands over to jake maloney because they've now got themselves into a position where they've got options Hampstead can get out maloney can run from here to the finish or Hampstead can get back into the car a bit later on if he so desires well, he's going to try and make sure that he gets himself uh, moving forward as much as he possibly can. And Reed, I, I hear that you're back. And yes. I hear, I hear Harley Haber is approaching the back of Jordan Caruso. I also see that Jake Maloney is taking over from Richard Hampstead in the number 28. But yes, you can see that Caruso and Haber well and truly together here. And Haber advancing massively on Jordan Caruso. He's piling it into every braking zone, trying to get the best out of this car. And see, this is where Haber's magic really works because you, you describe him as a driver who is hard on his tires, but here in the early stages of a stint, he can take advantage of that. He can use the fresh rubber to try and get his way past a rival and get that car into some clear air, help their track position out for later pit stops. Exactly, but here's the key, stuck behind Jordan Caruso, if you want to make the move, you've got to play well here and get that one happening. The good news for that 21 is fuel is out and away, goes Jake Maloney into 18th place, drops in just behind Ben Christensen uh, out on track, so uh, that is going to be where the ANZ car is in comparison to that, so we'll keep an eye on that one going forward as uh, there is going to be more on the horizon, but look at that gap, it's only two tenths of a second, down the hill they descend, into the Ravazza corner and now it's about power on the exit get as much as you can hopefully get a run here in towards turn number one and two out on circuit neither of whom come down onto the lane this now becomes a case of we're having a full-on scrap yep full-on scrap in the draft as well Haber gaining a lot of momentum now on Caruso but Caruso 
Very wily there, stays in the middle of the circuit and prohibits Haber from getting up alongside him into the breaking zone. So he's playing this game very well at the moment. It's very much like Reese having a, a case of going on, say, a freeway or a motorway or anything like that and having two truckers trying to overtake everyone driving in the middle of the road. Oh, God, I hate that. And whoa, that is a big, huge slide from Haber. Just dipped the wheel off in the runoff area. Very tempting to use all of the runoff area off the exit of Villeneuve, but of course there is gravel waiting for you right there. Uh, it hasn't really hurt his pace versus Caruso though. Got an excellent exit from Tosa and uh, piling hard now into Piratella as well. But once again, that 117, it seems like uh, throttle application is its big strength, which is good around a track like this. Imola really highlights the slow in, fast out approach. You want to try and uh, maximize your throttle application, maximize your exit, because there's a lot of straights linking these corners. Through Variante Alta then, on the bumper, Harley Haber barely keeping it together there over the bumps and down to Ravazza once again. He's still too far back for an outbreaking maneuver. He's got to be careful here as Harley Haber. He's already had five points of penalty applied to his uh, license points. He can't afford too many more, otherwise he may be missing the great sim race. But at the moment, again, Ravazza seems to be the place where the 117 seems to shine in terms of this battle. We have just seen the 72 car dive down onto the lane uh, recently as one of the race on Oz cars is coming out of the pits are lapped down at this stage as well. But in towards turn number one and two again, and once more, it's nothing for Harley Haver. He's good in the midsection of the track, but he can't get anything done here on the place where overtakes become most frequent. Gets a good run, though. Coming out to the exit, he may have a little lob down here at turn number four, five here at Villeneuve. Maybe even Toza, a lot of drivers have been loving uh, having oh. that sent to the inside, but that's the big wide defense line Ooh. taken there and there's contact on turn in there from Harley Haver. He is unsettled as in comes Mike Talianchich here locking. Yeah, and I would expect that, uh, obviously, with his minimum number of laps out of the way, he'll hand over to Andrew Gilliam. Indeed, he does. So, Gilliam's right now to drive that pursuit sim racing car to the chequered flag. He certainly is. You've caught me with my drink there, half uh, still being drunk at this stage. But no matter, no foul. We'll continue on. And continuing on at this stage is one Mr. Harley Haber trying to find that move on Jordan Caruso. And these two effectively you could say here reese are the next generation yeah i'd agree you know they're they're both very young guys both active in uh, the real life motorsports sphere and uh, both of them um having the effort put behind them by big teams to try and get their way up the grid and secure their place for another generation of sim racers. But sim racing is a bit different to real life motorsport in that sense, as we just saw Haber getting a little bit squirrely out of Ravazza again. That car is really not comfortable on the corner exits. But in sim racing, there is a much wider age range for success. It's not like in real life motorsport at the top level where once you're, once you're in your 40s, you're basically considered done. Here in sim racing, you can be competitive for many decades. Absolutely you can and of course no better have we seen that as we've got Dylan Rudd trying to hold off Brenton Hobson right now than with one legendary Finnish driver in Gregor Hutu who's still going and he's been a starlet for 20 years as now Don Ferraris dives down into the lane for the 33 team. And here comes Hobbo on the back of the racecraft Mustang and looks like this is going to be a fairly simple move on the 017 through just before the braking zone. Nicely done from Hobbo 88. Hold your breath here, Reese, because Brenton Hobson is about five seconds off of sixth place. Oh, here we go. And Clint Smith is the one in front of him there in the Premier Racing Team machine. Clint Smith, incidentally, we're just hearing, is going to be one of the next cars to pit as well. He's coming up to the end of his current stint. So the meme is still alive. Brenton Hobson is going to occupy sixth spot. He certainly is. It's not going to be necessarily a finish at this stage, but we'll soon find out. We're on lap 41 of 102 at this stage at the moment. And still, it is Madison Down who leads this one uh, with his teammate Dane Warren yet to come into the car. James Scott, 7.2 seconds back at the moment, just quietly getting along with business. Has actually closed down ever so slightly Madison Down over this stint. So it has been working out 
in favour at the moment and there's a lot riding on these endurance events there's the endurance cup of course which uh, does a lot of wonders as again Harley Haber closing in he's almost half out of the draft here trying Whoa. to lunge to the inside to try and find that move Lock as up. he hit it on the brakes he's just about slowed it up I thought the engine may have been going but that's just how much smoke was coming out of the tyres there as he's got the move done but Caruso's having none of it he might want to come back here at Villeneuve and find another run nope that's not possible but lucky the whole point is that this team dynamic, it brings in the championship perspective as well. It does, and that's one of the great things about the Endurance Cup, which, uh, of course, is only open to two drivers who stay together for all three rounds of the Endurance Cup. A couple more pit stops happening as well. Job Stewart and Clint Shane Smith both coming into the pits as uh, Brenton Hobson moves up into position five. Oh, that, that's not fun. That's yeah. not a meme. That's a slide, though. So uh, that's going to bring uh, Dylan Rudd back into play. Uh, had found a way through on lapped traffic there in the form of Kobe Jones, I do believe, that is now behind the wheel in 37th place, having made a stop. Yes, it is. So that's not ideal. And uh, there's one of the Synergy cars diving down the inside. That's Jordi Sinai, and he's fighting for position here with Kobe Jones here on the outside. Remember, Kobe qualified the car, and Jordi has effectively just caught him napping there. Absolutely what? Wonderfully there. So, Kobe, uh, wake up, sunshine. You're going to have to find some moves. Yeah, going to have to because uh, Dylan right up there, uh, just up ahead of him now, having made his way past. Uh, they were thinking, we were thinking about the number nine and how uh, they're making their recovery drive. He's still fighting with right out there on track, but Dominic Ferraris has uh, made another pit stop and has come out in 15th just ahead of Matthew Deere. And there we go. Madison down back in the pit lane and James Scott as well. Dane Warren, Warren jumping in the 77. Here we go. It's business now as they go on through. So this becomes an interesting point of contention here in terms of this race. Closest rival here, Lockie, to... The 77 was the 088 in terms of uh, same strategy pace. So how is this going to play out in terms of this one, the fact they pit on the same lap? Well, they're mirroring each other's strategies, but the other thing that's going to be interesting here is to see where they come out relative to the other cars that have already taken their second pit stop, in particular the number 28 car, which now has Jake Maloney on board. Of course, the Maloney and Hampstead car slightly out of sequence, but again, I reckon that they're probably going to rise to the top of the order once this second round of pit stops plays out. Well, now it means Harley Haber leads this one as our timing tries to update itself. There is Dane Warren. There is in the background there. The car trying to go through. That's James Scott in ninth. That's where the 38, uh, the uh, 28 car, sorry, uh, lies itself. Jake Maloney there in eighth position. And that's really crucial because we saw that overtake happen. It's effectively even keel stops throughout at this stage. We won't see that all come out until the end. But what was very key about that stop, Lockie, if you had a look, is Daniel Ackland here. Uh, oh, himself. no. Oh, moment. Big slide saves it. Adam oh. Briggs has got to try and pick his way through it as they go on through. Point I was going to try and make there is that Adam Briggs goes around the outside and uh, Daniel Ackland's going to lose one out to uh, Kurt Stenberg here, I do believe that is, who's a lap down at this stage. And uh -oh. the Alex, who's gone uh -oh. straight on almost there at the next corner, is that James Scott and co have really gained time in that stop. They have, because they've closed right up onto the back of the... Maloney and Hampstead car but uh, keep in mind that Maloney and Hampstead their second pit stop would have had to be a bit longer because their first pit stop because it was so early was very short so yes by pitting early they got themselves some clear track they were able to punch out some fast laps Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney but it all balances out as the race progresses because they do have to take longer pit stops than their rivals a bit later on so it's just starting to even itself out in terms of strategy what you would have to say, though, right now is that the uh, number 77 trans Tasman Commodore is looking to be in a very strong position when you think about the overall strategic picture of this motor race. They've worked their way back into the effective race lane. They've got pace to burn, and Dane Warren can now that drive that car all the way through to the end. And that's going to be crucial then as they go on through. If Dane Warren's behind the wheel, everyone's going to be worried. Glenn Postlethwaite jumps in behind the 88 taking over from 
Brenton Hobson as Adam Briggs finds himself a race on Oscar to fight with. This is Andrew Mogridge just in front and this should be plain sailing here. Looking to the inside, takes the curb nicely. Wide line taken by the race on Oz machine. And uh, that one is comfortably no. done. No, it's not. Straight on you go, Adam Briggs. Just got caught a little bit too deep. Takes the slowdown and goodbye place. Yeah, just for now anyway. A couple of marbles, I think, on the inside. Of course, less grip because it's off the ideal line into the turn. So Briggsy there pushing a little bit too hard and falling back into the clutches of Stenberg, who is, uh, of course, uh, a bit out of position there. But I got to say, uh, for James Scott in the Altus Esports 088, having uh, just made his way past Jake Maloney, on that particular run that's going to be crucial for Altus's strategy yeah. because uh when uh, with with the 77 out in front with Dane Warren that number 28 getting put out in front of the Altus car would have held them up slightly and that would all, overall help Trans Tasman Forza El Nabi then in the pitch Jordan Caruso in the pits that is a driver change for the 21 United cars now that puts Benjamin Smith and Scott Gamble at the top Simon Feigl Zach Hanley into seventh uh, second sorry uh, Damian Johnstone and Jack Boyd into third now Quick Jordan stop. Caruso they've got a great stop Day Warren just sets the fastest lap of the race mind you in the meantime just casually as he goes on through as uh, Jake Maloney here has actually lost the place now here uh, to James Scott so they have uh, changed about positions but crucially that ERT car didn't seem like it was a million miles away no no it did not and uh just come out behind sam blacklock in oh, the wow. 215 right on the bumper so this is not what jordan caruso would have wanted a car right in front of him out of the pits he's gonna have to do a bit of extra work here to try and get past sam but he leaves the door open at tosa and a little bit of a look from caruso Blacklock turns in anyway, and almost a bit of contact. Tiny slide. Caruso forced up onto the curb at Tosa. He's going to have to wait a couple more corners to get this done, I think. I think he is, and I think that he wasn't expecting to have that fight. Now, what's the face of pressure look like here from Sam Blacklock? It looks exactly the same, is the right answer here. Trying to just negotiate his way through. You can see here the lights almost going up on his white shirt that he's got going on his team colors right now from where he's shifting and he's seeing the red lights on his wheel uh, they're giving him all the advance that he needs uh, to see everything going on but you can see he's just nicely calmly going through the process going through the motions and in fact he'll be gaining time there because that's a oh. slow penalty it is too. Slow down penalty for Jordan Caruso, and that allows Forzan El Nabi by for position as well. That's something that the 117 will not want. That's a big disadvantage. Uh, one extra position, and they they basically lost the position that they gained in the pit stop. Exactly. That's how easy it can go away, and that's why you find yourself with the changes, the turns, everything that does go on here in terms of how you battle is absolutely fantastic there is your race leader right now benjamin smith here in the ert 543 machine due to come in and make a stop right now but everything is going on just in front that is kobe jones still fighting out with yordi sinai it seems uh, at this stage but benjamin smith 4.6 seconds clear of the feigl handling team and very much a case of same as it was last time get some time out in front use all of the fuel that's available and try and have the biggest splash and dash towards the end because that short lane time come the end of this one is going to be so so critical here Lockie. It is, and if you can engineer yourself into a situation where you've got a nice short final pit stop, particularly if we end up with the failed compression with the safety car at some point, and it will stand you in very good stead heading into the final stint. But uh, the Sam Blacklock, Brady Myers, Ulta Sea Sports entry, they've managed to engineer their way into a pretty good position. After the, that first couple of pit stops, They've actually jumped ahead of both Caruso and El Narvi. So the 215 Alta Sea Sports car, not in a bad strategic spot at the moment. No, not at all. And they've done a very good job to get themselves exactly where they need to over the course of this race so far. So 
No real harm, no real foul. It seems like Sam Blacklock is doing exactly what he needs to at this stage as we uh, take a little focus on one pitter coming in. That's Damien Johnstone in the Synergy Sim Racing. JK Signs Racing 58 at the moment, having a very good uh, run of things. Now, what I find very, very interesting about that team is they've decided to have the R stand for racing and they put racing at the end here, Reese. It's almost like overkill. Yeah, Department of Redundancy Department, it seems, as we see Luke Pink having to defend now against the Altus Esports car of Sam Blacklock. He goes through at Tamburello, and Forzan El Nabi is putting the pressure on now behind, and I think Luke Pink will want to help out his teammate in the 117. We'll get a quick replay here of what happened to Luke down at Rivazza. Looks gonna have to look at the sideways action jay is telling us did he get up over the curb on the exit nah just throttle application winding on the opposite lock out of the final corner and that's what allowed black lock to get through opposite lock looks very impressive but here's a case where the 117 car will not want to be held up here by luke pink going through piratella corner and just opening it up no we're not gonna have an argument here you're quicker than me and that is matthew Ooh. deer going slow coming up the hill so what's happened there for the krfi candy car uh running into a few troubles so we'll look through the villeneuve chicane that will all be fine but Tozer, of course, is a deceptively difficult corner, Reese. As you go on through it, he'll head to Tozer. He's okay for the moment as he goes through the left-hand bend in the 116 car. Oh. Does the back just go around it? Does it transfers from what is going downhill to uphill? Yeah, and did well to keep it out of the wall there. That's what happens with these locked rear axles. If you uh, if you lock a rear tire, that means that both rear tires lock and that sends the car into a slide that is very hard to recover from. But you need the brake bias to be a bit further towards the rear to get the car turned into those tight hairpins. So now the battle resumes between El Nabi and Blacklock down the front straight and El Nabi brief look towards the inside as we saw the other ERT car into the pits. Blacklock it seems not quite getting the pace that he needs because El Nabi is right on the back of him now and could go for a move into Villeneuve. Has a bit of a look but has to back out and this is really helping Jordan Caruso to stay in touch with the 21. Absolutely. Here, here we go. El Nabi dives down the inside at Toza. It's a place where you can easily get it done. Blacklock's got to get back on the racing line quickly here he gets a good run up the hill just about pulls up in behind and he's doing a good enough job here to try and get close enough into the next corner but Caruso now will be wanting to try and get in and look how aggressive they're going through the Piratella corner it's not a passing corner that is up the hill but what it certainly is is one of those fearsome corners which you have to take a lot slower than you expect that you need to as they go on through it's all nice and calm at the moment between them right now and they're doing a pretty good job of things to keep themselves instead but the big key as well is that they find themselves about 14 seconds off of the race lead net overall at this stage right now reese yeah they do but uh, our race leader on track has just brought it into the pits benjamin smith brings it in and um the true force altus esports cars simon feigl and zach hanlon staying out once again remember these guys surprised us all by taking a top five at phillip island by going really long on the strategy and um, getting an advantage in the later stages they're looking to repeat that here but uh, dame warren not that far behind uh, at the very least the uh, the true force car the 923 should come out when they pit round about the top six area yes and that's going to be key that top six area is going to be somewhere worth keeping in mind scott gamble gets back in behind the wheel of the car so that would suggest to me at this stage that Benjamin Smith's going to have to come back in again here, Lockie, and it might not be a case where we see uh, every... Or it might just be a case, actually, sorry, where we see alternating pit stops for all four stops. Correct. So Ben Smith's only done 28 laps in the car, so he's not yet fulfilled his minimum number of laps in the car. And uh, neither has Scott Gamble for that matter, because Scott Gamble only did 21 laps in that car at the start of the race. So Scott Gamble has to do at least another 13 laps in the car um, before Ben Smith can get back in for the finish. So you're right, it looks like they might be doing multiple driver changes in that car. 
that certainly does seem to be the case. We keep an eye out on Jordan Caruso here. He is stuck, stuck, and stuck is the right termage uh, here. Termage? Is that a word? Termage? Uh, Terminology? Terminology, that's what I'm trying to look for, not termage. Uh, but uh, here is uh, Jordan Caruso right now trying to uh, find a way through still on Sam Blacklock and having, uh, I would say, all of none of it. Yeah, and Simon Feigl brings the True Force Altus car into the pits from the lead. That's going to uh, give the lead back to the VRS Trans Tasman Racing Machine. Be interesting to see what these guys do. And it is a driver change for the Altus Mustang. Zach Hanlon jumping on into the car. But Sam Blacklock and Jordan Caruso now well and truly together. El Navi has started skipping away from these guys and Caruso will want to get by Blacklock quick sharp through Tamburello. Not much luck. And he's going to have to wait through Villeneuve as well. It's not a typical passing zone. He'll be hoping that Blacklock makes a mistake on the exit of Villeneuve and he can dive up the inside into Tosa. Well, it's an okay run here through this section, but again, doesn't get enough of a run here to Whoa. have a lunge. He's going to have a little nose to the inside, though. See if he can pick a pocket, but he's not going to get that. He got caught with a hand in the pocket almost there as he went on through. He'll have another attempt later on moving on forward let's just have a little talk about some of those drivers though who are a little bit further down the order though here in this race as this battle goes on as Glenn oh. Bottlethwaite here oh hello that's a little bit of a scrap with Tom Freer and Tom Freer is going to be looking at trying to make sure he plays the defensive pact as well as possible here in the uh, orange pursuit sim racing car and that is position I believe held here Reese. Yeah, looks like it, and Posse going incredibly hard into Tosa, but Tom Freer covering him off nicely. That was a great move there on the exit of Tamburello, and now it seems like Freer is going to maintain that position. Remember, though, he's got to be careful of the pitfalls in the second half of the lap. If he puts a foot wrong up at, uh, say, Acaminerale or up there at Variante Alta... He's going to have to give that place back through a slowdown penalty. And that's what Glenn Postlethwaite will be hoping for. Keep the pressure up, force Freer into a mistake. And it's those mistakes which become so very, very vital to how this race is going to be run as they go through the Variante Alta up over the anti-cut curbs and trying to pick up as much of a run as possible off of the exit, doing very well. Haven't really talked about teams a little bit lower down the order. We've seen race on odds. We've seen the likes, of course, of uh, those who have been trying to push on. But we haven't talked too much today so far here, uh, Reese, about that Team Hyperdrive because they've got two vehicles in this one today and they're just quietly running their own race near enough to the back and have been avoiding all eye contact with cameras. Yeah, looks like it. Uh, Team Hyperdrive, the 218, Matthew Norris driving it in uh, 35th position, started in 37th, so they've made up a couple of places from where they started. And uh, Darren McKenzie in the other Hyperdrive car in 37th place, and he's got uh, the uh, Trans Tasman car of Kurt Stenberg to contend, contend with. This is for position. I have to uh, highlight only two tenths of a second between these guys and Stenberg looking to make a recovery from that pit stop mistake that he and Lee Ellis made earlier. Mackenzie also carrying a bit of damage, so walking wounded at the moment. And that's never what anybody wants to do. Nobody wants to be part of the walking wounded going through. Is There's a little emphasis of maybe diving to the inside of Aquim in Arale. It's not a place you uh, traditionally go and make a move. But up the oh. hill you can. And look at the run here from uh, the trans Tasman machine. Gets to the inside. And this is... Uh, as easy as you like on the brakes there. That's easy for Kurt Stenberg. He gets the place on Darren McKenzie. No troubles about that one at all from those drivers. One lap down on your overall race leader at the moment. Also got this one, 28th and 29th. Luke Pink and Blake Neck, they've come out together. And of course, Blake Neck, formerly part of that Evolution Racing team. But the next question I'd ask here, Reese, is who hasn't been? Yeah, Evolution Racing team, I think, has been... Uh one of the most influential teams in the community. Uh, at the very least, uh, Jay and myself have never been part of the ERT squad, but uh, there's been plenty of drivers in this field that have come up through Evolution Racing Team. We're going to go to another battle because have a look at this. Corey Preston and Bradley Ratu 
in that Exto Gaming car have got quite a pack in front of them. Scott Gamble, of course, back in the Evolution 543, and Brian Borg as well up in front of them in the 017. These are for the final few positions in the top 20, and Ratu at the wheel of the 098 as we've passed now half race distance. Ratu just uh, easing off the brakes into Tamburello. No move on Gamble for now. But uh, they've uh, they've really been up against it in that Exco Gaming number 98. Well, he's trying to get himself moving forward. And Brad Ratu here has got to play the patience card. First things Whoa. first. <laughs> oh, talk about patience card. Get a bit of sideways, why don't you? I was going to say, first things first, finish the car. But at the moment, the car's looking like he's a bit raggedy air. Yeah, just a little. They, uh, they're they driving very hard down there. And, um, you know, once you... Uh, I've, I've done a few endurance races in my time on the iRacing platform. And if you have an early incident, it's very hard to get into the rhythm and, uh, and drive the race as you believe you should. You tend to push a little bit harder thinking, you know, we don't deserve to be down here. We can make up some places. And Bradley Ratu sees an opportunity as a car pulls over to let them go. But Ratu, oh, bump just oh, no. off the track there by Scott Gamble. He has to take avoiding action across the chicane. That's going to be a huge slowdown penalty, and he's going to lose even more time. That's what happens when you dip a tyre off into the grass on the outside of that section of road. It's so easy for you to lose all forms of traction when you're so dependent on those rear tyres with the lock diff. The moment that the back steps out, you're really fighting to try and get the car back again. And that one there for Brad Ratu, fortunately, hasn't lost him any time with just how expert that slowdown was served and initiated there going on forward. Want to focus on this, though, because that's Jordan Caruso in sixth place, who is still stuck behind Sam Blacklock. And look at how much time he's lost being behind. It's five seconds that it's gone as we keep a look at what's going on here a little bit further forward as well. But every single battle seems like here Reese, that it's going to be in a mighty mighty place yeah absolutely that gap between uh between caruso and blacklock uh now back down to almost nothing as uh michael schreyer and hayden veld behind them continue to battle Caruso losing a little bit of time there down the hill, but Schreyer and Veld in 32nd and 33rd, only three tenths between them. They've got Andrew Mogridge behind them as well in this three-car battle for these positions outside the top 30. Mogridge, unfortunately, messing up the exit, and this is a potential change of position because uh, Corey Shepard on Glenn Postlethwaite looking like a possibility into Ravazza. Uh, that car, the Synergy number 88, I think the tyres are past their best now because uh, Corey Shepard looking incredibly quick at the moment. Absolutely there, and we know that Corey, uh, Corey Shepard's got a great turn of pace here in the uh, white, blue and red AOC Premier Racing Team car at the moment, going through Ravatsa 1 into Ravatsa 2, and it's all nice and calm at the moment as they all negotiate their way through the various corners and try and get themselves moving on forward getting every little bit that they can out of this one here's where the draft comes fully into effect here looking to move to the inside it's a bit late here if you want to try and make that move stays in line and has to play the waiting game do want to keep a little focus on the race lead though ever so slightly a bit because Dane Warren's not gone away, and that's a little bit concerning, you would say, here. And, Lockie, I'll talk to you about this. 2.2 seconds, only the gap between himself and James Scott. This has been a great stint from the 088, and you would say that this is putting them still in position to maybe challenge for the race win. It is, but you also get the feeling that Dane Warren's probably just managing the gap at the front of the field. He's not driving any harder than he needs to because he knows that he's still got pace in reserve if he needs to use it. And there's no point taking risks, potentially putting yourself in a position where you might make a mistake and fire it off the road and also use more fuel than you need to in trying to stretch the margin. We've still got almost half the race to go. No point pushing too hard too early. And remember, if, if a safety car comes out, that gap is going to be eliminated anyway. We do still have the possibility of a random safety car before the end of this one. So I think Dane Warren, as you said, Lockie, just managing the pace, just making sure that that car stays clean in this middle phase. All good. So 
continues on does Dane Warren here 2.2 seconds down the road and actually Maloney and Hampstead as well they're doing well also but that looks like a change of position has just accrued for the 117 finally and it comes when we're not looking at them so maybe the 117 camera shy in terms of the way to make this move it would be a lunge down at turn number two at Tamburello and it's just like Whoa. that gets a little bit of air time to go alongside with that as well so the 117 puts the flare factor in and we'll take a, another look on board from Sam Blacklock and we'll see the 117 inch on by and then wha-bam over the speed bump and Blacklock there almost uh, getting a slowdown penalty as a result of taking an awful lot of curb at the second apex. But now he's behind and uh, potentially he can do a bit of fuel saving in the draft and uh, maybe get them back on strategy. And it's that strategy which becomes a key point of contention as they go on through Damian Johnstone here looking at Reese Keane in the simrigs.com DPR machine and just behind that is a Zach Hanlin in the Altus Esports outfit this mid pack still scrapping here out in the middle of this race and they'll be hoping that they can find the moves very very soon and very very swiftly here on that 56 of 102 revolutions of this circuit here today and it seems that for the time being at least as they go on through it's all nice and calm but in comes Don Ferraris then here Lucky I'll hand it over to you eighth place at the moment how quickly are they going to be needing Jake Burton back in the car well yeah I think that's why they've chosen to pit at this particular stage so if I just go to my strategy notes for the number 33 car Dominic Ferraris hopped into that car on lap 20 we're now up to lap number 56 so dominic ferraris has ticked over his minimum number of laps uh, so jake burton can get back into the car at this point and drive it through to the end and he has well well there we go it seems like we know what we're talking about here at sim speed tv for the first time in a very long time uh, but at the same time uh, we're having a very very good run uh, looking at how this has gone on every lap so far has been green there has been uh, next to no troubles and i just want to point out a couple of things have just uh, snuck on through here the race control at the moment as my phone decides it doesn't want to be a phone anymore and decides it wants to switch itself off at the worst possible time for me to try and read all of these penalties oh, out Puzzle's as look late. at that posse getting himself through on the lap traffic holding off Corey Shepard so uh, that's a little bit brave so two racing incidents that come in Sam Blacklock Hayden Veld Brad Ratt and Scott Gamble both of which racing incidents there's the Trans Tasman car trying to find a way through as well that is the Emily Jones Andrew Fraser machine there that's found a way through on top of that we haven't talked much about their run so far because they're down in 37th place and that I assume would have been for position yeah looks like it but uh, they having to work their way back up after an incident earlier on and they have gotten past that uh, team hyperdrive car of Darren McKenzie who is starting to uh, fall off the back of that pack and the battle continues between Shepard and Postlethwaite just up ahead of them quite interesting coming down into Ravatsa. You could tell that Corey Shepard is raring to get by Postlethwaite here, but it just seems like Posse is putting his car in the right place every single corner to stay ahead. That's all you need to do sometimes. They are a whole minute off of the race lead at this moment, and they'll be looking at their Shepard getting another good run. It's a defensive line, and oh, Almost going the Ryan Hunter Ray route with two tyres in the grass. That wouldn't have been very useful, but ultimately not much you can do about that. They are stuck looking to try and find places and they are not finding any of them at this moment Whoa. in time. Trying to get that move. Another little wiggle, trying to find a look. But again, no dice as they go on through. Someone's got to shout Yahtzee at some stage and try and make a move. Yeah, but it's not going to happen down here at Tosa because... Shepard not going for the move up the inside but once again you can see that he carries a bit more pace on corner entry and this is actually helping Emily Jones behind them the the, the longer Corey Shepard is stuck here behind Glenn Postlethwaite the more of a chance there is that both of them are going to get passed by the TTR number 51 unlap though is going to be the right way to say it though so that's mm. going to be very very awkward if that situation does arise so for those who are looking to try and find those lapping processes that's uh, going to be something really worth keeping in mind as this 
all continues here at Imola on lap 58 of 102. And there is Sam Blacklock refusing to let go of Jordan Caruso. And at this point, it's almost like, say, when you're playing American football as a linebacker and you effectively have your hands on your opponent. And even if they get by you, you hold on still. Yeah, exactly. Blacklock, I think, uh, staying in the draft. That's what's helping him here versus Caruso. Zach Hanlon there coming through, dropping off for some reason. We're hearing that uh, that other Altus Esports machine. The Blacklock hangs back a bit on Jordan Caruso. Got to keep, uh, keep yourself uh, a fair distance away from the car up ahead through the corners here. You've got to think about the heating of the engine. And um, that's really going to come into effect later on in the race. You see cars running very close behind others. That means that there's going to be more heat in their engines, more of a chance that they'll go pop at some point. So Blacklock will be uh, will be wanting a bit more fresh air in that air dam. Well, the good news about this one in terms of how everyone's going to be funneling out here, Lockie, is the fact that today is a relatively average day, you could say, in terms of temperatures around this fantastic circuit. It's in is the 554 of Sean Lindsell with a little bit of damage to the side. So hopefully that vehicle's going out and away again. But what we're talking about in terms of engines, this isn't necessarily uh, an engine popping style of day. No, we saw a couple of issues, didn't we, with unreliability in the previous round at Phillip Island. So hopefully the mechanical components in these cars can withstand all of the pressure and stress that 102 laps around the Imola circuit puts through them. Just uh, having a bit of a think about where we're at strategically at the moment. So we're not far away from seeing the next round of pit stops. Expect the majority of the field to pit sometime in the next five to ten laps uh, at the moment, the highest place of the cars that has done three pit stops and therefore only has to make one more pit stop to get home is the number 33 car. We saw Dominic Ferraris adding that car over to Jake Burton a little while ago. They're currently down in a 22nd position. In comes Glenn Postlethwaite then to make that stop. There is Jake Burton in 22nd position. This is going to have to be some pretty good laps here to go through. It's 27 to a stint trying to get over to the end so it's going to be a little bit close for comfort there 54 laps to get home in terms of that but we're now at this stage where it's going to be a case of well who can get what who needs what at this stage and i'm taking a look at jake maloney here because james scott suddenly is finding a bit of trouble with the tires it seems a little bit and this is going to be bringing in Maloney who remember is on a lot older tyres and that's really interesting that's mm. the race leader coming down in on lap 59 that seems a little early for my taste buds here Reese. yeah oh well that's that's quite the interesting uh, happening there I'm wondering if they might be banking on uh, on a safety car random safety car coming out Dame Warren it looks like uh, is staying in the car so uh, Lockie, I'm interested to know what the reason would be behind that. What do you think they're trying to do? Well, we're in the window now where you can get home on two more pit stops. So um, it could be to do with their the amount of fuel that uh, they put in the car earlier on. Maybe at this point they need to take a slightly longer stop and they've decided this is a good time to get it out of the way and feed back into a position where they're not going to be interrupted by too much traffic. That's, uh, that's pretty much what I can think of at the moment. Now, the other interesting one is that the number 215 car has come back in, and uh, Brady Myers is going to get back behind the wheel of that car at this stage because uh, Brady Myers started the race, but he got out of that car after only 19 laps to hand it over to Sam Blacklock. So Brady Myers has to do some more laps in that car to fulfill his minimum requirement. The Altus 215 then going on forward and what's key is where Dane Warren has come out in all of this. He's in 10th place right now here on the road. He's just a handful of seconds, that being a handful of one second uh, behind Tom Freer at the moment in the Pursuit Sim Racing 707 machine. So that will have to be a position that will be uh, fought for out on circuit. And that's also another thing that goes into the mind's eye of certain drivers' pit stop cycles here, uh, Reese, they go on through. Are they going to come out 
in a position where uh, traffic in terms of having to overtake someone on the road or having to do something of a different ilk is going to be not ideal as Myers has come out only a handful of seconds behind Jake Burton. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good position for the Altus 215 to be in. But yeah, traffic is the main uh, is the main pitfall once you come out of the pits, especially around a track like this where there's an awful lot of corners. Uh, you, you really don't want to uh, have to make too many passes on track because it means going off the natural racing line onto the marbles, onto the less grippy tarmac, and it ends up wearing the tires out a little bit more. So if you can get out in uh, in a position where there isn't any traffic around you, you're pretty much golden. And that's what every driver's hoping to be. They want to be golden. They want to find uh, everything at this stage that works in their favour. But it is quiet racing here, except at the front, where it is half a second. Right now, we see the gap at the moment as drivers will be thinking about, OK, when's the strategy? That's a mistake. Oh. That's a vehicle off mistake there from the number 13 machine ERT car. Luke Pink there running a little bit wide. And uh, there's the traffic uh, just uh, cycling itself out a bit. And every bit of traffic now trying to get out of the way of every other bit of traffic. It's now a case of look who's where. And almost it's like you need your signal mirrors and indicators going out there on circuit race. Yeah, and then in comes James Scott. Ooh, wow. Takes good advantage of that. Uh, looks like Maloney was held up out of Variante Alta with that traffic. That means that El Nabi is going to be promoted into second, and Jordan Caruso is going to bring the ERT-117 back into third place on track. So now James Scott is going to bring it in. Cooper Webster has not done his minimum required laps, so yes, there is a driver change for the 088 Webster back in the car. Well, let's have a look at where car 77 is out on circuit right now. Here's Dane Warren going through the back half of the circuit, down the hill towards the left-handers of Ravazza This is going to be one, close. And Ravazza 2. It is going to be pretty close here. As now onto the main straight goes Dane Warren. Now keep an eye out on the right-hand side of your screen. Maybe expect a, a little bit of a blue, orange, and white car to be uh, there on the right-hand side. So now it'll turn to the left-hand side of your screen as Dane Warren breezes on by. And, well, it was going to be close, but then Cooper Webster has got this very, very slow pit lane to try and negotiate through. So Dane Warren increases out that gap a little bit there, Lockie. Sorry about that. Just uh, running a few strategic analysis bits and pieces in the background. So uh, Cooper Webster can now go through to the end because James Scott has done 41 laps in that car. So Cooper Webster uh, got out of that car on lap 20. So, yeah, Cooper Webster's right to go to the end if he so desires. Or James Scott's also got uh, 27 laps left as well. So they've got a bit of flexibility up their sleeves in that Alta C Sports car. I think just one of the points that I want to make here as well, guys, is that you don't want to get to lap 75, which we've established as the critical lap number, and find that you've still got two pit stops to go, because if you were to get a safety car at that point, you have to do two stops. Everybody else only has to do one. It would blow your strategy completely. So that's why we're seeing a lot of teams coming in at this point to get their second last pit stop out of the way to make sure that they don't find themselves in a position where they have to make more stops than necessary if we were to get a safety car. But, but surely, though, Lockie, if a safety car does come out, then everybody who has to come down and get a stop effectively gets a free pit stop. They do, but what I'm saying is that uh, say you got to lap number 75 and you've only completed two of your four compulsory pit stops, if you have to do two pit stops at that point and everybody else has to do one um, with the field being bunched up, you're going to lose a huge amount of track position with your second pit stop, so you really don't want to end up in that position. You certainly don't. We've caught Scott Zislowski having a Mark Scaife right out sideways moment. Dane Warren's got the fast slap of the race, but look at this from Scott Zislowski. Oh, 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 full opposite lock to try and save that one. That was brave and bold. It certainly was. And once again, demonstrating something that I keep reiterating, you've got to pay attention to the colour of the AstroTurf. That dark green is very slippery. Of course, Zlowski got the slide on a bit before he got to the kerb, but 
that red and white and green certainly wouldn't have helped the rear tires regain traction. And of course, that red, white and green is very symbolic of the Italian flag here as they go on through this track. Of course, is based in Italy. It's about 70 kilometers away uh, from San Marino. Of course, the uh, I, uh, I wouldn't say island, but encircled nation. Uh, one of two, technically, uh, in Italy. The other one, of course, being the Vatican City. Uh, but ultimately, uh, here's Jordi Sinai trying to find a way through on Luke Pink, the scrap for 19th place on the road right now here, Reese. Yes, and Jordi is, uh, seems to have the measure of Luke Pink through Villeneuve at the moment hooked up the apex a little better. Luke Pink now, after having faced a couple of dramas before, we saw that he um, that he had a, tr a bit of trouble out of Variante Alta. He's gotten back on rhythm in that car, but Sinai, extremely close at the moment, looking like he'll, uh, he'll make a move in a couple of laps if he can get the draft, if he can put the throttle application down nicely out of Rivazza. That will be a slipstream move coming into Tamburello. And we know that Jordi Sinai is uh, is one of the up-and-coming talents in this series. We first saw him at Mo Sport, where, uh, where he had a great showing down in Split 2. And along with Luke Pink, uh, another driver that is an up-and-comer in this series. They, uh, they will remember battles like this for quite some time. Even though it's for the minor positions at the moment, it's still one heck of a fight. Yes, but they've had some argy-bargy over the course of this. Luke Pink has been given a warning for blocking against Kobe Jones and the ANZ Motorsports car. And then with an incident of trying to clear a slowdown penalty for Luke Pink, uh, essentially it's been uh, noted as a redress and a slowdown which will have no penalty. Now, Jordi's desperately wanting to get through here on the inside. Is going to do so as in comes Jake Maloney to make the stop in the number 28 car, it seems, at this stage. Looking for the lane and getting on through. Now, this is going to be key here in terms of how this looks here, Lockie. Where's the 28 going to look here as we've got some side-by-side -side action up the hill? Well, what I can tell you is that Jake Maloney's not yet done his minimum number of laps, so he will have to stay in that car for at least another stint. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it? We saw that this car was doing much earlier pit stops than its sister Trans Tasman car earlier on, but things have sort of swapped around a bit. We're seeing the number 28 car come in for its third pit stop after the number 77 car. A massive, massive moment then, and it looks like Jake Burton was the one who got it all shades of wrong. Grass oh. on entry. Oh, tyres get absolutely torched going sideways, and there oh. goes the position for one Mr. Jake Burton. We'll get a look on board at this one here. This is what happens. He just carries a little bit too much speed. Rear tyres take the grass, and goodbye, see you later. That's going to have to be caught. Yeah, well, it was very well caught by Jake Burton, actually, because um, if, uh, if you overcorrect in a slide like that, he probably would have speared the other direction into the wall. But that's a mistake that the number 33 won't be wanting to deal with. Jake Burton is likely going to be in the car to the end of the race as Damian Johnston and Zachary Hanlon together coming into the first turn. And Hanlon has been holding off the advances of John Stone for quite some time now over the last couple laps. He's looking quite hungry. Remember that True Force Altus Esports machine looking to try and get further into the top 10. They currently sit in eighth position, but he's left the door open slightly. John Stone not going to take it though. Nope, not quite there. Didn't quite find what was needed then. So more battles on the horizon. In comes then Forzan El Nabi to make the stop for the number 21. Uh, a United Sim Sport machine here. And uh, Lockie, this is going to be a really interesting time to see where the 21 comes out. It is, and uh, partly because Forza El Nabi was setting some really, really fast lap times throughout that stint and was actually making up some time on the likes of Dame Warren and Cooper Webster. So... Uh, yeah, this will be an interesting stop to see if maybe they can gain a bit of time on their rivals and uh, elevate this United Sim Sports car into podium contention. Off the jacks he goes, and away goes Forza El Nabi. But John Stone versus Hanlon still ongoing as we wait to see where El Nabi comes out. Matthew Norris on the back of. Uh, Sean Linsell here for the positions outside the top 30 and Emily Jones now fighting for track position looking very quick versus 
these two Mustangs, but having to hold off into the Villeneuve chicane once more. These two fighting with each other. I said this before when uh, when Jones was uh, behind the two cars a lap ahead of her. Now this is full position. The battling really helping her. A great exit from Tosa, and she might just get him here. Seems that something has happened to Jake Sperry as Emily Jones sneaks up the inside and is now through on the hyperdrive machine. That has allowed Sean Linsell to get away slightly. Jones, though, seems to have the pace. And uh, I'm pretty sure she's going to advance up onto the back of Linsell fairly shortly. Once again, that car on a massive recovery drive. So now Jordan Caruso brings in the number 117 ERT car to the pits and hands it back over to Ethan Grigg Galt. That promotes, uh, oh, actually, Andrew Gilliam also bringing the Pursuit Sim Racing car into the pits as well. Briefly took the race lead, but Dane Warren slides on through in the Trans-Tasman number 77 back into the lead. And um, we are hearing that Jake Sperry is out for just a couple of moments, but we will return to his dulcet tones pretty soon. It's a very good, very good uh, strategy there from the number 77 is oh no that's a problem for the true force trans uh, for the true force altus car side by side with the prologue react machine and straight into the pits wants no more of that so hanlon brings it back into the pits as we go to a replay once again thanks to modem simulation what happened down at rivatsta hanlon uh didn't seem like he was clearing a slowdown out of variante alta i think it might have been a mistake Oh, yeah, just a bit too deep on the brakes coming into Rivatsa and off into the grass. Instantly, two positions lost. But fortunately, Sperry, he was right going for the pits anyway. He certainly was. And Jonathan Ledgard would love your uh, use of problem in a racing sentence as he goes on yeah. forward. Uh, <laughs> Dane Warren in control of the field now once again, putting himself uh, through on one of the United cars. That would be the Kyle George Jamie McKnight. Uh, entry there out on track but crucially here sixth and seventh four tenths of a second only uh, the gap at the moment between Myers and Burton as they try and get on forward and now Burton trying to recover the car back up again here after the tyres uh, deciding that they want to go a full way sideways uh, going on forward so they're going to be looking to try and find a little something here to find a bit more time but for the time being at least Brady Myers in control in sixth place that he is and um both he and sam blacklock putting in some great stints so far but jake burton he got briefly held up by uh by lap traffic when he came out of the pits last so he's uh, he's had to try and gain some of that time back and of course there was the mistake down at Minerali as well that put him further back i think if it weren't for that burton wouldn't be having to deal with myers at the moment just getting word in from the stewards that there is a redress there for Griffin Gardner on lap 63 that we have uh, not quite seen but has happened uh, out on circuit. So that, of course, uh, is a very, very key to this one as they continue on their scraps looking for places, looking for positions, looking for anything that very well may be needed here at this stage. So uh, that one all looks very, very good at the moment for them here as uh, Myers and Burton continue on their drive the gap at the front is 11 seconds now here um locky for dane warren and uh, madison down but crucially uh jake maloney richard hamstead they've taken their long stop it seems on that last one and they find themselves now 23 seconds off the race lead yeah we're not really going to get a true indication of what the margins are until the final round of pit stops because that's when we'll get to see exactly how long everybody has to spend and stationary in the pits to put on enough fuel to get to the check and flag. Just uh, coming to the 543 car as well, the Alta C Sports, sorry, not the Alta C Sports, the Evolution Racing Team entry of Benjamin Smith and Scott Gamble. I'll get in big trouble for, for getting that one wrong. Um, we suggested before that they were going to be changing drivers at every stop. Well, in fact, that's what's happened so far. So Ben Smith now back in that car, having taken over from Scott Gamble on lap number 64. Scott Gamble, we believe, has now completed his minimum number of laps, so Ben Smith can stay 
in that car right through until the end of lap 102. And that's going to be very, very crucial right now. We are on lap 69 of 102 at the moment. Soon to nice. be on lap 70. It's nice. It's very nice at this stage at the moment as we are two thirds of the way through this race. And the final third is where it's all going to be joined together quite nicely as they go on through the next few sections of road as it looks like uh, for the time being at least there's a little bit of battling going on up in front of that 543 machine uh, at this moment in time trying to get on through but what is very key as well to keep in mind at the moment Reese, is that there are a lot of drivers up over that one minute barrier who might just find themselves in a bit of trouble if they get lapped yeah for sure there's uh there's there's quite uh quite a, a traffic jam coming up i think for some uh, some race leaders that. oh no yeah i see in the runoff area at villeneuve it looks like that is matthew deer in the krf eye candy car and the car is uh, definitely not looking very sweet at the moment coming out of the gravel trap let's take a look at what happened to him well, uh, it's very catching livery, I'll say that much. So when you see it go around, you know it's that car. At least it's got that going for it. Uh, going through the left then, and all on its own, uh, actually does find the tyres. So that's not ideal for Matthew Deere. And it's at this point where uh, you get the dad joke book out and you go, oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, there I go. I did it myself, and I, I wasn't even intending it. Our director, Jay, absolutely going off in the background. But uh, I think down into Villeneuve, down into Villeneuve, the one dad in the booth loved it. But um, that uh, entry into the corner, the fast left hand, are very easy to get the car unsettled if you take a little bit too much curb. I think that's what happened to Deer. Meanwhile, the battle between Brady Myers and Jake Burton continues for 6th and 7th. And Jake Burton hasn't really made much inroads on Brady Myers so far. He's looking good through Tamburello, but uh, so far, Myers doing everything he needs to at the moment to stay ahead. Lucky... Lucky, I think Jake Burton might be fuel saving here because he came in very early for that stop and was the first of anyone to pit. Has he pitted a little bit too late? He's thinking about the inside. He's not going to take it right now. But is he okay on fuel or is he going to need to fuel save a lap or so? He should still be okay because his pit stop was 14 and a half laps ago. So based on the fuel range of 27 laps, he can still go another 13 laps which will get him to about lap 82 which is well inside of the critical lap number of lap number 75 so jake burton should be okay what he might still be trying to do though by fuel saving is putting himself in the position where he doesn't have to take on as much fuel during that final pit stop so he'll have the shorter pit stop and that shorter pit stop could be key to leapfrog over a couple rivals come the end of this race. They are seven seconds back of the Grid Gold Caruso entry of the 117 ERT team. So uh, what Burton and Ferraris are going to have to do is rely on Jake Burton to pull themselves up through the order just a little bit more. On the brakes into the left-hand bends of Ravazza, they come along and search for more places to be found and at the moment. Uh, not quite close enough again just yet. Another good little run there from the 250. Just gaining that little bit of time out there on circuit, doing just enough. But let's talk championship for a moment here, Reese, because the Webster Scott entry there in second doing well. There's, again, a little half look there from uh, one Mr. Jake Burton. But with Dane Warren Madsen down up there at the top, Madsen down taking maximum points out of this one. This is not ideal in a number of reasons for a number of reasons but for Zan El Nabi because he'll be dropping more points. Yeah, exactly. For Zan, um, behind both the uh, the car of Down and the car of Scott as uh, Jake Burton continues his relentless pursuit here of Brady Myers. I think a move is going to happen pretty soon if uh, if my predictions are correct, but. El Nabi there in third. I think he might just have to focus on damage limitation for now because he's a pretty long way behind them uh, in terms of track position, and I don't know if the final pit stop is really going to help him. Well, 
it's going to be very interesting as we are uh, uh, looking at this one as we go for, for 70 laps without a caution we have gone this far this might just be the first time in enduro that we have gone 70 laps clean without anything going wrong here as there is Dion Peters in the team hyperdrive car propping up the field and it is worth noting as well here so far Reese, no retirements in 72 laps I mean, that is a first, I think, for, for V8 Scops Enduros. Usually by this point of the race, we, we see around uh, three to five cars out of contention, completely out of the race. But it's amazing. Everyone has managed to keep it going. The last running car is the Team Hyperdrive entry of Darren McKenzie and Dion Peters. They're two laps down, but they're still chugging along. Exactly, and that's key here. Everybody's still out there on track running and racing, and that's what's making life difficult in terms of traffic issues here today in the racing that we've got because everybody's out on track and finding their own little place and their own plot of land to sort of build up everything in terms of the way they want to run this race. A lot of people are finding themselves in a little bit of trouble because they were expecting retirements and they've gained places through retirements. The matter of fact here, Reese, today is that with, what, 30 laps to go and they next cross the line, uh, that's just simply not the case. Yeah, I, uh, I don't, I don't want to count all of my chickens before they hatch, but there is a slim chance here that we might see the whole race go without any retirements, and that would certainly be a first for a V8 Scops Enduro. Brady Myers and Jake Burton, though, continuing their fight, and Burton really biding his time here, coming into Akaminarali, almost catching the grass once again, but a great exit up the hill and putting the pressure on Myers once again, but has to back off into Variante Alta, not the most optimum of passing zones. No, it's definitely not, and it is worth saying as well, it's much more of a passing zone than it used to be in terms of its layout, Reese, because of the mm. fact that we, fi we found ourselves with an aqua uh, with a uh, Variante Alta that used to be this ferocious uh, left-right, sh oh, sorry, right-left chicane, which put the fear of God in everyone. Yeah, Variante Alta used to be much faster. It was more of a flick than a real chicane, but as part of uh, upgrades to the track in 2006, the chicane was reconfigured so that it is now its uh, wider, slower version. Jake Burton, the gap is right down here. Is it a move up the inside for the 33? And it's protected by Myers around the outside. Burton knows that, uh, that Myers pushing hard in the braking zones he does not want to make that side-by-side -side contact he'll fall under the ire of the stewards if that happens he had a big kick of sideways coming through the second part of the three-part tamborello chicane so uh, doing just enough there just to hold that place and hold that position quite nicely but it's still racing continues out on track and we're getting pretty close now to where drivers can start thinking about pit stop to the end on a full tank of fuel we are on lap 73 we are two laps away when the leader crosses the line to get into the magic number locky that being 75 yeah indeed we are and i think if there was to be a safety car now you'd say the bulk of the field come in and take their stops because i think we're close enough to the end that particularly based on how good we saw everybody's fuel saving was at Field of Island that oh, if there was a safe no, to go oh, on. No. oh no oh now that's the like traffic goes around Burton just about avoids the wall and that was all down to the 13 I want to replay all the way back on that 13 yep. from going back to Aqua Minerale because that 13 was in a battle just ran off the road on the grass and then trying to gather it back up now he did have the option here to hold both cars back through went one vehicle and Burton wasn't quite on the scene quick enough so it was a case of no you're gonna have to wait sunshine if you're gonna go through oh. bang there's the contact hard into the back and there's the number 13 car uh, waiting for uh, a, a subordinate amount of time. We get another look at this one then from Ariel. And there's not much really that you can say about this one here, Reese. Yeah, well, I think uh, Pink was just slotting back onto the racing line thinking Burton was going to hold back. But I get the feeling Burton was expecting Pink to let both of them by. We'll look on board from Burton and Pink moves over onto the racing line. And Burton by now be thinking, oh, no. And he, he had to actually, cross. yeah. He was already on the brakes, and I feel like uh, he, he might have just been well. held up a little uh, if it weren't for that catching of the grass. 
there was a separate incident as well for the Synergy car who spun at the exit of the corner as well. So that's maddening there. Three vehicles all running themselves into troubles. And uh, for the first time in about, mm, I'd say, 10 laps, the stewards have something to look at here. Yeah, they do. And um, I guess uh, the, the driver in question will be Luke Pink because... Uh, I, I get the feeling he might uh, get done for ignoring blue flags. Of course, uh, Jake Burton had a couple of mitigating circumstances there with a uh, wheel being dipped into the grass, and that's the main reason why the contact was made. But nonetheless, I think Jake is going to be very unhappy with that turn of events. He's lost all of, the, of that time to Brady Myers up ahead, and now the car's probably carrying a little bit of damage too. Yeah, and that's not ideal here for Jake Burton in seventh place right now. As a couple of seconds ahead uh, compared to Andrew Gilliam. Here's a little look down the inside from Dane Warren, putting a lap on the True Force Altus car of Zach Hanlon in 19th position at the moment on the road. So uh, that's the lead gap. It's 15 and a half seconds at the moment for Dane Warren, who has put the uh, fantastic trans Tasman machine exactly where it needs to be at this stage in time. The 77's had a really good run of things right now. And here's the battle 17th, 18th right now. Benjamin Smith, well, he's got mirrors full of Brian Borg. That he has. And um, the, uh, the number 543 having a bit of a tough one in the last couple of laps. They're now down on their starting position by five places. And Brian Borg looking very hungry in that uh, Premier Racing Team 017 machine. The Bry Borg, as Sperry likes to call him. He's put in some great drives and scops in the past. And now potentially moving forward to 17th. And from a 24th place starting position, it's uh, certainly uh, a great run for Premier Racing Team. Hearing that there is a penalty for Hugh Barter uh, for the uh, uh, oh, it's actually applied to the car of Barter and Pink for that incident with Jake Burton so there we go blue flag well blue flags uh, will say you've got to get out of the way you can't put your car in that position you knew that you let a car through there was no excuse for you to be there on the brakes and well Burton's closing speed was a bit too much I think Burton maybe got a little bit fortunate with that one but uh, that's mm. by the by at this stage they go on forward and look to continue so Dane Warren leads Cooper Webster in second Ford and Arby currently in third position right now but now it's the waiting game who's going to jump when here Lockie to make their final stop yeah, well, we've reached the critical lap number now, so any time from now until the end of the race, we'll be seeing cars come in to take their final pit stops. The car that can go furthest is the 117 car, Ethan Griggolt and Jordan Caruso, because that was the car that stopped the latest out of all of the front runners. Also, the Andrew Gilliam, Michael Taliancic car in a similar position, having stopped on the same lap. Uh, the leading car, Dane Warren, um, they can probably go about another 10 laps before they have to stop in the number 77 car. So I reckon, yeah, for the next 10 to 15 laps is probably the range at which we'll see people coming in for their final pit stop. Unless, obviously, there's a safety car, in which case everybody will come in for their final stop oh. all at once. <laughs> oh, did you oh, see that fairy in the background? A big hyperdrive moment there. That is Kane Hewson who has himself going all shades of sideways and he's probably getting in that practice for about I would say uh, two weeks time. Yeah well um, I think Look he's definitely helmet. feeling like his helmet <laughs> at the very least. A uh, um, little bit of a dance with death here for Kane Hewson just gets on to the slippery astroturf curb once again and only just avoiding spearing off the other side of the circuit. Very well held. If he had that big incident hit the wall, most likely he would have speared back onto circuit and we may have been uh, finding ourselves in a case of potentially a safety car there right on the start of the final pit window. So uh, that wouldn't have been ideal, but Houston saves the car and makes sure that we still have 40 runners here in this race at the moment, Reese. Yes, indeed. We remain with uh, all cars that started the race still running. 
There's a couple of uh, cars, actually four cars, that are now two laps down. And uh, I, I have to say, it looks like Jake Burton is indeed maybe into the pits. He is indeed. So taking their final stop is the number 33 car and they're going to go through to the end so jake burton has got quite the task ahead of him if he wants to gain a couple of positions back well it's gonna have to be well worked here it's gonna be a longer stop compared to everyone else 25 laps worth of fuel having to go into the vehicle so we'll see where this all funnels out everyone he's going to be dropping back to 13th place trying to get going again here as the long long wait to go past the Decra building and uh, get off and away again starts to come into play. He is now a lap down in 16th position and will be pretty much hoping and waiting that there's going to be time on the horizon where drivers start to make those stops and get themselves going. In is also Corey Shepard right now for the Premier Racing Team. Off of the jacks, off and away again. And now this is just a case of who can pit when. And it's worth noting that Dane Warren is due to come in before here, Lockie. Cooper Webster. Correct, by two laps, because Dane Warren took his previous pit stop two laps earlier than Cooper Webster. I reckon one of the reasons that Jake Burham might have come in a bit earlier for his pit stop, that context that he had with Hugh Barter earlier on, couldn't have maybe just done a little bit of damage to that car, and uh, they wanted to give that some attention during that pit stop. That's going to be very, very interesting. It also will be worth noting that he would have burnt up the tyres, uh, not just by the fact he had that sideways moment, but he had two sideways moments over that stint. So getting on fresh rubber certainly uh, isn't going to be hurting things at all as they start to make that progress and try and get back through this one. So now this becomes a case of who's got what. Everybody's just falling into a little line here and there, but... I think this is about a good point here, Reese, to say, well, I think a lot of drivers have done very well. It's worth noting that we've only got a handful of drivers here who've been able to stay on the leading lap. Yes, indeed. The, uh, the top 15 cars are now on the lead lap, and it looks like the 098 car is about to go a lap down as Jake Burton now having to deal with uh, one of the hyperdrive machines. But Bradley Ratu there up into 14th, Driving with Corey Preston, of course, they are now one position up from where they started. So they've managed to at least negate that uh, incident that Corey Preston had all the way back on lap one. But still, it's going to become now 13 cars on the lead lap in just a couple of seconds because Dane Warren is relentless. He certainly is, and Brad Ratu has got nothing he can really argue about here. Takes the big wide line, lets Dane Warren go through down on the inside, and just like that, the position changes, and Dane Warren continues to push forward here in car number 77, as there is Jack Boyd behind in 19th place. He's having a good scrap there. That's Jake Burton, who has seemingly found a way through on the Synergy car, and we'll catch it on the Motum Simulation replay race. Yes, indeed. So on board with Jake Burton out of Tamburello, and it looks like this was a move down into Tosa. There's Boyd, slightly compromised through the second apex of Villeneuve. Burton took the wide entry, which allowed him to extend the exit, and then slams on the brakes and is through right as they get into the turn-in point. So that's one more uh, position down there for Burton. His next target is Zachary Hanlon up ahead in the 923. Exactly, and that's going to be key. Every position matters at this stage, and you try and pick apart the places one by one by one by one. Worth noting, though, that the 21 car is not a million miles away here in this race, Reese. The gap is 5.6 seconds between the 21 and the 088. Now, that's key for a number of big reasons as Borg and Hanlin continue their scrap down the front stretch, and the key here is uh, the fact that when you look at, say, Cooper, Webster, and Falls and Nabi. El Nabi has to play damage limitation mode here. Make sure that Madison Down doesn't take any points away more than he can. If he can finish second, then that's better than finishing third. And I think that's just basic. Yeah, it really is the most basic uh, that you can get. Second versus third. For Forza El Nabi, he will want second. So... In terms of lap times, a 43-1 for El Nabi on the last lap, a 43-4 for Cooper Webster. So El Nabi is just chipping away there at the 088 up there in the podium positions. But 
Uh, definitely a lot of chipping away happening here for Jake Burton because now he's on the back of Zach Hanlon as well as the, uh, the Premier Racing Team Mustang up ahead. But Burton has got an awful lot of work to do. He, yes, he does have the fresh tires, but he'd want to be out there on track alone, maximizing his pace and through there at Ackerman or Ali. Hanlon goes wide. Yeah, easy as you like. A little bit of yellow helmet syndrome of the late Ayrton Senna. That was just how you want to make that happen as they go on through. We're looking at Andrew Gilliam right now, all on his own. Has been for a very long time in seventh position. And, well, for the car that started in second here, Reese, it's a case to be made of, well, that opening stint really did put them backwards. And it was a case of Mike Taliancic not being able to keep up, which has put them in that place today. Yeah, and they'll, uh, they'll probably go over that in the debrief, think about what they can do for Bathurst, whether or not they uh, they put Mr. Gilliam in the car at the start so they can preserve a good qualifying position. But I have to say, despite all of the issues that they have suffered, it has been a good drive from that Pursuit 201 to remain inside the top 10. It'll certainly be a good haul of championship points for Andrew Gilliam, but maybe a bit less than he would have wanted. These are two positions just outside the top 32. Aaron Dodd and riding on board with Liam Wilde in the Zuva Racing 208. Of course, Liam driving with Chris Coxhead. And um, these guys currently uh, position, uh, position down, uh, a few positions down from where they started. And a bit of a mistake for Wilde there in Variante Alta. That's going to allow Blake Purdy through uh, to lap him. Purdy there running in ninth position. I, I suppose as well, Blake Purdy going through, the, the Variante Alta, as we just saw that battle, um, can't really be called the Variante Alta anymore because Alta means first chicane. So effectively, it's firstly, A, the third chicane on the lap, and uh, secondly, uh, there's no Variante Butter anymore on the layout. So it's just the Variante. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, <laughs> I mean, legacy corner names seem to be a thing around a lot of race tracks, and Imola, I guess, is no different. This battle is really <laughs> leading up to something special. Jack Boyd having to take slight avoiding action there versus Hanlon on the exit of Variante Alta. Um, but Variante Alta called as such, I think, because uh, also it was the first chicane to be installed. Uh, on the racetrack. No, actually, I'm going to correct myself there. It was the very anti-Bassa section that was uh, installed first in the late 1970s. Into the pits then comes a number of drivers. Brian Borg is one of them. Brad Ratu dives down in onto the lane as well. There is Hayden Veld going through and Michael Schreyer coming back out of the lane here. As we've got Kenneth Latta side Wonderful. by side with one of the hyperdrive cars, Kane Hewson trying to not go too sideways here as they go through one and two. That's all nice and dandy. In comes Cooper Webster, though. And, Lockie, this is the first real stop we've seen of the final drivers. Indeed it is. So pretty much an even tyre strategy for the number 088 car. Peering on laps 20, 42, 61, and now lap number 81. So pretty much splitting the tyre wear evenly across the stints for that car. And... Uh, yeah, be interesting now to see how this all plays out in terms of where that car rejoins. Like you said, Fawzanel Narby was making up some time on Cooper and Webster before Webster came into the pits, and I do reckon that El Narby might be slightly better off on fuel as well. Well, that's going to be very interesting to see as Cooper Webster will be looking to get out and away again, should be out ahead of Blake Purdy and does as we continue to watch this fight for 18th and 19th place on the road, which will be going up through the orders a bit. <laughs> Look how aggressive you need to be if you are a Zach Hanlon right now trying to drive around this place. This is some fantastic work uh, coming in between those two who are trying everything possible here to go and have their battle in. Also comes the 88 machine here, Reese. That's Postle Thwaite and Hobson's car. Yes, indeed, and uh, Glenn Postlethwaite staying in the car, it seems, as there it is up on the jacks. And Jack Boyd brings the other Synergy car into the pits from 17th. Now we got to focus on what the rest of the top three are going to do. The Bianti Trans Tasman car of Maloney coming out here of the final corner to start the first flying lap of this final stint. 
And also and just keeping an eye out on everyone, trying to have this good run. Maloney yet to come down in and really uh, have that good push in on the lane. So we'll keep an eye out on them, trying to make sure that they are well placed and well in position at this moment in time to go through. A lot of dust being kicked up around this place and that's part of uh, iRacing's fantastic work uh, putting in the particle effects and all the rest of the things that come in. I know that something else that's been key, Reese, in terms of how iRacing have been developing the simulator is putting in those X-Audio 2 sounds which have made things look uh, a lot better uh, in terms of this more and more and more as more and more drivers now start to find battles. Kobe Jones, who has yet to come down in and make a stop, comes back in as now there is Rob Bowden making a stop from 25th. Yes, indeed. And Brian Borg here, a change for position in the pit stops. That is uh, for the 21st position. Um, Jack Boyd in that pit stop actually gaining time. So that's put him ahead of uh, the Premier car once more. So good stuff there for the Synergy number 58. From here on in, they've got a good gap in front of them. It looks like they might just gap him. Blake Purdy in as well for pursuit. So they're coming in and trying to get their stop, get themselves out and going again with a good run of things here today. But uh, they will be pretty sure falling back out behind Jake Burton and co here in this one. There's Griffin Gardner uh, down on the lane and that's a tow by the looks of things. So uh, that does not look good for them. So uh, they're right on the start finish line the pit box is on the start finish line so it's absolutely making a mockery of our timings but there's the 77 car in though that's the race leader yes it is and through goes the 117 to take the overall race lead and the number 21 coming in as well the united sim sports car of el Nabi and haber up onto the jacks and el Nabi, as uh, is probably predictable stays in the car and there goes Dane Warren in the number 77 as the 21 remains stationary. Out comes Griffin back into 18th position. Griffin, of course, with a lot of uh, with a lot of pace under his belt, but not quite able to take advantage of it here at Imola. So the Trans Tasman car comes out in fifth place on track. Forza El Nabi will uh, come out around about position six. There is also one of the DPR cars in. There's Jake Maloney uh, leading this race at the moment for the Bianchi Trans Tasman Racing Team. But Lockie, key here is that car's got to make a stop. And I think quite a lot of cars have got to make a stop and try and get themselves home and dry here in terms of this race. It looks like it's pretty plain sailing to say at this point that Dane Warren, it will take a miracle for him to lose this race. Yeah, no doubt. Car number 77 is in the box seat at this point. Interestingly enough there, Forza El Nabi's pit stop was around five seconds quicker than 088 Cooper Webster and James Scott car, but Forza El Nabi has still ended up around five seconds behind Cooper Webster wow. after that pit stop. So Forza El Nabi must have lost time during the in or the out lap because he was about, what, six seconds behind Webster? So somewhere... Forza Nil Nabi's lost most of the time that he gained through having the quicker pit stop, so that's an interesting one. Somewhere it's gone wrong, and I think that's the right way to say it for Forza Nil Nabi right now. Was needing to get by Cooper Webster in the 088, and whatever they were trying to do, it was the right idea, but something went wrong in terms of the, uh, I would say, application of what they needed to get from that stop race. Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, probably uh, execution might have done with a bit of improving but uh we'll have to wait and see how that pans out for them in the final uh 20 laps of this race here's emily jones and scott Szlowski, both of these teams suffering some great misfortune over the course of this race and fighting for those minor positions but jones now ahead of the forerunner motorsports machine she's been putting in some fantastic drives over the course of this endurance cup andrew fraser no slouch either but you see jones in complete control of uh, that ttr number 51 and uh, i think Szlowski might not have a chance here because she's looking quick she is she's been up as high as 10th position with the team but that's with uh, the stops included it has started 22nd is down in 28th place so a net gain of minus six 
so far here today, which is not quite part of the plan. I think the right way to describe it at this stage. Still got a handful of drivers to come in and make those stops get out and away again. And what we can say as well here, Lockie, is the fact that Dane Warren being 27 seconds behind the leader uh, means that ahead of transit time at this stage is the number 77 ahead of the 28. So it doesn't matter how quick Maloney's stop is, they could be in and out and stop for absolutely nothing. They'd still be ahead. Yeah, the 117 car, the Evolution Racing Team entry making its way into the pits now for its final stop now. Remember, we're expecting the pit stop for this car to be quite short because it took its previous pit stop quite a bit later than everybody else. So Whoa. the 117 car Ooh. could be in quite a good position here. <laughs> Sorry, sorry to cut you off there. We saw Griffin Gardner got the fastest lap for all of about five seconds there, Lockie. <laughs> yeah, so Dane Warren then into the 41s once again, and he is on the absolute warpath now after that final stop with Ethan Griggolt now out of the car and the Pursuit Sim Racing 201 making its way up into the podium positions on this pit stop cycle. But of course, we believe that they have yet to come in for their final stop once again as well. So the top three we're hearing have not made their final stop. We're still expecting drivers to get themselves out into positions right now. Dane Warren in fourth place, 27 seconds back of Jake Maloney right now, just doing everything that needs to be done for this VRS Trans Tasman Racing Team. They've got nothing to really argue about this stage as in comes the Jones Christensen entry then in the ANZ Motorsports team. They're down making their final stop in the number nine, trying to get through. Lee Ellis also down in for Trans Tasman Motorsport as Jake Maloney here is in the lead at the moment. He will choose when he wants to come down in and make that stop. He's got all the time in the world to decide when that is the time because they are surprisingly one of the later drivers to come down in and make that stop here, Lockie. Indeed, and uh, I reckon they've still got probably another five or six laps before they're going to be out of fuel, so they can go quite deep into this race if they so desire, but I'm not sure that they're quite going to get on the podium tonight, our Philip Island 500 winners. Well, there is Myers and Blacklock. They are down in on the lane right now in the 215 machine, and they will be hoping that time is of their essence right now there goes Forza Nel Narby going through now here's Ethan Grigolt and the Evolution Racing Team 117 making progress here down the front stretch with 15 laps to go and they next cross the line here Reese. and it's very oh, much no. a case of they are going to be dropping back further and further and further and there's an oh no yeah the oh no was because there was a problem for Brady Myers coming off the jacks that number nine has uh, has stayed stock still meanwhile a big problem for them but Brady Myers stalled the car once oh. it came up off the jacks. So that's a valuable couple of seconds that the 215 has lost. They slot back out now in, uh, seems a uh, bit lower of a position than they were thinking in front, uh, in front of them. Dion Peters in the team hyperdrive car promptly lets them through, but Brady Myers is going to have some extra work to do uh, towards the end of this race now. Did my eyes deceive me there, Reese? Or was that an incredibly long stop there for the ANZ Motorsports entry? It was. They were they were stationary for quite some time, and I don't know quite what the issue was. Maybe they were speeding. getting some damage repaired. Maybe. Maybe they got a speeding in pits penalty. They are still stopped, according to our director. We're hearing something happened two minutes and 20 seconds ago to them unfortunately can't get a replay but i'll get on the case for you sperry i'll uh, bring you what happened in a second okay we'll get some news about that because that could be after 88 laps of racing the first retirement of the race so far and that would be a huge shame uh, to see that one going on we didn't catch it on cameras we're not going to be able to tell you exactly what happened just yet but we will find it Corey I Shepard, got it. Glenn Postle, plate 14th and 15th race you found it I have indeed it was uh oh my goodness Kobe Jones got on the brakes for Tamburello and on the downshift the engine absolutely exploded so he uh he ended up running off into the turn one runoff area waited there for a couple of seconds and then escaped 
I, uh, I don't know if he uh, requested a tow from race control, but that is the protocol, and uh, they might have granted it to him. Well, the good news is, uh, oh, there's Ben. You yeah. can see head in hands once again, like Watkins Glen. Uh, he is very unhappy about that. What did you do, Kobe? Kobe would be like, what do you mean that happened? As Tom Freer uh, goes into the pits and gets the stop, Benjamin Smith is there in on the pits as well uh, trying to get things all working as well uh, so uh, they're coming in and making their stops but still not long left to go here as everything's still to be cycled out here Reese. yes indeed and benjamin smith here um seems might be staying in the car uh as scott gamble has already uh, satisfied his minimum driver amount so that last time we saw Scott Gamble out on track is going to be the last time that we see him compete in online sim racing. Thank you for your service, Scott. It's been a pleasure, but um, certainly contributing well to a good result for that Evolution Racing Team 543. Godspeed. And now continuing on to battling here, Glenn Postlethwaite all over the curb, looking to try and get by Corey Shepard. In comes Andrew Gilliam then in the 201 to make the stop and try and get out and away. Was a little bit behind Jake Burton and co uh, coming in and trying to make that in the 201. So we'll see how this one works out. There goes Ethan Grigolt uh, straight on by. Brady Myers will be next then in terms of trying to filter this one out and trying to make this one all happen through the final corner and trying to put some power down on the exit to get that good run forward and now the question is how long will Andrew Gilliam wait here and try and get back out and going again going through right now this is a very awkward angle actually with uh, the way things are going you can see hardly anything of what's going on in front with that angle but there we go <laughs> nice little camera change uh, back out and away in seventh place five seconds behind Andrew Gilliam so a good last stop there Lockie has put the 201 in at least sixth place so the battle that's actually starting to emerge here, guys, is going to be the battle for what will be effectively second position in the race because Forza Nel Nabi is flying oh, wow. up to the back of Cooper Webster. He took six tenths of a second out of the Alta C Sports car last time around. So this is potentially going to be an on-track contest for positions two and three in the closing 12 laps of this race. Hello, Eagle Eyes Lucky there, getting that one all nice and situated. The gap is around two seconds, and that's a hurry-up message for Cooper Webster. You would have to say at this stage, Forzan is on the Warzan path at this stage, trying oh, to get himself going forward. Yes, it's bad funds, but you uh... have to remember on lap 90 of 102, we've been here for three hours. But it's going to be all about Forzan on Arby, trying to chase down Cooper Webster for the final stages, but that gap is two seconds to try and work with right now still maloney yet to stop yeah well uh, i tell you what forzan's last lap time certainly puts him in good stead for a potential move on cooper webster before the end it was a 43 227 from forzan el nabi but you see uh, from cooper webster sorry but you saw el nabi's time there in the 42s he's taken well over three tenths out of cooper webster on that last lap and if he can keep that pace up that gap is probably going to close by lap 94 and he needs that gap to close. He's got to get second. He's got to play damage limitation right now. He doesn't know how that 28 car is going to be pitting and how that's all going to factor out into things. But what he does know is that he's got to focus on the car in front and picking up that place. So once again, Forza Nonabi's having to make places late in the day here at an endurance event. And of course, when he goes over towards Mount Panorama, he knows he'll be going over there with everything that he needs to and then some uh, going on. So that's going to be key as we continue to have a little eye on that. And we still wait for the splash and the dash from the 28 machine at the moment here, Lockie. And in fact, it's happening now. Indeed it is. So they've run right out because they were just about out of fuel. That was a 26 lap stint for Jake Maloney. So there might have been one more lap in the tank left for that car. And like I said, I reckon they'll come out in probably position number four. Not sure that they've quite got the pace in that car to get themselves onto the podium tonight. Well, it's going to be a tall, tall order here, but here's the key. There goes Forza and LRB off the jacks and away goes Jake Maloney. And that is fourth place at this stage for them. So work to be done 
here in this stint and that actually puts a really interesting dynamic here in towards the endurance cup championships because it will be the case at this stage as ethan grigolt is out and away uh, in the fifth place there is maloney hampton fourth that both the 28 and the 77 will both have here locky a first and a fourth place finish to their names and it will be two podiums as things stands for cooper webster Indeed it will. So shaping up for a very, very close point situation in the Endurance Cup heading into the final round at, at Bathurst, that's for sure. So uh, the Endurance Cup's going to be on the line, as is, of course, glory in the biggest sim racing endurance race in Australia, the Bathurst 1000, which comes up in a few weeks' time. In terms of pit stops, only a couple of cars left to complete their final pit stops. The Number 923, Alter Sea Sports Entry, Simon Feigl and Zach Hanlon. They'll have to take their final pit stop soon. Also, the Evolution Racing Team, machine of Hugh Barter and Luke Pink. Uh, the youngest driver combination in the field, a combined age of just 29 between those two drivers. They're yet to take their fourth and final pit stop as well. Goodness me, they are spring chickens, aren't they? They certainly are. And uh, to answer your question, Mr. J. Kennedy, who's on the cameras for us today, yes, please do some maths for us. That would be very much appreciated at this stage. But at the moment, it's focus on Forzan El Nabi at the moment here. There is the number 13 machine right now uh, trying to go on through, but it is the 088 where big focus has to be put on right now because that gap is down to 1.4 seconds here at the moment now, Reese. Yes, indeed it is, and uh, it's getting closer and closer as time goes on for uh, for the Bianti Trans Tasman racing car. They've got uh, quite the gap to work with back to Ethan Grigg Galt, but that's a problem, I think, for Hugh Barter at Tamburello. Just went straight ahead in the braking zone, so that's not going to be good for him. For the final position in the top 10, well, Lockie just said this uh, this car, the Altus Esports car on the inside, has yet to come in for their final stop, and they'll probably be wanting to do that sooner rather than later because Blake Purdy is really pressuring them here in the Pursuit Sim Racing 488, but the Altus Esports car stays out once more. This is interesting. Well, it certainly is, and what is so very, very key is that this move has got to be conducted with uh, almost surgeon-like precision. Down to the inside here, Hanlon trying to hold it up, and he's going to have none of it there on the inside, easy as you like it. That is Blake Purdy putting pursuit inside the top 10 so uh, that is going to be uh, very very interesting as they uh, look to go on forward and see how all of this is going on so that's all nicely done then as they uh, go on forward and try and get themselves moving through in this we're now down to the final 10 laps then of this race Dane Warren and Madison down lead by 16 seconds over Cooper Webster and also James Scott at this moment in time. But Reese, uh, the gap is crucial here for Blake Purdy. He's got five seconds to Adam Briggs in front, but that looks like it's a bridge too far at this yeah. moment that we're focusing on at the moment. Yes, indeed. And um, I was about to highlight the, the number 72 DPR machine. They've been a bit of a dark horse here in the middle and final stages of the race, making their way up into the top 10 from a 14th place start. So... Adam Briggs and Andrew Dyson putting in very consistent stints and staying out of trouble, which is one of the main things to take away from an Endurance Cup. Yes, the front of the car is very dirty, but otherwise, it looks like there's barely a scratch on it. Good driving from the DPR squad. It just needs good wash. Just take it to your nearest drive through uh, here in uh, Imola and then you can just get it back off and going again. It's just that simple here at this stage. But what is very key is we keep that focus on second and third place here. That's the close battle between now and the end of this race with a handful of drivers still to come in, make some stops. There's a puff of smoke there over at turn one. That's an engine. That's someone's engine that's just gone there oh. right on the inside. That's close to the circuit there. It's a synergy car. That might be a very late safety car. Yeah, and that looks like Yordi Sinai, and he's losing positions out there on track. He's going to be requesting a tow from race control. But Yordi Sinai, very unfortunate. Later on in the race, you do see the engines going pop. We saw it happen to the number 9 ANZ motorsports car, and now we've seen it happen to the 018. And bang. there we go, on the downshift, bang, it goes, and Sinai has to go into the gravel trap. So... 
We'll wait and see if a safety car is brought out or if he's called back into the pits. Race control will know about that, but as it stands at the moment, the uh, the only car that would be at, that would have actually the only car that would be at a real disadvantage here is the True Force Altus 923 because they have yet to take their final stop still. Still no action yet from the stewards. We do not know. I have no ears in to see what's going on, but this could be the whole race just bunching up again, potentially right at the death here of this race. But the question also becomes here, Reese, is it too late for a safety car? Well, I don't think there's any rules uh, on safety cars in the final 10 laps of the race, but... I don't know if it would really make a difference to the result, whether or not it came out. Of course, that 923 Altus car will fall down the order, taking the stop under a safety car. But uh, I, I think for everyone else, it's just a case of business as usual. It is at the moment. They have to keep racing until they get the call, whether it will be oh, or it won't be right now. Second and third are in traffic. Through, as uh, it's going to be uh, traffic here that we're hearing right now. Yeah, and the gap has gone right the way down. Cooper Webster has been held up a bit there by the 017 in the uh, the middle of the circuit. And in comes the 923. Good decision from them to take it in. But uh, now, it looks like he got a slowdown out of Variante Alta. And the gap has been drawn all the way out again versus Cooper Webster. He was right there. Oh, it's just like that. It's the smallest margins. And you can see, stop behind the race on Oscar, dives down to the inside and gets over the first one nicely but it will be here on the exit where it all starts to go wrong and uh, the slowdown penalty comes into play and uh, ultimately yet yeah, has to just pull it over to one side let the race on oscar back through and try it all over again then out on circuit looks like racing action still going still yordi sinai is there and unable to uh, get himself going again so i think the stewards might just let this one go between now and the end of this race with that engine pop so uh, ultimately uh, this might just be a case of yordi sinai hasn't actually called the stewards to say can i have an escape please yeah, and oh, Forza El Nabi having to take slight avoiding action there versus Benjamin Smith, who uh, and uh, suffers a couple tech issues for his troubles as well. This is allowing Cooper Webster to keep getting away. He almost came up close to the back of him in the first sector, but now uh, it looks like that gap is continuing to fall away. Benjamin Smith, um, I don't think very willing to let people go because he's in a battle himself there with Brett Loxton behind him. But El Nabi now, I think, looking a little frustrated. Yeah, every right to be as well. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. I want this one all to play out nicely, going through the rights and the lefts and at the very anti alter once again and uh, not getting there close enough. So uh, that one isn't quite good as I think we may just have safety car deployed potentially and there oh, it is it's moving. safety car deployed right at the late stages we're gonna have a four lap dash for the end of this race yeah well the 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 call hasn't officially been made by race control in the in text in the insim text chat so it's not official yet it's official now because there's the safety car out on track and All look right. at that. Oh, that's so interesting. Look at that from Dane Warren then. He's just dipping two tyres into the grass. And this is part of what we've been seeing in the Porsche Esports Super Cup of people trying to exploit that to try and cool the tyres down. Oh, and he's doing it again there on the exit of Tamburello. Just uh, running a little bit off. Uh, oh, Trans Tasman cars. Uh, okay. Interesting. So they want to try and preserve as much as they can in their tyres more towards the end. Yordi Sinai will be granted permission by race control to uh, to go back to the pits. And we're going to have one heck of a dash towards the finish. Meanwhile, we're hearing Lockie has an update on the, uh, on the Endurance Cup points. Indeed. So with positions as they are at the moment, the two trans Tasman cars, so the Dane Warren Madison Down car and the Jake Maloney Richard Hampstead car, would each be tied on 870 points apiece. The 088 Alta C Sports James Scott and Cooper Webster entry would be just six points behind on 864 points. Oh, wow. I like the sound of that, Sperry. I certainly do. That would be a showdown at the great Australian sim race 
but this is something also that is very crucial with how this strategy is playing out the safety car because look at how much traffic there is between Dane Warren and Cooper Webster. It is about four and a half seconds worth of lap traffic that has to be negotiated here on this lap going through. So it's all not ideal right now. And you can count it. There's about seven cars that have to be negotiated before they get themselves to some green flag running once again. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, Jay's going to get a static camera feed for you to count, Sperry. But uh, I'm I'm hearing Brenton O'Brien in uh, in Sim Spectator chat claiming that there are there are cars passing under the safety car. So that's something else that race control might have to take a look at. That certainly is, and this will take a little while to all piece together. I count six vehicles uh, over in terms of my maths, but I'm the sort of person who needs count von count to help me try and count my numbers up on uh, two hands. Anything above five is uh, almost alien to me at some stages. But uh, right now, I can tell you what, that family up there who was in that villa there that we just saw, they'd be absolutely loving it with the social distancing going on, how this race is going to come to a very close conclusion. Yes, indeed. It's a very nice place, uh, it seems, to live there, right by a racetrack. Of course, the uh, Autodromo Enzo Edino Ferrari was originally a set of public and private roads. It was uh, turned into a racetrack by members of a local motorcycle club at the start of the 1950s. So this place has been around for... Uh, going on 70 years now, and um, it just goes to show uh, sometimes when it comes to racetrack design, all you need to do is string a couple roads together. Of course, this racetrack has uh, undergone quite a few changes in the uh, in the intervening seven decades, namely the chicanes being installed, but it still has that public road character to it. I believe we're zooming in on one very famous statue uh, that is there at the Tamburello chicane right on the exit, which is, of course, the resting place or the final uh, impact place of the legendary Ayrton Senna. As we see, there's the green Brazilian flags and the statue will be there. There's a uh, bit of flowers there on the left-hand side and some wonderful camera work to just pick all of that up then as we uh, have a little look at all of that going on through. It is worth noting as well here uh, around a place like this with all of the battling that will be going on forward here in the racing as well, uh, Reese that if you do want to find an iRacing Easter egg, there is also uh, that fantastic iRacing Easter egg that you can find where you can find a certain Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Steve Myers somewhere around every circuit. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things that iRacing puts in uh, in every <laughs> single track. And uh, <laughs> Jay says they are on a balcony somewhere around the circuit, but he's not going to try and find them at the moment because uh, the safety car period... It's going to be coming to an end pretty soon and uh, it'll probably take ages to find them. I do know that uh, at Phillip Island, they're out on a yacht in the open ocean. It's, it's a bit of a bit of a challenge for iRacers to find them. And uh, when we race at Spa next, you can probably find them in the B-roll that we run on our broadcasts. And what's key as well is that Spa Francorchamps here for Scops is the second driver's choice round, and that will be after Enduro. So that will be round 12. You've got Belle Isle as well that comes along with that also. And then you've got that Road America finish, which is so very, very good. Now this is a key little battleground. You can see all the cars stacking up. There's James Scott. You can count it. One, two, three, four cars back then in terms of the train, trying to find place, find position, find everything that's so very needed. That's the 93. Pursuit Sim Racing car, one lap down of uh, Gardner. There goes the safety car uh, that will be allowed to push forward. We are down to a five-lap shootout here at the wonderful Imola circuit. It has all come down to this. Dane Warren in control, but he shouldn't have to worry too much. He's got four vehicles in between himself and what's needed. It's that second and third place battle between Cooper Webster and Forza Del Narby that's the one that's worth keeping in mind. You've got 14 drivers on the leading lap, all hoping they can pick up a race victory or some form of brilliant points. Dane Warren's going to go now, and it's all about get on the power and start attacking here as they go for five final laps. Here here at Imola, we're green once again, and immediately it's all about getting on the offensive. Indeed it is. Cooper Webster making sure that he doesn't pass uh, Brian Borg before the start-finish line, and El Nabi immediately fires it to the inside to try and get past Borgie, who lets him go through. Not without a little bit of awkwardness, though. 
And that's allowed Webster to slightly get away. And he's now on the back of Jack Boyd. That's the battle for second and third between Webster and El Narby. Oh, but Dane one. Warren absolutely away. That is a huge crash. That looked like the 098. Oh, oh. no. Corey Preston. He just has the most rotten luck in this series, doesn't he? He does. He, he just does. And I, I, I wonder what he has done. What? God that he has gone with the icing gods to give him absolutely no luck at all. So there goes through the Bianchi model cars machine there of uh, one Richard Hampstead and Jake oh. Maloney. Oh, it's the Altus car that's come into the side and made the contact there. So that's where that one all goes wrong. And uh, that's Zach Hanlin there. Yeah, so he might uh, come under fire from the stewards for that one. Poor Corey Preston. I really do sympathize with him. He tries so hard and uh, just ends up getting the short end of the stick so often. He and Bradley Ratu will come away from this feeling uh, a bit shafted, I reckon. But El Nabi has a little bit of traffic to contend with here. This is Jack Boyd in the Synergy number 58 up ahead of him. him go. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, El Nabi's going to have to hope for, uh, for a slipstream down the front straight and for Boyd to let him buy into Tamburello. He's been flashing his light, saying, come on, let me go. I need this position. I need to get back to Cooper Webster. It's not happening right now as they look. They funnel on through and try and continue to gain those places. Maloney currently in fourth. Great Galt fifth. Dane Warren sets the fast slap of the race on lap 98. No surprises cooling the tyres there on the outside of the circuit like he did, exploiting iRacing like that. But continuing on forward here, trying to pick up as many places as possible, it looks like this number 21 car is officially stuck. And the big key here is next up, he's got to get past the ERT machine right now and try and find a way through. And all of these drivers who are 14th, oh, sorry, 15th position on backwards, remember, they're lapped down, but they're still also fighting for position, which makes life doubly awkward. Yeah, they have to balance letting the lapping cars by with trying to stay ahead of the cars around them. And, of course, El Nabi falling afoul of that with... Uh, the synergy car of Jack Boyd. This has actually given a bit of a lifeline to the number 28 as well. You see Maloney there behind El Nabi coming into the corner. All three of these cars are going to be together on track, but Cooper Webster uh, getting a bit lucky there, passing the ERT 543 before El Nabi could, uh, could really put no cars between himself and Webster. Maloney certainly not far away from this. If El Nabi can't get by Benjamin Smith, the TTR number 28 could luck into a podium. Remember that Jake Maloney pitted incredibly late here in this race. He last pitted eight laps ago, and this is key here in terms of this one. He's got seven laps fresher tires. That he does. He's got the pace advantage at the moment over El Nabi. Cooper Webster, meanwhile, has not made any huge advance uh, trying to get away from El Nabi. And there we go. ERT 543 lets United 21 go. And now there are no cars between second and third place. This is going to be one heck of a finish. But there's nine tenths of a second and so forth. And has to put all of his reserves in to try and pick up this place. It's still on as well. Fifth and sixth. Greg Galton Gilliam looks like they're going to have a close scrap between now and the end of this one. As well as for ninth and tenth with uh, Adam Briggs and Blake Purdy, it seems, at this stage. They go up the hill through Toza. Goes Webster and El Nabi. Look at this, though, as they try and attack. Every position matters here late, and you've got to find those places late if you're going to go out and pick up the big race victory that everybody is going to be searching for out here on circuit. You can see how much it all means as they go on through and try and search for everything possible. El Nabi looks a little squirrely here on the brakes. The gap down. Oh, three quarters of a second. There he goes. There he goes. Cooper Webster makes the mistake. Oh. Pressure unrivaled, and now outside of the top five. He did exactly what Jake Burton did some laps ago, just pushed a bit too hard into Aqua Minerale, caught the grass with the left side wheels, and around he went. So that is a podium gone for Altus Esports. And I think Jay and Lockie are going to have to recalculate those Endurance Cup points now because we have got two TTR podiums in the race. Lockie has got another stat for us. Well, that moves... The Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney car up onto the podium, which that will mean, if provided they can stay in that position for 
these final few laps it will be mean that Jake Maloney will be the only driver who will have finished on the podium in all three Imola 500s. Wow, that wow. tells you all you need to know. Jake Maloney has done very well, and he's looking to do so again. He's only a second behind Forza El Nabi right now. He has a huge wiggle, actually, coming out there of the chicane, so that's not all ideal. There's Andrew Gilliam in fifth. Fourth position's not out of the realms of possibility here. There is Cooper Webster as well in sixth place just behind. He'll want to get through on Andrew Gilliam, P, D, and Q, because we've only got here, Reese, a lap and a half to play with. Yeah, it's going to be very frenetic here in the final five kilometers of this race. You see Gilliam just uh, watching his mirrors for Cooper Webster behind, and he's got the 117 of Ethan Grigg Galt up ahead. So Webster, he's, he's, he would have lost a lot of pace out of those tires thanks to that spin. They would have overheated. They'll be greasy. They'll be really crying out for a bit of mercy, but he's continuing to push them incredibly hard. We look back from Ethan Grigg Galt to see if there's a move from Cooper Webster, but he stays behind for just one more lap. One more lap and a bit more to go then for these drivers here as they fight it out for fourth, for fifth, for sixth, the best of the rest out of the podium. The gap is still one second, El Nabi and Maloney, so I doubt we'll see much change in that front, but Andrew Gilliam here, given a lifeline to try and fight for fourth place. This safety car was absolutely everything. Drive through penalty for Zach Hanlon late in the day. He will have to serve that one, and he knows he will as they go on to start the final lap of this race. Dane Warren, five seconds clear at the front of the pack but it's on now look at cooper webster he's really closing down in that gap he knows what he needs to do gilliam goes defensive then on the inside trying to cover off this one but trying around the outside you're not going to find it quite yet as you go through the lefts and the rights and continue on forward here towards the next section the villeneuve chicane coming up next and now you start to feel like andrew gilliam here is now trying to save a top five well rather than pick up a fourth place look at webster he's all over the back right now now, gets a wiggle though through the exit and Gilliam has it all scouted takes a narrower line going through the Toza corner and is just putting the car in all the right places this is a jigsaw puzzle that everybody is starting to solve here in terms of this battle and moving on forward it's all nice and neat and calm at this stage as they go through Piratella and down the hill to Acque Minerale here looking for everything that is very much needed right now it's all calm it's all nice no mistake takes here at this section of the road and now up the hill look at the run Cooper Webster has suddenly got this could be on here at the Variante Alta trying to get this one all done on the anti-cut curb chicanes but again not quite there it will have to be Ravazza if there is any respite for this move we turn though to number 77 Dane Warren on the brakes into the final Ravazza corners for Dane Warren it's exactly what he wants he gains more interest for teams that may want him but with a big slide off the exit he also also helps give Madison down more buffer room in the championship. Trans Tasman put two cars in a row with two wins here at Imola, and they've done it again here with some brilliant driving. Dane Warren takes the win for the 77. El Nabi takes second. Maloney coming home in third, and Ethan Grigg Galt holding on for fourth. No changes of position to the end, and Cooper Webster may as well be feeling like the loneliest man in all of Imola at this stage here. Reese after throwing away a second place finish man I, I would love to hear what that debrief will be at Altus Esports because uh, you know they, they drove a great race all race long but you know you, you are only as good as where you are at the finish and unfortunately Cooper Webster was up against a great defensive drive by Andrew Gilliam to preserve that fifth place the evolution racing team's uh, 117 though coming through to take that fourth place finish a great drive from them they played their cards beautifully the whole way through but you cannot take anything away from the number 77 they were supreme on pace they were supreme on strategy they just led from pretty much from start to finish and did not look back yeah it's absolutely uh, good and in terms of that dane warren will be very, very happy here. So that was all absolutely wonderfully uh, done here today. But what we can do for you, everyone across the line, of course, after that very late safety car, is get you official classified results here today from a wonderful, wonderful race here at Imola. And the 500 
goes Trans Tasman's way once again. Trans Tasman will be very happy here with this one. They take the win over the 102 laps. The 77 car this time picking up the win with Forza El Nabi. Damage limitation in second for United and third going to Jake Maloney and Richard Hampstead there who have the Endurance Cup Championship lead heading to the great sim race. And that will be something worth keeping in mind. Ethan Greg Galt then takes fourth for the Evolution Racing Team. Andrew Gilliam in fifth. And it's the loneliest place in the world for Cooper Webster, who gets sixth place come the end of all of that. Brady Myers takes seventh with Jake Burton and Dom Ferraris in eighth. So that's Alter sixth and seventh and the VRSX Pro Prologue React Esports team in eighth. Simrigs.com DPR ninth. Adam Briggs, Andrew Dyson, Blake Purdy and Job Stewart means it's two pursuit cars inside the top ten. Great drive from Purdy and Stewart to secure that over Corey Shepard and Clint Smith in the final stages. Postlethwaite and Hobson come home in 12th, which is two times six, so half a meme? I don't know. Tom Freer and Jamie Stovold come home in lucky 13th. Wally and Lob bring the DPR car home in 14th. They're the final car on the lead lap. And then it's Griffin Gardner and Ruben Goodall. They, uh, they started well in that seventh place, but have to settle for 15th. Behind them, Evolution Racing Team 543, Ben Smith and Scott Gamble in his final online sim race with a 16th place finish in the Imola 500. Great drive from those guys. Boyd and John Stone behind them. Borg and Rudd come home in 18th. Kyle George and Jamie McKnight bring the other United Sim Sports car home in 19th with Emily Jones and Andrew Fraser making that late race surge to round out the top 20. And then moving over towards 21st and on back, Hugh Barter and Luke Pink are lap down for the Evolution Racing Team there. Justin Wallace, Tyler Blackburn, first of the race on Oz Cars. Then you've got Kenneth Latter and Sean Lindsell, Rob Bowden, Craig Anspach there for the tanked SRT machine. There you've got Michael Schrein and Daniel Ackland for the Synergy Sim Racing Team. You've got Szlowski and Neck, part of four runner. Coxhead and Wild, quiet race from them today uh, with Keenan Pearson for the SimRigs.com DPR team. Another quiet race for them. Aaron Dodd and Ian Bird, the only Mark 1 car in the in the field, but uh, the 787 definitely uh, made a statement. And then with a drive-through penalty late, Zach Hanlon, Simon Feigl, what could have been? It goes from fifth place at uh, what was the racing at Phillip Island to P30 come the end of racing today. The Zuva Racing 209 started in 21st, but comes home in 31st position. Britt Loxton and Thomas Hins having a bit of a rough day out there, as did Lee Ellis and Kurt Stenberg for getting to fuel the car at one of their pit stops. Dion Peters and Darren McKenzie bring the hyperdrive car home in 33rd, and Robin Kirk and Daniel Misdale there in 34th. Kang Houston and Matthew Norris coming home in 35th, so both hyperdrive cars there advancing through. Hayden Veld and Matthew Deere, a late race incident at the Villeneuve chicane for them, two laps down in 36th. Smith and Mulgridge are the uh, last cars to actually take the checkered flag, and we've got three retirements from this one, all of which happened in the final quarter of the race. Preston and Ratu absolutely shafted there at Villeneuve. Sinai and Scott Nolan blowing an engine into Tamburello, as did Kobe Jones and Ben Christensen. And those are the retirements then from this race that we have had going on forward. Some brilliant action that we've had today. But we have the ability right now, this very second, to go and move over towards post-race interviews. First and foremost, we're going to bring in the two drivers who won this one outright today. Dane Warren and Madison Down picking up the victories overall. Dane, I'm going to come to you first. There's uh, been a lot of talk and speculation about where you've been, uh, where you're going to be going at the moment. I know that some people have been putting cryptic clues in, but results like that today, having a comfortable walkaway victory from now until the end of the race, that one surely boosts your stock. Oh, yeah, I hope so. Obviously, it wasn't just all me. Obviously, Madison today put in an excellent drive at the start and the guys at TTR, which have, you know, had me on the Sanjuro run as put in also heaps of effort themselves so um it, it's not possible without them but uh yeah no it's just good good to get good results I mean, well talking about good results madison it's a uh, it's an extension of the championship league that you have with two drop rounds available at the moment so knowing that you missed the opening couple of rounds knowing you've been putting those consistent results in how important is it now to now finally have uh, that traction and that drive knowing you've got championship points in your back pocket moving over towards the great race at mount panorama 
Yeah, absolutely. Good feeling. Um, always good to get maximum points at an enduro. Obviously, um, worth worth a lot of points compared to a lot of other rounds. So um, to maximise at these types of events is really critical. But really big well done to everybody at TTR. Um, the car in these first two enduro cup races has been a rocket ship. Um, Dane's been fast in both of them. And tonight, just absolutely everything went to plan. Both of us drove pretty well, I feel. And um, yeah, big thank you to Dane. He, um, he drove bloody well. And Worked really well on the setup as well. Everyone at the team did so. Uh, really good team result. Well, a really good team result. But let's let's talk about the endurance cup for the moment because you find yourself now second in the cup points behind, of course, your other team. And uh, maybe here, Madison, you look at Trans Tasman and go, well, this is exactly the form that you were looking to try and get the team to get to back to that 2018 form when you were picking up one, two, threes at almost every race in the season. Yeah, absolutely. The form at the moment is really good. Uh, we probably had a bit of a slow start to the year as a team, but um, we've s kind of found our feet with the new car um, in the last probably three or four months. And uh, the pace has been really good. And particularly with this Enduro Cup, uh, everyone's really put in a lot of effort behind the scenes and we've got the car dialed in pretty nicely. Um, at the moment, we are using the virtual racing school setups as a base um, and working from there. So the, the setups are starting in a pretty good place, um, but then the extra bit and the hours and hours and hours of work going in behind the scenes is um, is definitely a big factor for the results. So uh, yeah, as I said, really happy for the team and, and the way it's going. And Dane, let's peel back the curtain a little bit because a lot of people said coming into uh, the racing of the Endurance Cup that you and Madsen maybe have slightly different driving styles. So how much work actually goes into that setup? Maybe uh, slightly finding a balance between two setups and hoping that it's very drivable for both drivers? Well, to be honest, probably not as much as a lot would think. Um, me, and my, me and Madison actually didn't do that much preparation in the lead up for, for this week's event. So. Um, so far, like coming from Phillip Island, uh, the setup worked really well for both of us. So, yeah, I would assume that'll work the same way for Bathurst. We'll just have to see. Well, before we let you two go, any shout out sponsors or anyone you'd like to thank for picking up a massive, massive race victory here today? Uh, obviously, we've got our team sponsors, Virtual Racing School and Bianti Model Cars. Uh, those, those two businesses um, really big support behind sim racing and I know they'll be watching the event tonight. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Madison Down and Dane Warren pick up the race victory overall here today. Second position would go to Forza El Nabi and Harley Haber. They are stood by with one Mr. Reese Gardner. They are indeed a fifth place start and it looked like a podium might have been out of the question were it not for a great late race charge from Forza El Nabi. But we will go to Harley first. Harley, you started the car and uh, it was quite the frenetic start. I did note that uh, you seem to be uh, driving a bit calmly there in the opening stages. Was it just a case of finding your feet and uh, putting you guys in a good position to take advantage through the pit stops? Yeah, of course, mate. I think um, I didn't get quite as good of a start as what I did last week. I think it was pretty average in comparison to everyone else around us. And obviously, it's a 102 lap race. And I don't mean I don't mean to harp on about the obvious, mate. But um, there's a long way to go. And you know, I didn't want to uh, do anything stupid on the opening couple of laps. Indeed, and it uh, looks like you brought it through at the end of it. Forzan, you were in a constant fight with Cooper Webster there towards the end of the race, but it seemed like traffic was playing a part before Webster's spin. Um, yeah, he actually drove pretty well um, up until that mistake. Um, to be fair to him, it's pretty, pretty tough on him. Um, obviously, that mistake came in the wrong time for them. There were... Um, it was really hard to recover for them. But for me, I don't know if you guys saw, but I made two similar mistakes in my middle stint as well. So yeah, I think these stuff happen. Um, I think Cooper's a really good driver. So um, yeah, he no doubt bounced back from this one and just learn from what he, he did wrong. And um, yeah, but I think overall, we put on good pressure throughout the last couple of stints on that car. And eventually we got, we got our reward. You certainly did, and um, of course, moving on to Bathurst, uh, you have experience there with um, with the top step of the podium at Bathurst. Of course, your former team, Trick Sim Sports, you took the win there with Ross Rizzo, so a lot of history to back up, and uh, Harley is no slouch around Bathurst either. Yeah, we've got a good, pretty good history, both of us there. Um, I think I got P2 last year as well, um, and obviously 2018, uh, the race win, so... 
yeah, good track for us. Um, looking forward to it a lot. Um, always, always a great like um, event overall. Actually, um, the Bathurst 1000. So, yeah, very much looking forward to it. Hopefully, we can get a good result there as well. Well, from this second spot on the podium, good place to uh, give shout outs and thanks to the sponsors of United Sim Sports. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, obviously, our, our major sponsor of Avalina, I'd like to give big thanks to them. And uh, obviously, if you needed a new car, you can visit uh, West End Mazda or, or uh, Parramatta Isuzu Ute and um, finance it through Too Easy Finance, mate. So, uh, like you said, definitely a good result today for the boys. And uh, we'll come back in a couple of weeks at that um, mountain track and have a go. Forzan El Nabi and Harley Haber there, second place. And uh, now we're going to jump through to the third place uh, finishers. It's two TTR cars on the podium. Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney there getting on the final steps, Barry. Yes, and they're stood by with Lockie Mansell. Well, it doesn't seem to matter what happens, but uh, these guys always find a way of finishing on the podium in these endurance races. Congratulations to Jake Maloney and Richard Hampstead. Starting with you, Richard, previous round at Philip Island, when Jake started the race, you brought it home for the run to the chequered flag, but you decided to change things up a bit tonight with you starting the race. Yeah, no, definitely. I think the advantage of uh, the combo that we have with myself and Maloney is that we've pretty much got two drivers with a very similar pace. Um, so I think we can really just choose who's going to be the, the slightly faster out of the two of us to be in at the end and I think at Phillip Island I was probably a tiny bit quicker than Maloney and here he was a little bit quicker than me so uh, it makes sense to have the quicker driver in at the end and um, and uh, yeah we, we definitely did today. Talk us through the way that you approach the strategy for these races because at Phillip Island we saw that your first pit stop was quite a bit earlier than everybody else and you took the same approach tonight as well. Yeah, well, when we when we sort of realised before Phillip Island that there were four mandatory stops, uh, we had a good think about uh, the best way to approach it, um, especially given the thought that there will likely be a safety car somewhere during the race or in the latest stages. Um, and so we came up with that strategy, which is basically have two short early stops and then a couple of longer stops later in the race, which worked quite well worked very well at Phillip Island, especially because you had a big pack of cars battling. Uh, unfortunately, tonight, pretty much had the 77 car just, you know, out in front doing their own thing. Um, so it probably wasn't quite as effective. And I think a couple more ran a pretty similar strategy. But um, I think I think the, sh the strategy we ran tonight was pretty good. Um, I don't know if it was the best, but uh, yeah, I think we were probably the third quickest car and we came third. So, uh, yeah. Over to Jake, who tonight has become the first driver to finish on the podium, or the only driver to finish on the podium in all three Imola 500s so far. Jake, you were in fourth position at that final safety car race start. Uh, what was going through your mind at that point? I think at that point, I was, at first I was just trying to make sure I consolidated and didn't lose anything behind. I think ideally I was hoping for Forzan and Cooper to come together. And uh, we, we grabbed second, but um, no, nah, unfortunately for Cooper, he just made a bit of a mistake there and we were able to capitalise and get up to third. Heading to the big race at Bathurst in a few weeks' time. Um, obviously, both of you have had some solid results there in the past as well. How are you feeling heading into that event? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Um, I think we've been showing good form, these Enduros, and just making sure we get to the end. Richard and I are both winners at the 1000 before, so we know what to do to get to the end and be there in the last stint, so I think we'll be in good stead. You've also both maintained your lead in the V8 Scops Endurance Cup. Just finally, sponsors, shout-outs, people who you would like to thank. Yeah, just a big thanks to Bianti Model Cars for being on the car and Virtual Racing School um, for helping us out, and it's a lot of help being able to compare data with other teammates and yeah, just a big thanks to everyone on TTR for awesome setups and we're working really well as a team together at the moment and, and it's showing on track. Well, there they are. They won the Phillip Island 500. They're on the podium again here at Imola and they're leading the V8 Scops Endurance Cup. Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney for the Trans-Tasman Racing Team. 
yeah, they've done a fantastic job in terms of trying to get exactly what they want out of it here today. But what is going to be key, though, is that we have this conversation with Scott Gamble. Final uh, race of the season so far for him. So, Scott, um, what's going to be key here in terms of how you take that race is that you've had a really, really strong endurance couple of races. You had that big, long lead, of course, over at Phillip Island, which gave you such a massive result in terms of what the team would have really wanted out of you. And then to come here today to finish is only the second uh, team one lap down over the course of the racing. You have to say you've had a pretty good endurance season so far. Yeah, how going, Jake? Um, yeah, we have. It's uh, well, ben, Benny Smith. He's uh, just driven fantastic. He's a fantastic driver, and it's been yeah, awesome to drive with him. So, yeah really surprised with uh, the results and it's uh, it's been great it's been really good fun it certainly has been good fun but uh, let's just talk about your sim racing career for a little bit you've been uh, here there and everywhere you've got yourself the opportunity to go to the evolution racing team and uh, start to build up that career but uh, what's prompted that retirement for you because it sort of comes out of the blue as a driver who I, I thought was starting to really get on start to hit some big results and actually uh, start to hit their drive and their stride a little bit yeah, look, I'm, I'm 44. I'm going to be 45 uh, in another month. And I've got two younger kids and two older kids that are teenagers. And uh, the younger ones are one and four. And I, be, to try and keep good at sim racing and, and do well, and you've got to practice a lot. And it takes a lot of time away from them and my partner. So in the end, I, I, I didn't want to miss out any more of my kids growing up and being on the sim as much as I love it. I wanted to be there and, and, and show them, the, you know, Australia, the great outdoors and, uh, you know, take them out camping, fishing and uh, just be a bit more, you know, active in, in their lives and growing up. So, yeah, that's why I had to uh, draw the straw and, and something had to give and that was uh, sim racing. And in terms of now how you start to look at life, say, after sim racing, because we don't often get to talk to people who start thinking about, OK, what if sim racing, you know, stops being something I can make that commitment for, I can do, I can look at. What's next for you then? What's next for in terms of, OK, you're just spending time more with the kids. You've got all of these fantastic things coming up. But what's the focus in terms of now how you transition out of a mindset of sim racing becomes a lot of what my life is and how do you transition that into maybe something different and uh bringing in you know maybe a different time and you know putting in more effort into maybe more things that are more enjoyable for you well that's a really good question and and something i've uh pondered over quite a bit and um I've, I've bought a metal detector, a gold detector. Um, we're going to go out, do a little bit of prospecting. We're about an hour out of the uh, Victorian high country fields here. So go do a little bit of exercise there once this uh, COVID gets down. So, And I've always been right into my fishing, camping and full driving. Um, and quite a lot of the times I put that side of it on hold because we've got races on, you know. And it's a, a fairly big commitment, as you know, in your team and, and you're to be there. So, yeah, those sort of things that we're just going to, get out in the, and enjoy life a little bit more and and be there and be uh and help my partner you know she uh she sacrificed a lot for me to to sim race um you know financially because it does cost money and time and uh yeah i just want to give back to her and um and to my kids you know and just be there for them well First of all, we, we thank you for your service racing in these SCOPS events and all of the sim racing events that you've managed to be able to take uh, a part in. As you've been fantastic as one of the members who has always been uh, out there and having a really good uh, run of things. And I think not just from myself, but from all the admin at uh, the SCOPS team and, of course, all of us here at SimSpeed TV, we'd like to wish you uh, the very best in your future. But before we let you go, uh, the floor is yours. It's your final time uh, that you get the opportunity to say this. But anyone you'd like to thank, anyone you'd like to... Uh, congratulate anyone you'd like to uh hype up or anything like that in terms of your career in sim racing uh, look i just like to just just the people that i've met in sim racing um for me i was i went through some really dark times and uh many years ago over a decade ago now and it was it was actually racing back on forza and and the community there before our racing was around that sort of brought me out and, and brought me back into it. So it was a, I guess, sim racing, it's more than just racing on track and doing well. It's about the community and about the people. And like you guys, the admin and the people that you meet along the way. And uh, I think 
we'd be fair to remember that in the future that yeah the sim racing is bigger than the racing itself so yeah and you know a special thanks to everyone out there that i've met and all the friends that i've made geez i've made some friends and and to all those that have followed me when i had the uh, sg1 gaming page going and and track racer supporting us we managed to raise close to five thousand dollars to give to uh soldier on australia which is for our return veterans uh this year and yeah so that's really good and and that's all done via sim racing in the community and the uh the people that got behind it so you know i i, I can't thank anyone i mean you know single people out but just the whole community of i really want to thank and uh the guys at ert mac one esports and where it started on iRacing racing for me at uh, delta force racing on in the uh, v8 so yeah thank you guys and thanks for having me i really appreciate it We appear to have briefly lost Jake Sperry there, but um, we want to we want to give a big thanks to you too, Scott. It was great to have you in the booth, and certainly uh, a great end to a, to a long and storied sim racing career in which you have achieved an awful lot. So that yes. I think brings to an end proceedings for tonight. Jay says, "Do not be a stranger, Sperry." I think it's time to wrap. Yeah. It absolutely is. I have found my microphone issues at long last. I have just oh, found them. So, only took uh, you 102 laps. <laughs> and a post-race interview as well. Let's put it on God. top of that as well. But I have managed to find out what the issue is. But a massive thanks to everyone who's got it done here for us here at what is some brilliant racing action that we have seen. First and foremost, a huge, 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 huge thank you has to go out, of course, to everyone who has been sponsoring this event from Too Easy Finance, from the Virtual Racing School, and of course from who have run it, the Oceanic Sim Racing Crew, and to Motum Simulations on the replay. They have been fantastic once again over the course of racing action that we have seen. A massive thanks has to go to all the drivers who have participated and looked to try and qualify. I know a few people haven't, but the big race will be coming up very soon, and they'll be wanting to get involved with that one. A massive, massive time to look for that. It's three weeks time from now, so you definitely want to put that in your calendar if you haven't already. On top of that, a huge thanks to Scott Gamble after putting uh, his time and effort in in the sim racing community. His retirement today uh, will be one which will be sorely missed by everyone, and uh, that will be one space that will be very, very tough to fill over the course of the racing action. But from Jay Kennedy on the cameras, from Lockie Mansell in pit lane, from one Mr. Southpaw racer, Reese Gardner, who's been alongside me, my name's been Jake Sperry, and now it's crystal clear, clearer than ever, that Trans Tasman now have the form book. They have exactly what they want, and they're looking to continue that one again and again and again. So, now what's next? What's on the horizon? Well, they've got the fastest corner in Australian sim racing. It's the fastest track in Australian sim racing. It is the great sim race coming up in three weeks' time. Mount Panorama awaits, and who can put the Scops Bathurst 1000 into perspective? It's anybody's to call for, and you know what? The only place you can catch that is the iRacing Esports Network and with SimSpeed TV. We'll see you in three weeks' time for the great Australian sim race. Fantastic. This is GT racing right now. He's got tracks and he's going with the outside of both of them. Maloney! Oh, he's taking Anderson. Anderson's up the oh horn. Oh, my God. Oh, big crash. Oh, my goodness. Half the field's going to get involved. Six very close. These guys are one I want to make their way through the field very quickly. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. That's massive. This is it. This is over. I can't believe this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What?